Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I am your host, Spencer, and I am having such a good time reading this book to you, and I hope it helps you sleep. Are you listening to this while you sleep? Maybe you're you're learning things that you didn't even you weren't even consciously aware that you heard. Maybe you will learn today about the first word, diaper. D I A P E R first form. Do you know about a diaper? If you don't, you will know about it. The first thing that I can tell you about it is that you can also pronounce it diaper because that's how it's spelled. You can make it three syllables. Diaper. Noun from the 14th century. Number one, a fabric with a distinctive pattern. What sort of pattern might this be? Well, it might be 1A, a rich silk fabric. Well, that doesn't say anything about the pattern. It just talks about the fabric. What sort of distinctive pattern? Well, are we talking about the the literal, the, the pattern on the fabric? Or is it the pattern of how the fabric is cut? Because, yes, the area that you put it around, if we're thinking about, about the diaper that goes on a baby, that is a very distinctive pattern around the legs and the waist and all that. But, um, hmm, I'm not sure. Well, what does 1B say? It says, a soft, usually white linen or cotton fabric used for tablecloths or towels. Yeah, so uh, this is just a type of fabric, a diaper. I have never heard of a diaper fabric Hmm, maybe we'll have to put some more information in the show notes because this this one's new to me. Number two, what's this one? Is it also new? It is an all-over pattern consisting of one or more small repeated units of design as geometric figures connecting with one another or growing out of one another with continuously flowing or straight lines. So this is literally the name of a pattern to put on a fabric or a pattern made into a fabric uh, is so this this is this is blowing my mind a little bit. I had no idea that there was a diaper, a fabric, a pattern called diaper. Maybe this is the one that's called diaper. Hmm. Number 3 is this the one that I know? Number 3, a basic garment for infants consisting of a folded cloth or other absorbent material drawn up between the legs and fastened around the waist. Also, a similar garment, especially for incontinent adults. Yeah, that was the first thing I thought of when it said, for infants. Well, yes, mostly infants, but adults who can't hold in their pee or their poo are going to need some diapers too. Oh, that rhymed. Adults who can't pee or poo, we're going to need diapers too. Uh, Let's see. So, yeah, I think most of us have probably worn diapers. Uh, There could be fabric diapers, which you wash, or they could be disposable diapers, which are filling up our dumpsters. And uh, if you, you attach them, maybe with some sort of sticky thing or Velcro thing or pins, giant pins that hold the fabric together. I think it's an it's an art to to fold one of those diapers. I mean, even the ones that are they're made to just like pull around and velcro down. Even those I think can be probably hard. I've only changed a small handful of diapers in my day. I had no younger siblings, uh, no no younger cousins that I was taking care of. I babysat a couple of little kids. You know, just just a few in my life. I think that's about all I need. Uh, I hope I don't have to wear a diaper before I die. Chances are I will have to wear a diaper at some point. Hopefully, while I am actively making this podcast, that will not be my reality. But hey, you never know. Let's see how life goes. Maybe maybe when I'm in the Z's, I will be a diapered Spencer. Um, the etymology doesn't really give us much uh, from the Middle Latin diasporum diasporum but it doesn't say what that means so i don't know maybe it started off with the with the name of the pattern and then maybe they used maybe they used that fancy pattern 
as the fabric, uh, or they use the fabric with the fancy pattern to put around a baby to hold in the pee and the poo. Oh, diapers. Diapers, diapers, diapers. I'm sure there's a lot of, lot more things we could say about diapers, but we don't have the time. We have to move on to... <laughs> Let's. I guess the sound effect is just going to be... <laughs> this second form of diaper. This one is a transitive verb. I, I said we were done with diaper. We are not done with diaper. Yeah, transitive verb from the 14th century. Number one, to ornament with diaper designs. How have I never heard of this diaper design pattern? Let's go. Can maybe maybe there's you there's like a, a wallpaper, a diaper wallpaper. Let's diaper diaper our walls with diaper or diaper. Number two for this verb form of diaper is to put on or change the diaper of of who of an infant or possibly an adult. Yep, you gotta you gotta diaper the babies, and then you gotta re-diaper the babies and re-diaper them and uh, diaper 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 all over the time, <laughs> all the time they need the diapers. I've heard that if you, um, there's a you you could potty train a kid early. Um, there's I I don't know it's something about you know you don't you don't have them wear diapers at a certain age, and yes you might have some accidents but you kind of. Put them over the toilet when you know they're ready to go, and usually I think they make some faces or sounds, so you got to be really observant to minimize the accidents in the house. But, uh, you know, if you're willing to, to give that a shot, I've heard it's pretty successful. And then they're diaper... No, then they're potty trained pretty early. The next word. <laughs> diaper rash. Two words, noun from 1945. I guess that's when we first called it diaper rash, but I have to imagine it existed way before that. This is skin irritation of the diaper-covered area of an infant, especially from exposure to feces and urinary ammonia. You don't want to let the, the, the human being sit in their feces and their urinary ammonia for a long time. Once they've soiled the diaper, you got to change it. Do it right away. Otherwise, they're going to get diaper rash. I'm sure every single human has had diaper rash at some point when they were a baby. I mean, I guess it's it's pop. It's possible and likely uh, that adults will get it too. If they don't get changed right away, then uh, then yeah, they're going to get some diaper rash. And you probably got the, you got to put the powder on and some sort of ointment I suspect diaper rash. Good thing you can't really form memories when you're that age, when you're wearing diapers and getting diaper rash, because I I wouldn't want to remember what that feels like. The next word. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be a fun episode for people just with the sound effect alone. All right, we are getting to a lot of words that I have never heard before, and the pronunciations are going to be kind of interesting. So, we have here, this first one, diaphaneity. Actually, well, yeah, you can say diaphaneity or diaphaneity, diaphaneity, or diaphaneity. D-I-A-P-H-A-N-E-I-T-Y. Noun from the 15th century, the quality or state of being diaphanous. Do you know what diaphanous is? Well, you're about to, because... (laughs) Diaphanous is our next word. It is an adjective from 1614. One, characterized by such fineness of texture as to permit seen through, as in diaphanous fabrics. Maybe these diaphanous fabrics have a diaper pattern. A diaper, diaphanous diaper. You don't want to wear a diaper that's diaphanous because you may not want to see through what's going on on the other side. You're going to see it anyway once you take off the diaper, but you don't want to see it all the time. Um, And you also, I think if you can see through it, then it might also allow things to come through 
and you don't want things to come through the diaper. That's the whole point of the diaper is to hold it in. So no diaphanous diapers, please. Number two, characterized by extreme delicacy of form. And the synonym is ethereal, as in painted diaphanous landscapes. That would be, they're delicate, they're ethereal, maybe they, they're fantastical, maybe they've got fairies flying around, or maybe it's a forest, or a, a river, a creek, that could be diaphanous. Or if it's delicate, maybe just the style of the paint is uh, delicate. Maybe it's watercolors. Number three, this synonyms are insubstantial and vague, as in, had only a diaphanous hope of success. Not much of a chance of success for that. Uh, so it's, it's diaphanous success or diaphanous hope of success. Um... I oh I had a thing. Diaphanously is an adverb, and diaphanousness is a noun. And the etymology says this is from the Greek diaphanin, which means to show through, from dia, which means through, plus phanin, which means to show. And there's more at the word fancy. Fancy. Fancy that. Fancy is from phanin which means to show. So is fancy just showing a thing? It's very showy. Fancy things are showy. Um, so let's see. Yeah, it's to show through. So yeah, it's about just something that's yeah ethereal, I think is a really good way to describe that. Um, but then it became, well, I guess a fabric that's diaphanous is probably kind of insubstantial and vague. It's, you know, there's just not much fabric there. It's sort of a vague fabric, so that's uh, that's diaphanous. And then, of course, if we look back to the previous word, diaphaneity, that is something that is in the state of being diaphanous. So it's a diaphaneity. The fabric is in a state of diaphaneity. I don't even know how to use that in a sentence. Hmm, I thought I had something else to say about diaphanous, which is a pretty fantastic word, if you ask me. Insubstantial. What is a something that's insubstantial or is it vague? I don't know. I had another example. Let's move on to <laughs> diaphone. D-I-A-P-H-O-N-E. Noun from 1906. A fog signal similar to a siren, but producing a blast of two tones. A fog signal. Burp, burp. <laughs> Diaphone. Yeah, I saw phone and I thought this might be some sort of instrument or a thing that makes sounds. So, uh, yeah. Maybe you've already heard me put in an example of what a diaphone sounds like, and if not, I'll do it now. Or maybe you got it twice. Yeah, it's to, probably this is a thing that they're going to maybe um, put out over water, so they're telling the boats and the other people to say, uh, there's fog here, watch out, be careful, go slow. Or just stop. Just don't, don't do anything. The next word, <laughs> diaphorous, or di, uh, sorry, no, 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 it is diaphorous, or diaphorous, diaphorous. Noun from, oh, wait, sorry, I wanted to look back at diaphone. There is no etymology, um, but I, I feel like the dia prefix might be across or through, so would it be like, the sound goes through the fog or something. Where did that name come from? I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. Okay, back to diaphorous. Noun from 1938. It is a flavoprotein enzyme capable of oxidizing the reduced form of NAD. No clue what that means, NAD. NAD must be in here. Uh, let's just do a, a quick look. 
N-A-D. What might N-A-D be? Well, it's something with, what was it, enzymes and proteins? And uh, let's see. This this is a very pointless task here. But uh, yes, N-A-D, ooh, a very long scientific-y uh, definition. You can, you can look forward to that later. That's diaphorase. This is from, let's see, the Greek diaphoros, which is from diaphorine, which means to differ, uh, which is from dia plus pharine, which means to carry. And, uh, and then they put the A-S-E at the end. And there's more at the word bear, like, like the bear with the big paws, raw, raw bear, black bear, polar bear, brown bear, polar, I said polar, panda bear. Why, why is there more of the word bear? Hmm. Diaphorine to carry, so it's to carry, and then to differ, uh, and then different, diaphoros is different, so something about differing things. I bet you this one's related. <laughs> Diaphoresis. Diaphoresis or diaphoresis. It is a noun from 1681, circa 1681. The synonym is perspiration, especially profuse perspiration artificially induced. How do you how how do you artificially produce perspiration? Do you what? And it's prof profuse there's a lot of it there's so much perspiration buckets and buckets of perspiration hmm i don't know if this is related to the previous word it seems like it would be but I, this one didn't say anything uh diaphorase didn't say anything about perspiration but i don't know what a flavoprotein enzyme is or NAD is so it could be perspiration related uh this diaphoresis is from the greek diaphorine, which means to dissipate by perspiration, which is from dia plus forine, which is from ferine, which means to carry again. So yes, they that's the same kind of etymology. Hmm. But they took diaphorine, diaphorine. This is complicated. Hmm. We, we get some of the same etymology, but it's different. We got to carry. That's the same. Hmm. All right. Yeah, we might have to put some links links in the show notes for diaphorase or diaphorase and diaphoresis. The next word, <laughs> diaphoretic, and all the these f sounds are with a ph. Diaphoretic, adjective from the fifteenth century. One having the power to increase perspiration. Increase perspiration. You have the power to. So if I have the power to go out for a jog and increase my perspiration, right, that's when you sweat. And uh, so I guess I am diaphoretic because I can do that. But this is probably talking about something else. Number two is just perspiring profusely. Perspiring profusely, perspiring profusely. That's hard to say. Diaphoretic. There are some people who do perspire profusely, so they would be diaphoretic. And yeah, I think this is just the same etymology as the last word. Diaphoretic is also a noun. The next word... <laughs> diaphragm. D-I-A-P-H-R-A-G-M. We've got a number of definitions. It is a noun from the 14th century. I will just say right off the bat, we all use our diaphragm, but people who play instruments and sing and talk professionally, they they know how to use their diaphragm. They use it a lot more than the rest of us. I, I never really fully studied the proper way to use it for talking and singing, um, I did take a few singing lessons not too long ago, and I got a little bit of practice, but I need to I need to keep up with it. I don't have the correct form, so I need to be conscious of use the diaphragm. Use it to expel the air from the voice. 
Um, I, I'm working on it. Number one for diaphragm is a body partition of muscle and connective tissue, specifically the partition separating the chest and abdominal cavities in mammals. So the chest part would be like where the lungs and the heart are, and then the abdominal part would be where, like, I guess I guess it would start with the stomach and go down. So the stomach and the intestines and, you know, I'm sure the pancreas and spleen and liver and kidneys are all in there too. I'm not sure which side, but but yeah, the, the diaphragm kind of separates the lungs. It's right below the lungs, and then all the stomachy intestinal parts are below that. Number two, a dividing membrane or thin partition, especially in a tube. So we're not talking about a body anymore, a living body. Um, yeah, it's just a thin a thin kind of flexible, movable, movable thing in a tube or in a thing. Um, oh, I, I know, I know I can think of an example like a, um, well, I guess, I don't know if a speaker, I don't know if you could call that a diaphragm, probably not. I cannot think of an example right off the top of my head, but some sort of tube that has a flexible membrane thing in there that, that separates it, that's a diaphragm. 3A, a more or less rigid partition in the body or shell of an invertebrate. So this one is more or less rigid. What, an invertebrate, maybe like a lobster or a crab? What? I didn't know they had diaphragms. Maybe we need to put a link in the show notes so you can learn, because I don't know. I don't know where their diaphragm is. It's in the body or the shell. Hmm, interesting. 3B, a transverse septum in a plant stem. A transverse, does that mean it goes across the stem? So if the stem goes up, this thing goes maybe left to right. It goes across. And where is the septum? It's a trans. It's a transverse septum, so it separates it probably somewhere. Plants have diaphragms. All right, if you say so. Number four is a device that limits the aperture of a lens or optical system. Compare to the words iris diaphragm. I think this might be. If, if I know correctly, this might be in an old camera. They have that um, big sort of flexible accordion style thing that separates the lens from the body of the camera. And I think that may be called the diaphragm. I could be wrong, but it is movable and flexible. Um, but it could be something else. Now, this says doc, does it, this talks about the aperture. And that's more about how much light gets let into a camera. So maybe it's different. Maybe maybe there will be some links uh, in the show notes or pictures on the social media to, to talk more about all these things. So we can see them and learn about them more than what this book is telling us. Five, a thin flexible disc, as in a microphone or loudspeaker, that vibrates when struck by sound waves or that vibrates to generate sound waves. So, this is, this is a perfect example. I'm holding a microphone in my hand, and inside of it is a flexible disc that vibrates. When my voice hits that thing, it vibrates, and it creates, uh, it generates sound waves through the electronics of the microphone into the cable, the XLR cable, and then into the recorder that is recording that sound. And then, as you are playing this on your phone, computer, whatever device it is, that sound is transmitted somehow either through a cable or through the airwaves like Bluetooth, and they hit your speaker. They could be little uh, headphones, some sort of headphones or a physical speaker that goes out into the air and the diaphragm once that sound that electrical signal hits it it vibrates and it creates a sound it 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 hits the diaphragm and the diaphragm makes the sound there and it's the full circle diaphragms number six for diaphragm is a molded cap 
usually of thin rubber fitted over the uterine cervix to act as a mechanical contraceptive barrier. Yet, yeah, when you are talking about a diaphragm, you, you have to be very specific as what diaphragm are you talking about. Is it the one under your lungs? Is it the thing that you put in your body to, to not have the babies? Um, or is it the thing in a tube? Or is it the thing on a microphone? Or all these types of things on a camera? Lots of diaphragms in the world. Let's see. Yes, um, it's uh, the well. It's specifically talking about number six. Um, there, there's lots of forms of contraception, and um, I don't know. I don't know how much these get used. But they are there. Everybody has their own personal preference of how they want to um, use contraception. So it's a thing. It's it's one of the many options. But you you know you still got to use condoms. That's kind of first and foremost. Do that. Do that, please and thank you. Diaphrag. How do you say this word? Diaphragmatic. Diaphragmatic or diaphragmatic. That is an adjective, and diaphragmatically is an adverb. Something that is done with a diaphragm. This is from the Greek diaphrasine, which means to barricade. So that very, very clearly is uh, for the number six, the contraception barrier. Uh, it barricades. And then that is from dia plus frasine, which means to enclose. Enclose and to barricade seem pretty, pretty similar. Not sure how the dia prefix is used here. Things can't go through it. Yeah, you put the, you enclose a thing and then you put the dia prefix and you're stopping things from going through, I guess. Um... And then it doesn't, I guess, I guess the diaphragm in your body, the thing under your lungs, it's, uh, what is it doing? Is it, in, it's enclosing your abdomen, the abdominal portion, it's barricading, I don't know, I don't know what it's doing, but it's a thing, when you breathe and you let it out, you're using your diaphragm. Okay, one more word for this episode. <laughs> Diaphysis. Diaphysis. D I A P H Y S I S. Diaphysis. Noun from um, 1831. The shaft of a long bone. So, is this like your femur bone? Would this be the part in between the nubby parts at the ends? I don't know what those nubby parts are called. But you take your femur bone, and maybe if you if you cut off the the wider parts at the either end, the rest of it is called the diaphysis. Hmm. Diaphysial. Diaph. Diaphysial, or diaphysial. Diaphysial or diaphysial. That is an adjective. So this is a Greek word, and it is the spinous or spinous process of the tibia. This is from diaphysthai, diaphysthai, which means to grow between, from dia plus phyene, which means to bring forth, and there's more at the word be. So I guess this is the part that grows between the nubby parts of the bone. That's all. That's all I can think of. It's the it's the shaft of a bone of a long bone. Well, my fingers have short bones, but they still have a the the skinny part in the middle. Hmm. So many words I didn't even know existed. All right. It it is time to reread the words we had today. Diaper or diaper, diaper diaper rash. Diaphaneity, diaphanous, diaphone, diaphorase, diaphoresis, diaphoretic, diaphragm, and diaphysis. There are some really great words here. Things that we learned all about, like diaphanous 
is a uh, like a see-through thing, ethereal, insubstantial, and vague. Um, but I think I think uh, obviously diapers are a, a wonderful invention, and I think we should all wear them all the time. But I think I might have to pick diaphragm as the word of the episode because, well, it's uh, it's a very useful in your body. It's a great thing for contraception. It is used in things like speakers and microphones and other tubes and cameras. Um, and so just the whole idea of a diaphragm is, uh, it's very useful, um, very important. It's, um, lots of things need diaphragms. Lots of things need diaphragms. Lots of things need diaphragms. Don't have no babies, because you're going to need to put the diapers on the baby, so you need a diaphragm. I don't even know if I was using my diaphragm for that. I think that is a fine place to end this episode. Thank you very much for listening to me talk about the words. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the dictionary. It's not that one or this this other one. It's this this one right now. Um, okay. Social media, if you want to go uh, message me there or see this, the things that I post over there, you can go to Instagram and Twitter at DictionaryPod. I hope you know how to spell dictionary. Go to the dictionary to learn how to spell dictionary. Um, my personal stuff is at Speedjampar, which you can use that same handle for Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and YouTube. And um, if you want to email this podcast show, it is DictionaryPod at gmail.com. You can join the Patreon, um, and uh, you, you can give me a little, a little bit of bucks a month, and uh, you can get episodes early, and there's some exclusives, and sometimes if I have a guest and there's a video portion and they give approval, then uh, you will be able to see the video over there. And if you want to buy merchandise for this show, this sh- the link is in the show notes. It's under uh, T Public. Go to T Public, And uh, there's a Google Voice number which is in the show notes. If you want to call it and leave a message, maybe I'll put it in an episode. If you want to create your own little 15-second or so song, intro song, I may put that in an episode. If you want to do your own sound effect, I can put that in an episode. Um, If you want to, oh, you definitely want to do this. You want to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to this on. If you haven't already, you want to share it. Share it on the social media email it out to people, put it in put it in an envelope and mail it to somebody. Um, and then, of course, you got to rate and review. If you're not rating and reviewing, then really what are you doing with your life? You got to rate and review all the things in your life because we live in a society based on upvotes and downvotes and stars. Okay. Let's let's talk about the these words today. I think we're going to do the same sound effect that we did in the previous one because you'll find out later and I'm a mature adult um and I just think it's funny. And there's more words in this episode so we have more opportunities to have fun with the sound effect. The first word is I think it's pronounced diapir 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 D I A P-I-R, it's almost diaper, but it's diaper, I think. This is a noun from 1918. An anti-clinical fold in which a mobile core has broken through brittle overlying rocks. And diapiric, diapiric is an adjective. Now, I don't understand what this is at all. None of these words have any context with each other in my brain. A fold that is anti-clinical. There is a mobile core that has broken through the brittle rocks that are overlying. Yeah, that doesn't help. This is a French word, probably from the Greek diapirine, which means to drive through from dia plus pirine, which means to pierce akin to the Greek word poros, which means passage, and there's more at the word fare, F-A-R-E. So you have to pay a fare when you're going through a passage. 
And uh, let's see, the Greek word poros, which means passage, that's like porous. If something is porous, things can go through that passageway. Um, so it's piercing through, driving through, but I don't understand what this definition is at all. We'll put a link in the show notes for diapir. Something with rocks. Sound effect will be... The next word is diapositive. Diapositive. Noun from 1893. A positive photographic image of on transparent material as glass or film. Hmm, this is interesting. So when you take a photograph on film, the negative uh, that is created, I guess, would be diapositive because it's transparent, but it is not a, it's not positive. That would probably be dianegative. I literally just said it's a negative, but in the definition, it says it's positive. So when you develop that negative onto a um oh i'm blanking on the name but you know those the the little the tiny little transparent photograph is that you put in like one of those projectors um a slide it's a slide that would probably be diapositive because it's a positive image all the colors are correct um it's not a negative and it's transparent i don't know of other examples of diapositive photographic images but if you just put it on a put the photograph on a piece of glass that's a diapositive because you can see through it see that's where the dia prefix comes in it's a positive image that you can see through dia negative well no we would have already had dia negative if it was in here and we didn't have it so uh i guess it's not a word the next word Diapsid, diapsid, D-I-A-P-S-I-D, adjective from circa 1909, of relating to or including reptiles, as the crocodiles, with two pairs of temporal openings in the skull, or temporal or temporal. Those are like, like your, your, in your skull you have a temple, it's like your forehead kind of. And so they have two pairs of tempor- temporal openings in the skull, which are those for their ears. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, these are types of reptiles that have those temporal openings. This is from the Greek di plus hapsid or hapsis, which means loop or arch. And there's more at the word apsis. Hmm. I don't know what loop or arch means in connection with these openings in the skull. Maybe they create a loop of some kind. I don't know. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes because that's a fun thing to do. The next word is diarchy. I don't know how to say it. Diarchy, 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 D I A R C H Y. It's just a variation of the same word with a Y instead of an I. So that's going to be almost to the end of the D's. The D-Y's. The next word. (laughs) Diarist. Noun from circa 1818. D-I-A-R-I-S-T. Diarist. This is just one who keeps a diary. If you have a diary a journal, a gurnal, if you write in it regularly, you would be a diarist. The next word, diaristic, adjective from 1884, of, relating to, or characteristic of a diary, as in, her diaristic tone. Is that, what sort of tone is that? Is that like, the tone that you use when you write in your diary. Dear diary, today I had some food. Is that a diaristic tone? Dear diary, I did some stuff today, then I went to sleep. Bye. The next word, oh, here it is. 
diarrhea. 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 Do you know how to spell this word? Nobody knows how to spell this word. It is D-I-A-R-R-H-E-A. Diarrhea. Noun from... I think a lot of people just shut off this podcast. Noun from the 14th century. Number one. Abnormally frequent intestinal evacuations with more or less fluid stools. I'm pretty sure all of us have experienced diarrhea at some point. Yes, it's very fluidy, and it's abnormal. It's abnormally frequent, so it means you you don't get it very often. It's not a lot of times in your life, but it's every once in a while. And if you're getting a lot of diarrhea, you might want to go get that checked out. The things in your intestines are being evacuated. They're very liquidy. I have, I think it's something like if you're dehydrated, you can get diarrhea, which is weird because it's very liquidy, but I guess that makes sense because your body is expelling the liquid. Oh, diarrhea is the worst. Number two. Oh, I once had a book. I might still have it somewhere. It was all like word things, things that have been written that were like funny word things. Um, and s- supposedly, I think it was all true, taken from real things, and somebody had written, it must have been fake, it was still funny, somebody had written a note uh, for their kid, like excusing them from school, say, oh, sorry, my kid couldn't go to school yesterday, they had, and then they tried to write the word diarrhea, but they couldn't spell it, they wrote it over and over again, st- r- struck it through, wrote it, struck it through, they didn't know how to spell it, and at the bottom, they just wrote shits. <laughs> Sorry, my kid couldn't couldn't go to school today. They had the shits. Um, number two for diarrhea is excessive flow, as in th- what this podcast is verbal diarrhea. I am consistently talking a lot off the top of my head, so there's there's the uh, metaphorical diarrhea coming out of the mouth. Hmm diarrheal with an l at the end that is an adjective diarrheic is also an adjective and diuretic is an adjective this is from let's see goes to the greek diarrhea or diarene diarene which means to flow through flowing through your system super fast that is from dia, which means through, plus rain, R-H-E-I-N, which means to flow, and there's more at the word stream. Yeah, sometimes it feels like it's just a stream of liquid. All right, I think, I don't think we need to talk about diarrhea anymore, except I have to make the sound effect of... The next word is, it's, it's still diarrhea... I don't know if they pronounce it differently, but this is the chiefly British variation of diarrhea. So this one is spelled, let's see, okay, I think the only difference is that they added an O after the H. So it's D-I-A-R-R-H-O-E-A, diarrhea, it's still diarrhea. The next word, diarrhea. How do you say this? Diarthrosis. Diarthrosis. Noun from 1578. One. Articulation that permits free movement. So I can, if I move my arm around, articulation that permits free movement. So I guess my joints, would would they have diarthrosis? Diarthrosis. Number two. A freely movable joint is a diarthrosis. And sometimes people can't move their joints so good, so those would not be diarthrosis. Uh, This is from the Greek diarthrone, diarthrone, which means to joint. So when two things come together, they have been jointed. They are jointing to joint. From dia plus arthrone, which means to fasten by a joint. And that is from arthrone, which means joint. And there's more at the prefix arthur, arthur, 
A R T H R, like arthro, uh, arthro. Why can't I think of any words that start that way? Let's let's go find a quick example here. Arthropod, arthroscope, arthroscopy, arthrosis. So yeah, those are dealing with the with the joints, I guess. Um, so so it it's uh it's your joints, but it can go through. That's the dia prefix. They can move through all of the various motions that that joint can make. Diarthrosis. The next word. Diary. Diary. Noun from 1581. Number one. A record of events, transactions, or observations kept daily or at frequent intervals. The synonym is journal, or as I like to say, gurnal, and especially a daily record of personal activities, reflections, or feelings. Um, I, I guess you could say I keep a diary. I don't, there's no reflections or feelings, really. It's literally just, this is what I did. Every day, I, I write down just what I did, and it, uh, it's, it's not, it's not interesting in any way, but it does help me to look back, because I have such a bad memory anyway, that I can look back and, uh, and figure out what I did, and, um, it, it actually has come in very handy um, when I need to figure out when, when something happened. So, uh, yeah, I, I, do, I do recommend that everybody keep at least something like that. Something simple of, this is what I did. Um, if you keep a track of what you ate, that would be a, a food diary. Um, you're, but I think reflections and feelings. I think if you've got the time, I think that's also good. It's, it's probably therapeutic for you to write down about how you felt throughout the day. Number two, a book intended or used for a diary. You might intend to use it for a diary, but if you don't use it, then it's just it's just sitting there not being used to its full potential, and then it gets very sad, and, and it's just sitting there blank. You got to use it if you're going to have it. This is from the Latin diarium, which is from Dies, I still don't know how to pronounce that word, dies, D-I-E-S, and that means day. So the whole idea is about doing it every day, writing the thing daily. And there's more at the word deity, D-E-I-T-Y. I'm going to keep up, keep up with my diary as often as I can. Every once in a while, I'll forget for like a couple days, like on the weekends, like, actually, today, I didn't... Every morning, I write in what I did the day before, and I have not done that today. And then and then it gets to, like, Monday, and I'm like, oh, crap, I need to fill in, like, two days. What did I do? The next word... <laughs> diaspora. Or diaspora. Diaspora, diaspora. Noun from 1881. Number one is capitalized... So here we have 1A, the settling of scattered colonies of Jews outside Palestine after the Babylonian exile. So I guess the actual settling of them into, uh, into this area was just called the diaspora. 1B, the area outside Palestine settled by Jews. So the act of settling down is the diaspora, and then the actual area is called diaspora because I guess that's that was the act of settling. They just named it after that. I have heard this word, but I honestly didn't really know what it was. 1C, the Jews living outside Palestine or modern Israel. So they settled, that's a diaspora. They settled in a place called diaspora. Who lived there? The diaspora. Lots of ways to use this word. 2A. Here's, here's three more ways to use this word. 2A. The movement, migration, or scattering of a people away from an established or ancestral homeland. Just in general, not just about the Jews. Um, as in the example, 
the black diaspora to northern cities. So I, it sounds like this is, uh, huh, this is interesting. Okay, we're, we'll get there. So I think this one is, this example is talking about the African American people, the black people who moved from the south of the U.S. where there was slavery and they moved north where there largely really wasn't slavery. Um, but what's interesting is that that was not their that was not their ancestral homeland. It was their established homeland because they had been there for many, many years. Um, so yes, established homeland is in the definition. And yeah, they were like, we, we don't want to be down there with you doing the making you making us do things. Um, you know, to put it lightly, we don't want to be there anymore. We're going to go up north where we can be free. Yay. So that whole, that that movement, that migration, uh, that time period of, of the act of them moving from the south to the north was the diaspora. But there's more. To be. People settled far from their ancestral homelands, as in African diaspora. So I guess the people who left their ancestral homeland of, say, Africa, uh, are called the diaspora. And then, you know, just just the, I guess, the act of moving from Africa or someplace to America or some other place, that is also called diaspora. And then, similar to the number one definitions, we have 2C, the place where these people live is the diaspora. So the diaspora did a diaspora to a diaspora. Diasporic is an adjective. This is a Greek word and it means dispersion, which is from diasperine, which means to scatter, which is from dia, which uh, which means through, plus sparing, which means to sow, like sowing your seeds, planting things. Um, so, uh, yeah, you get you they get scattered and then they settle. When you're sowing your seeds, you're probably settled in one place. Hmm. Uh, my friend Mark, he started a podcast uh, that also has a video portion. I don't think he does it anymore, but he um, he was doing it for a little while and he got a really a lot of great interviews. And he called it Shiaspora because he's from Chicago. And he is Jewish, so I think he had a connection to that word, obviously. And um, he was interviewing people in L.A. who had come from Chicago and ended up in L.A. And so he was just interviewing them about their life and Chicago specifically. And um, I I thought it was just a really clever name uh, for a podcast, for a show. uh, Because I don't know if they were all Jewish or largely Jewish, but it was more about just coming from Chicago, going to L.A., and uh, yeah, good name. And uh, yeah, yeah, obviously, they they did this act of moving from one place and then settling in another place. The next word seems kind of inappropriate to make a poopy farty sound after that, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Diaspore. Noun from 1805. A mineral consisting of aluminum hydrogen oxide. A diaspore. It's just a mineral. It's a thing that you can maybe hold in your hand. That's all I got for that. The next word. (laughs) Diastase or diastase. Noun from 1838. Number one, the synonym is amylase or amylase, especially a mixture of amylases from malt. M-A-L-T, malt. Number two, this synonym is just enzyme. So any enzyme, could you also call it a diastase? The etymology says it is from the Greek diastasis, which means separation or interval, from diastenai. Diastenai? Uh, That means to separate. That is from dia plus histenai, which means to cause, to stand. And there's more at the word stand. Hmm. Standing, maybe just being still, but then separating. 
And uh, yeah, I don't know anything about amylase or really anything about enzymes. That's that's the world we're talking about. The chemicals, the biology, all of that. The next word. I don't know what sort of farty sound that is. Diastatic. Adjective from 1881 relating to or having the properties of diastase, especially converting starch into sugar. The process of converting starch into sugar or relating to that is diastatic. Which is funny because static is it's static is when something is still. But now the the etymology did does say that histonai is to cause to stand, which is all about being still. But this sounds like it's not being still. It's converting starch into sugar. There's an action happening. There's something going on. There's change. And that's not about being still or static. But there is, there must be something, something about being still and static. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I don't know. There's so much about what the body does that I just don't know. I don't think it's very complicated, but I haven't studied it. We have one, one more word for this episode. The very last one. The last word is diastema. D-I-A-S-T-E-M-A. Noun from 1854. This is a space between teeth in a jaw. Hmm. A space between teeth and a jaw. So is this the space between, like if you look at my two front teeth, there's going to be a tiny bit of space, probably closer to the gum, but some people have actual spaces, like uh, some people in their, their two front teeth on the top, they have a big gap. So is that the diastema? Or is this is this when you close your teeth together? Is the diastema this space in between your top and your bottom teeth? Uh, I'm trying to think of other examples of where this space might be. Um, this is from, or it's a it's a lower Latin word, diastema, which means interval, and that's kind of it. Uh, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes or uh, an image on social media so we can see what, what this space is that we're talking about, the diastema. All right, we now have to read, read the words of the episode so we can pick a word of the episode. We had diapir, diapositive, diapsid. I'm, I'm reading the definitions a little bit to remind myself. Diapsid, diarchy, diarist, diaristic, diarrhea, diarrhea, diarthrosis, diary, diaspora, diaspore, diastase, diastatic, and diastema. I think I'm debating between diary and diaspora. I think um, it is a very good thing to uh, keep a diary, maybe a dream, a dream diary, a dream journal. Do that. It helps you to remember them. Um, But I think diaspora, um, not specifically with Jews or black black people or just, but more specifically, um, it's just, it's an interesting idea of a group of people leaving one place probably because they don't like it there for whatever reason and then going to another place where hopefully they will have a better life and i just like that idea a lot of people have had to leave there's a lot of refugee situations all over the world for many many years and uh we've just there's just a lot of examples like that so diaspora shall be the word of the episode diaspora 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 i'm not gonna put any words to this song diaspora wow that really trailed off to nothing literally all right that is going to be the end of this episode oh it was just thanksgiving yesterday when i recorded this so we watched Finally, I got around to re-watching Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which I hadn't seen since probably before 1990, 
It came out in 87, and I'm I'm sure I saw it maybe in the theaters, and then maybe once after that on home video. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just, it's a good movie. Uh, it gets real serious and real goofy and heartwarming and sad sometimes, and uh, there's a lot going on in there. But yeah, it's a good one. And wow, Steve Martin's character is... Uh, I, he's, he's a, he can be a real butthead <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, oh, we also watched home for the holidays, which I guess I'd never seen. I thought I had, but I don't think I had. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real good one. It's, it's, you know, it's just all about a family. I guess you could say dis- dysfunctional. All families have some level of dysfunctionality, I guess, um, Oh, we're probably going to get to that word soon, dysfunctional. And uh, yeah, it's good. There's there's some weird things. I feel like there's some weird uh, ways that people talk or things that people do that didn't quite work in my brain. But um, but yeah, it just shows, shows a, I would assume, a f- semi-fairly typical family. I don't know. It's not typical to me, so it was a little hard to relate. But I think there's a lot of people who are kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, It takes place on Thanksgiving Day, pretty much all in one day. All right, that is going to be the end of the episode. We finished page 345, and I can't wait to see what comes up next. There may be a guest in about four episodes. I'm really hoping, uh, working on scheduling that one, and uh, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Welcome to it. Happy you're here. No, words didn't come out the right way. Hey, let's talk about the words. The first word in this episode is (laughs) diastereomer. Diastereomer. Um, oh boy, the, the book did it again. The word at the top of the page that says the beginning of the first word on this page is not the same as the word that we're saying. Um, Stereo, we'll figure it out because I think it's one of the other versions. But why wouldn't it be the main word? It's, oh, it's the alternate spelling. Why would the alternate spelling be considered the first word in this episode? In, In, on this page, I mean. Okay, this word is spelled D-I-A-S-T-E-R-E-O-M-E-R. Diastereomer or stereomer. And the alternative spelling is, let's see, D-I-A-S-T-E-R-E-O-I-S-O-M-E-R. So wait, that has a whole additional syllable? Diastereoisomer. Ho <laughs> we we added two syllables, I think. Diastereoisomer. Or just the simpler way, which is still complicated, which is diastereomer. Diastereomer. Oh boy. Okay. This what is it? What is it? What is this thing that we're talking about? It is a noun from 1936. It is A stereoisomer of a compound having two or more chiral centers that is not a mirror image of another stereoisomer of the same compound. And it says compare to enantiomer. Enantiomer. Oh my god, that sounds like a like an elven fantasy name. Um diastereomeric. Or diastereoisomeric, that is an adjective, and uh, diastereoisomerism, isomerism, diastereoisomerism, that is a noun, and I don't understand what this thing is at all. It's a it's a certain kind of stereoisomer that has the dia prefix. Probably because, why? Because it goes through, there's a compound, and there's two or more chiral centers. Oh, Do we need to put a link in the show notes? Fine, let's do that. Fun word, though. Okay, the next word, we're just going to go... Bum, 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 bum. 
The next word is diastole. Diastole. D I A S T O L E. Noun from circa 1578. A rhythmically recurrent expansion. Diastole is a rhythmically recurrent expansion. So is this something that is expanding in a rhythmic way and it happens over and over again? Um, especially, we have some more information. This is the dilation of the cavities of the heart during which they fill with blood. Diastolic is an adjective. So, back to the heart. The dilation, no, it is the dilatation, the dilatation of the cavities of the heart uh, during which they fill with blood. So the heart has some cavities, which means they're just big holes that can fill with things like blood. Hopefully it's just blood. It's like the one place, one of the few places where you actually want something to fill with blood. Um, so the dilatation of the cavities of the heart. Um, and so when the heart, so this is the, the time when the cavity is filling up. It is expanding because it is being filled with blood. Uh, I think the heart is kind of pulling it. It's kind of pulling and pushing it into the cavity all at the same time. And because it's pushing from the other side and it's kind of pulling it from this side. So it's expanding. It's recurrent. So it's happening over and over again. And it's in a rhythm. It's in a regular rhythm. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. Um, I don't know if the ba or the bum is the diastole. I don't know. I think it would probably be the Maybe it's, I don't know, it's one of them. But basically, something's expanding in a regularly rhythmic fashion. The etymology says, it is from the Greek diastole, which means dilatation, which is from diastelene, which means to expand, from dia plus stelene, which means to prepare or send. So it's being prepared. You're preparing it to send it through, and it's expanding, and it's dilating. Um, I think this is the the diastole is one of the numbers on the heart pressure thing. It's like there's another. It's like oh my heart, my blood pressure is one twenty over eighty, and one of those numbers I think is the diastole. I don't know which one it is. I think I'm remembering that correctly, but I could be wrong. It's like the systole and the diastole. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, you'd think I would know more about medical things by the time I'm this age of 42, but I've learned a lot, still got a lot to learn, or, or rather remember. I've learned things. I just haven't remembered them all. The next word. Bum, 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 bum. This is diastrophism. D-I-A-S-T-R-O-P-H-I-S-M diastrophism noun from 1890 the synonym is tectonism t-e-c-t onism mm, diastrophic is an adjective and diastrophically is an adverb but what are we talking about here Tecton tectonism is the synonym I, of course, first think of the tectonic plates. Um, but what does the etymology say? Is it going to help? Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. This is from the Greek diastrophe, which means twisting, from diastrophene, diastrophene, which means to distort, from dia plus strephene, which means to twist. So twisting and distorting. Hmm... Yeah, I don't I don't know if I would call the tectonic plates twisting and distorting per se, but there is sort of some distorting like when they run into each other and they create mountains. Um interesting, yeah. I guess we can't learn about diastrophism until we get to the T's. The T's. You can make some green or black tea in the T's. All right. Uh, since we don't have much to say, let's move on to bum 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 bum. Diatessarin. Diatessarin. 
D-I-A-T-E-S-S-A-R-O-N, noun from 1803, a harmony of the four Gospels edited and arranged into a single connected narrative. It's somehow the four Gospels were put together into harmony. I don't understand how that happened exactly, because I think these are just written stories. Uh, what does the etymology say? This is uh, from the Greek dia tesseron, which literally means gospel out of four. Uh, there is a part in parentheses before the dia tesseron, which says euangelion. Euangelion dia tesseron. That means gospel out of four. I guess it's one gospel out of four. Uh, from dia, which means through or out of plus tesseron, which means, uh, which is from tesseres, which means four. And there's more at the prefix dia and the word four, F-O-U-R. Hmm. <laughs> so the dia tesseron is just the four gospels coming together to make a new thing, I guess, maybe, I don't know. I think this is from the Bible, so... I don't know, but it's a thing, I guess, and it's in harmony. Bum, 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 bum. The next word is diathermy. Diathermy. D-I-A-T-H-E-R-M-Y. Noun from 1909. This is the generation of heat in tissue by electric currents for medical or surgical purposes. Hmm. Okay, so there's heat being generated, being created in the tissues like your muscles and skins and ligaments and things like that. So there is heat uh, that's created because of electrical currents. And I guess this is when they, they put the, med uh, the electrical currents through your tissues on purpose in medical or surgical situations like maybe they have to zap your brain with little electrical currents uh, to see what's going on during brain surgery or maybe to see how to, to get a muscle to move or something. So that's just the electrical current. But then the heat that is created from that is called the diathermy. Um, diathermic is an adjective. The therm part of that word, T-H-E-R-M, I think that means maybe heat or something related to heat. And then I think here the dia prefix is, you know, through. It's going through the tissue. So I think that makes sense. There's no uh, specific etymology otherwise. Diathermy. So if I get shocked by something, if I'm rubbing my, my slipper feet on the carpet and then I touch you or the door handle and I get a shock and it's hot, it's hot, it's a hot one, then I guess that is some diathermy. The next word, bum 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 bum, diathesis. It looks like diathesis, but it is diathesis. Noun from 1651, a constitutional predisposition toward a particular state or condition and especially one that is abnormal or diseased. And diathetic is an adjective. So, constitutional predisposition. So, something, I think this is something about your body that is predisposed. It is more likely to do this thing toward a particular state or condition. Uh, especially one that is abnormal. So I guess this is something in your body that is more likely to be abnormal or diseased. Um, I, guess, I guess, and that condition, it's not the thing, it's not the part of your body that's called the diathesis. It's the condition, I think, having this thing is, is the diathesis, I guess. Uh, this is a Greek word. It literally means arrangement. This is from diatithani, diatithani, which means to arrange, plus di, which uh, from dia plus tithani, which means to set, 
And there's more at the word do. Do it, set it, arrange it. Uh, I think I feel like I may need to put a link in the show notes so we know more about diathesis, this uh, constitutional predisposition toward particular state or condition. I guess that I don't know. It's confusing. Something about being abnormal and diseased. It must be used in medical terms. The next word. Boom, 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 boom. Diatam. I think it's diatam and not di... Oh, no, it might be... No, it's diatom. Diatom, because it is spelled D-I-A-T-O-M. Diatom. Noun from 1845. Any of a class of minute planktonic unicellular or colonial algae or algae with silicified skeletons that form diatomaceous earth. Who we? Oh, so many fun words in this one. First of all, diatomaceous is coming up real soon in this episode, so you'll learn more very soon. Uh, let's see, the class name is Bacillariophyceae. Bacillariophyceae. Something like that. They are very tiny, planktonic, unicellular, or colonial algae, algae. I think I said that wrong before. So, planktonic, minute, pla- wait, minute planktonic, unicellular algae, or minute planktonic colonial algae. Those are the two different options. Their skeletons are silicified. Is that something with silica? Uh, silicified skeletons. Um, yeah, maybe when they when they die, their skeletons become silicified, which I think becomes silica, maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe we got to post a picture of a diatom on the social media. And uh, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes, too. This is from the Greek diatomos, which means cut in half. Why? Well, it's also from diatemnin, diatemnin, which means to cut through, from dia, plus temnin, which means to cut, and there's more at the word tome, T-O-M-E. So maybe they look like they've been cut in half, Hmm. I don't know. I do feel like I've heard of these before, and I think they look kind of interesting. The diatoms. Next. Next. Bum, 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 bum. Diatomaceous. Uh, diatomaceous. Yeah. D-I-A-T-O-M-A-C-E-O-U-S. Adjective from 1847. Consisting of or abounding in diatoms or their silicious 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 remains Uh, and then yes uh, the example is diatomaceous silica so their remains are silicious silicious i don't know how to even say that word there's so many s sounds s-i-l-i-c-e-o-u-s silicious remains. Uh, Yeah, so something that's just related to the diatoms that has used their remains, their skeletons, it would be diatomaceous. The next word. Diatomaceous earth. Two words. Noun from 1883. A light, friable, siliceous material derived chiefly from diatom remains and used especially as a filter. Uh, A filter? Filter for what? A filter like what? You could put in your your heater, your air air conditioner? Uh, What? It's friable. How do you, how and why are you frying it? Is it the same kind of fry that I think of? But it's probably a different fry. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, it's made from the remains of the diatoms. They have been deceased. They have died. And then they make this siliceous material from their bones, if they have bones, whatever sort of skeleton they have. Interesting. 
Uh, I think silica, it's similar to carbon. I think I've heard that um, there is some thought that if they find aliens on other planets that uh, they may not be carbon-based life forms like we are. They could be silica-based life forms like we are not. Um, I don't remember the specifics, but it's something about how many things, how many atoms can attach to the silica atom, uh, something like that. And uh, they say silica is the maybe next most likely or one of the most likely uh, candidates for something like that. Uh, for, for life forms to be based on on other planets. All right, moving on to... Bum, 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 bum. Diatomic. D-I-A-T-O-M-I-C. Or actually, I guess the easier way to spell it would be D-I-A-T-O-M-I-C. Diatomic. Diatomic. Adjective from circa... 1859, consisting of two atoms or also having two atoms in the molecule. So if a molecule has two atoms or anything that has two atoms related to atom to two atoms, consisting of two atoms is diatomic. So we're not using the dia prefix, we're using the di prefix and then atoms. Uh, what's that band? Adam and his package, and it's spelled A T O M. So if there's two atoms, it would be diatom and his package. I don't know, something like that. The next word, bum 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 bum. Diatomite. Diatomite. Noun from 1887. The synonym is diatomaceous earth. It's the stuff, the light, friable, siliceous material derived chiefly from diatom remains and used especially as a filter. Diatomite. So if you see diatomite, maybe that's the more common way that if it's, a, if it's literally a filter that you buy for your house somewhere, if it says diatomite, uh, yeah. Hmm. It is so very similar to diatomic, though. But it's not. Unless... Unless they are related somehow. I don't know if they are. Moving on to... Bum, 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 bum. Diatonic. Diatonic. Adjective from... Eight... No. 1694. Of relating to or being a musical scale... As a major or minor scale. Comprising intervals of five whole steps and two half steps. If I had a piano in front of me, if I had a piano in front of me, I would play a diatonic scale and I can't sing it, although I've been trying. Um, so I don't know if it's five whole steps in order and then two half steps at the end. Um, I'm not sure. I will put a link in the show notes so you can learn more about the diatonic scale. Uh, let's see. This is from the Greek diatonos, which means stretching stretching from diatinin which means to stretch out from dia plus tanin which means to stretch and there's more at the word thin hmm so i thought this would be more re- specifically related to the words that are in this word dia and tonic dia means through and tonic is like I think the bass note of a scale, like the C scale, the bass note, the tonic note would be C, unless I have my words wrong. So I thought this was maybe something about going through the bass note. I'm not sure. Um, But clearly that is not correct. So I, I know the standard major scale, it's, what is it? It's a whole step, a whole step, a half step, Whole, 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 half. Um, and so, but this one is made up of whole, 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 half, half. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how to sing that. My brain isn't that smart. The next word. Bum, 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 bum. I don't know. I tried to sing a diatonic scale, although I don't know if I did it correctly. 
the the smarty the smarty musical people they know all about those different scales. The next word, ba 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 ba, diatribe, noun from fifteen eighty one. Number one is archaic, and it is a prolonged discourse. So a a conversation that's very very long was called a diatribe. B- uh, number two. A bitter and abusive speech or writing is a diatribe. So if you write a thing that you either just keep on paper or say out loud, and it is bitter and abusive, it's a diatribe. Why must you be so bitter and abusive? Sometimes you gotta be. Number three, ironic or satirical criticism. So you're criticizing, but maybe you're doing it in kind of a funny way, so it's more easily agreeable, accessible. That's a diatribe. Um, I definitely did think diatribe was the idea of something that kind of goes on for a while, a long thing. So it's funny to me that a prolonged discourse, this number one definition, is archaic. Like if somebody's just going on for a while, say, oh, they're on their diatribe again. Uh, this is from Greek diatribe. I don't know how to pronounce it. That means pastime or discourse. From diatribine, which means to spend, like spend time or wear away. From dia plus trebine or tribine or tribine, which means to rub. So rub, that makes sense for wearing away. Uh, But then how it became pastime or discourse, I don't know. Or a speech or a thing. Huh, that's 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 an odd one. Hmm. Maybe if you're... Maybe if you're having a really long discussion, you're sort of wearing it away. It's almost like beating a dead horse. Like, okay, we're done with this. We, We talked about this enough. We don't have to do that anymore. There's more at the word throw. Throw diatribe yeah maybe if i find a good diatribe that somebody's written i'll put the link in the show notes the next word bum 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 almost sounds like the beginning to a uh, mr sandman yes bring me a dream boom 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 okay the next word is diazepam Diazepam, D-I-A-Z-E-P-A-M, noun from circa 1961, a tranquilizer, C-16, H-13, C-L-N-2-O, used especially to relieve anxiety and tension and as a muscle relaxant. Uh, So I guess if you're having some anxiety or tension, somebody might prescribe you some diazepam to make you sleep and forget all about your troubles because that's the best way to deal with your troubles is to just forget about them and ignore them and not deal with them constructively. Uh, This is of unknown origin other than uh, it's from benzodiazepine plus am. So they took the uh, the DIA... Z-E-P, from the middle of benzodiazepine, and then they put the A-M at the end. Diazepam. Hmm. I have definitely heard of this one. Yeah, don't uh, don't know much about it, though, other than what I just read. There is one more word for this episode, and we have to make a sound effect that goes bum 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 Diazanan. No, diazanan. Diazanon, D-I-A-Z-I-N-O-N, noun from 1957. It is a cholinesterase-inhibiting organophosphate insecticide, C12H21N2O3PS. It's an insecticide. It's going to kill the insects, and it inhibits organophosphate and how does it inhibit i guess it's with a cholinesterase hmm uh this is it's a trademark it's from diazanon with a capital d a trademark 
So they made this insecticide. Uh, that's yeah. I this is this related to no, probably not. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't think I've ever used it. Okay, okay. There were a lot of words in this episode that I had uh, not ever heard before. Didn't know how to pronounce. Learn some good stuff in here. Yeah, what did we have? We had diastereomer, stereomer, or diastereoisomer. Um, don't know what that is. We had diastole. That's a good thing that the heart does. You want to make sure that your heart keeps on doing the diastole. Uh, we had diastrophism. Diastrophism. That's the synonym is tectonism, so we don't know what that one is. We had diatessarin. Uh, these are the four gospels. We had diathermy, the heat in the in the tissues. There was diathesis. Uh, something about abnormal or diseased diatoms. These are the things that have silica skeletons. Silica skeletons. Ooh, that's a good band name or something. Spencer and the silica skeletons. Diatomaceous. Diatomaceous earth. Diatomic. Diatomite. Diatonic. Diatribe. Diazepam. And diazanon. Hmm, I'm debating between diatonic, the musical scale, um, and uh, let's see, what was the other one? The the uh, the what was the other one that I was thinking about? Um, oh, diastole. I think that was the other one. I'm gonna do. No, I won't do that. Um, I know that uh, there's different scales back to uh, diatonic that. I don't know if this is one of the scales that if you start it at a different point on the the piano that it becomes a different thing. I'm just thinking, hmm, no, I that I don't know. Um I do I do want to learn. I don't know if I ever will. But I do want to learn all the different types of scales. I probably if I really wanted to learn them, I probably should have gone to music school. Um but uh let's see diastole or diatonic. Hmm. Hmm. Something important that the heart does, or music, which feeds the heart. Hoo-hoo. They both feed the heart. Um, yeah, let's, let's just pick diatonic as the word of the episode. And if I could sing a song in diatonic, I could, I would sing a song, but I don't know how to do that. Um, Diatonic is a scale, but that's not in a diatonic scale. But we tried. We tried so hard. This is the end of the episode. How did we get there? Thank you very much for joining me. Please go let the other people know that you know in your life. Let them know about this show so you can uh, have something to talk about. Maybe at work, around the water cooler, if that's still a thing. You can talk about this show. Oh, what, what did Spencer say about diatonic? Oh, I hated what he said about that one. But I sure loved what he said about diathermy. Diathermy. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this podcast called The Dictionary. I am Spencer. I am your host. I am telling you all these things that I think you really need to know. And, uh, you know, then then you can know it. And then you will never not know it. The first word in this episode is diazo or diazo. D-I-A-Z-O. Diazo, diazo. Adjective from 1878. 1A. Relating to or containing the group N2 composed of two nitrogen atoms united to a single carbon atom of an organic radical. And this is often used in combination. In combination of what? I don't know. It doesn't give me any examples. It's just related to this N2 group with related to nitrogen. Is it two nitrogen? Hmm. Diazo. Okay, let's try 1B. Relating to or containing diazonium. Diazonium. 
and this is also often used in combination. Diazo, I don't know an example. I just don't. Number two, of or relating to a photograph or photocopy whose production involves the use of a coating of diazo compound that is decomposed by exposure to light. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so uh, is this a kind of paper? Is that what it's saying? Uh, relating to a photograph or photocopy whose production involves the use of a coating. So yeah, I guess the paper is coated with this diazo compound. And uh, when it is exposed to light, it decomposes, it changes color, maybe it goes black on paper, so you can make photographs or photocopies using it. I, I don't know, is this an old way to do it? Do we still use this diazo, diazo compound on paper? Um, is it, I don't know nothing about it. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes. That's pretty much it. The etymology isn't uh, helpful. Helpful or useful or useful. Relatedly, the next word, uh, let's see, the sound effect shall be... uh, The next word is diazonium. So yeah, this is related to the last word. It is a noun from 1895. It is the monovalent cation N2 with a plus sign at the top, that is composed of two nitrogen atoms united in carbon in an organic radical and that usually exists in salts used in the manufacture of azo dyes. D-Y-E-S. Yes, still something related to two nitrogen atoms, but uh, that's, I just don't get it. I don't get it. I hope you do. I hope you, I hope you want to know more about it, so you go learn more about it and become a diazonium expert. The next word, this might be, yeah, this is related again. Diazotize. Diazotize. Transitive verb from circa 1889 to convert a compound into a diazo compound. And the example would be diazonium salt. And diazotization, diato, how do you say this? Diaza, diazotization, diazotization is a hard word to say. That is a noun. Um, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Still, still all about nitrogens and things. Okay, that was the end of the DIA section. That lasted quite a while. We now are going to do the DIB section, which is super short, and we're going to start the DIC section. Um, I know, you know, maybe you don't care about me mentioning the first three letters of these words, but um, they tend to be big enough sections that I wanted to mention it. And yeah, the DIC, that's going to go on for about uh, three or four episodes um, and then, uh, yeah, we're just going to go from there like we do. The DID section is short, and then DIE, that's going to go on for a little while. Why are we looking ahead? Let's talk about dibasic. Dibasic, adjective from 1857, having two replaceable hydrogen atoms. And this is used of acids. So I guess if an acid has two hydrogen atoms that can be replaced by what? I don't know what they replace them with. But if if that's the case, uh, then it's dibasic. Mm, yeah, it's about the basics and the acids and the pH and the... And the, there's two. The next word. The next word is dibber. D-I-B-B-E-R. Dibber. The noun, um, it's a noun from 1658. The synonym is dibble. D-I-B-B-L-E. It's the next word. The first form of dibble. Dibble. Noun from the 15th century. It is a small hand implement used to make holes in the ground for plants, seeds, or bulbs. 
uh, 15th century, that's pretty old. So this was this was a very old hand in, implement that they used to use. And, uh, you know, it's prob- it's just a thing. They were like, oh, we just don't want to make holes with our hands anymore. We need a tool to help us so we can plant these things and then they can grow and they'll look pretty or or maybe we can eat these things possibly. Um, and we will need to put a link, uh, maybe a link in the show notes, but also a picture on the social media. Go to Twitter and Instagram and look up at Dictionary Pod and you'll find it. You can see what a dibble looks like. And I guess that's also a dibber. A dibber and a dibble are the same thing. The next word. Dibble. Second form. Transitive verb from 1583. One. To plant with a dibble. If you're planting with a dibble, you're dibbling. Two. To make holes in soil. That's the example of what the holes are in. To make holes in with or as if with a dibble. So you may you may not be putting in plant seeds or bulbs or related things. You may just be making holes. And that's dibbling. But if you are specifically planting things with a dibble, you're also dibbling. I don't know why you'd be making a bunch of holes with a dibbler if it weren't to plant things, but maybe you're just bored. I really want to see one of these things now. The next word. Dibenzofuran. Dibenzofuran. D-I-B-E-N-Z-O-F-U-R-A-N. You can also say dibenzofuran. You can emphasize the last syllable. This one is a noun from 1940. A highly toxic chemical compound, C12H8O, that is used in chemical synthesis and as an insecticide and is a hazardous pollutant when chlorinated. So if you got some of this dibenzofuran, don't chlorinate it because it's going to be very hazardous to your health and nobody wants that. Um, and it's also an insecticide. It's highly toxic by itself, so just don't be fucking around with it. The next word. Dibs. It's just D-I-B-S. Dibs. Noun from 1812. Number one is slang, and this one is money, especially in small amounts. I don't know if I've ever heard of dibs used to describe money, but I have heard it used this way for number two. The synonyms are claim and rights, as in, I have dibs on that piece of cake. If if I, Spencer, am around and there is some vegan cake around, you can just assume right now forevermore that I have dibs on that piece of cake. Don't you touch my cake. That's my cake. Is my cake, I got dibs on it. Uh, oh, you know, dibs on a chair, dibs on the front seat in the car. Uh, yeah. What, where did this name come from? I would like to know. It is short for dibstones. Uh, now I gotta see if dibstones is, is dibstones in here? Wait a minute. If it was, it would be right here in this section and I don't see it. It's short for dibstones, which means jacks. Now, is this the game jacks with the pointy things and the ball? Is that what dibstones are, or is jacks something else? Um, it is from the obsolete, just dib, D-I-B, which means to dab. Like, let's go dabbing, but what dabbing are we talking about? Wait, do we need to go back to dab and see? Is there anything that is going to help this? Because there, there are so many, there's like, there's modern definitions for these words and i don't think they mean those things there's the dab dance there's so many dabs there's this okay a sudden blow or thrust a small amount a gentle stroke uh dabbing your eyes a dab of paint a flatfish a skillful person Oy, okay well that wasn't helpful at all 
figuring out where this came from. Dibstones. Maybe we'll find a thing about dibstones on the internet, and we'll put that in the show notes. Dibs. Um, I got dibs on having a podcast about the dictionary. I'm far enough into it, you can't take it from me. The next word, and the last of the D-I-B section, is... Dibutyl phthalate. Dibutyl phthalate. This is two words, and get ready for the spelling. D-I-B-U-T-Y-L is the first word, and the second word has two letters that aren't even pronounced. P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E. Yeah, it starts with a th 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 sound, but you don't say it. You just say phthalate, dibutyl phthalate. But I would like us to try to say dibutyl phthalate. Dibutyl phthalate. Noun from 1925. A colorless, oily ester C16H22O4 used chiefly as a solvent, plasticizer, pesticide, and repellent. And it is used for things called chiggers and mites. So I think, yeah, it's repelling little insecty things. And it's also used for solvents, plasticizers, and pesticides. Uh, that's a lot of uses, it seems like. Dibutyl phthalate. The next word. Dicalcium silicate. Dicalcium silicate. Two words. Uh, noun. From 1925... A calcium silicate, 2CaO dot SiO2. Uh, what would this be? Two of the calcium and oxygen total, and you multiply that by silica and then two oxygen. I'm, I'm just guessing at how this goes. But it is an essential ingredient in Portland cement. So if you want to make some Portland cement, you need to get some dicalcium silicate. And uh, maybe the silicate has come from the diatoms, which we talked about in the last episode. The next word. Wow, we have a lot of sciency words in this one and the last one. Dicamba. D-I-C-A-M-B-A. Noun from 1965. Dicamba. It is a systemic... A systemic herbicide, C8H6Cl2O3. That's the whole definition. It's a, a, a systemic herbicide. I don't really know what systemic means in this context. Um, let's see. They took the DI from dichlor. That's a prefix. Plus the CAM from cambaline. And then the BA from banline. Dichlorcambaline banline, D I C A M B A. And I guess baline or, or banline is two commercial preparations containing dicamba. Wait, I don't know what this, I don't know what this parenthesis, where it comes from. Anyway, it's dicamba, it's an herbicide. That's all you need to know. That's it. The next word, dicarboxylic dicarboxylic that's where the emphasis goes dicarboxylic adjective from circa 1890 containing two car- containing two carboxyl groups in the molecule as in dicarboxylic acids mm, there's two carboxyl groups so it looks like carbon and oxygen is in there and maybe some other stuff and two of those groups are in the molecule that make up an acid that we call dicarboxylic. The next word. All right, I think we are done with these uh, sciencey things, for, at least for the rest of this episode. Dicast is the next word, or just dicast, I guess you would, could say. D I C A S T. Noun from 1820, an ancient Athenian performing the functions of both judge and juror at a trial. 
an ancient, so it's one person, a die cast. Um, and they, they're both judge and jury. But is this thing, is this, is this something that still gets used? Do we sometimes call somebody a die cast? Why is it called die cast? It is because it is from the Greek dikazine, which means to judge. Also from, maybe they say dike, D-I-K-E, which means judgment. And there's more at the word diction, D-I-C-T-I-O-N, which will be in the episode airing on, uh, what is this, December 16th. One, two, three, four episodes from now. Uh, okay, so diecast isn't. Yeah, I think we need to put a link in the show notes for diecast about this ancient Athenian d- doing both judge and jury jobs. The next word, it's the last word. We got two forms. Dice, D I C E, first form, noun from the 14th century. 1A, we just have the number one definition for the word die, D-I-E, which will be both um, two episodes. Let's see, they're airing on December 17th and 18th. Yeah, Uh, because there's two forms, and they're both long, and they're being split up into the two episodes. So just the first definition, I would assume of the first form, it doesn't say which form this is from, 1A is number one definition for die. Number one B for dice. A gambling game played with dice. Let's play dice. How do you play dice? Is it like craps? Do you you say, I'm going to get a nine, and then you throw it and you don't and you lose your money. Number two, the plural. So the normal plural for dice is just dice. Because I think dice can also be the plural of just die. A single die is a die, and then two of them or more is dice. And then, but you can also have the plural of dice, which is dice, or for number two, the plural is dices. So number two is a small cubicle piece as of food. So if you cut up your food, maybe it's uh, veggies or something into little dice. If you dice it up, it's into little mostly cube shaped like a die uh, but if there's a whole bunch of these diced up food pieces you got dices number three a close contest between two racing car drivers for position during a race uh, interesting they call them dice two race car drivers who are who are battling for a position and they're really close. Uh, they're called dice. Hmm. I don't watch uh, car racing or really any sports, so I've never heard this, but I guess that's what that is. There is a phrase, no dice. No dice. And there's two definitions. Number one, of no avail or no use. And the synonym is futile. It's just not even worth it. It's not going to work. Don't bother with it. No dice. Number two, uh, this one is the number three definition for the first form of the word no. N-O, just no. As in, said no dice to my request. Yeah, that's basically just like, nope, ain't going to happen. Don't. Don't even think it's going to happen because it's not going to happen. You don't get no dice. No dice for you. I'm keeping the dice. Okay. The etymology says this is from the Middle English dice with a Y instead of an I, which is from D's, D-E-E-S, or or also just dice, which is the plural of D, D-E, which means die, and there's more at the word die. It's it's just the plural of dice of die. Dice is the plural of die. We have one more here today. It is the second form of dice verb from the 14th century, starting with transitive. Number one a, to cut into small cubes, as in diced onions. 
And then after you have diced the onions, you have dices of onions. And then maybe you can draw little dots on the different sides, and then you can play dice with them. Uh, 1B. To ornament with square markings, as in diced leather. So I guess in leather, if you're making a bunch of squares, when you're uh, decorating it, you're dicing it. 2A. To bring by playing dice, as in dice himself into debt. Hmm. This is a new one for me, to bring by playing dice. So I guess, um, okay, well, I mean, it makes sense that if you're playing dice, you it's a gambling game that you might lose a lot of money and then you go into debt and you got to pay off your debts. Um, so yeah, that basically they're just using the dice gambling game as a verb. If you're playing dice, you're, you're dicing yourself. Hmm. Specifically into debt. Or maybe you dice yourself into a fortune. To be is to lose by dicing. Similar idea here, as in dice her money away. Because she played too much dice and all her money went away. She diced herself into debt just like he did. Maybe they should join forces and uh, pay off their debt and not dice anymore. Here's intransitive number one, to play games with dice, as in dice for drinks in the bar. That is a quote from Malcolm Lowry. Dice for drinks in the bar. So what does that mean, to play games with dice? So are you playing a game, and then when you win the game, instead of gambling for money, are you playing for drinks? So maybe, hmm, that's an interesting way to get drinks at a bar. Maybe the bar says, okay, if you roll a snake eyes, uh, you get this drink for free. But if you roll this number, then you got to pay for your drink. Or maybe if you roll this number, you have to pay double. Or maybe if you roll this number, we pay you for the drink. Are there bars that do this? Is this a thing? Number two for the intransitive of dice it is to take a chance, as in, the temptation to dice with death. And that is a quote from Newsweek. Oh, it's, it's fun to take a chance with death, dice with death. I mean, yeah, that's still all about, it's a ch- game of chance, the dice game. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's weighted die and so people who are playing dice or craps that uh, they they have better chances of winning. I don't know. I don't. I have no played no dice, so I don't know how this stuff works. I wonder though if the die the die sides, uh, if they weigh different. Are there sides that you're more likely to hit than others? You'd think that there would be. I don't know the science of that. I think I've heard though that um, coins. The different sides are weighted slightly differently, so one side you are more likely to hit than the other side. Uh, Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I'm not interested in the gambling games, though, the games of chance. Mm, I'm more interested in games of skill, and uh, I don't even do those because I have no skills. But at least there, you know, it's on you if you're going to do good or do bad. Dicer. That is a noun. The one who is dicing the onions and playing the dice games. All right. Well, those were all of the words. They were diazo, diazonium, diazotize, diazotize, dibasic, dibber, dibble, dibble, dibenzofuran, dibs, dibutyl phthalate, dicalcium silicate, dicamba, dicarboxylic, dicarboxylic, dicast, dice, dice. Hmm, let's see. Let's see. I'm looking ahead a little bit just to get an idea of what I'm thinking. Um, I feel like I want to pick maybe just dibs. Dibs? Sure, why not? Let's pick dibs. Um, kind of specifically like, ooh, I got, I got dibs on that thing. I got claims. I got rights. I got dibs. 
I got dibs on that chair. You can't sit in my chair. I got dibs on that chair. I call the dibs. You can't sit in my chair. Oh, what? You sat on my chair? But I call dibs on that chair. You can't take my chair. I call dibs on it. That's my chair. I call dibs on that chair. That's a song. It's kind of... Uh, okay, I think I think that's going to be it. Oh, I will quickly say, uh, yesterday I finally saw Wakanda Forever in the theater, and it is oh so good, and you should go watch it. And uh, what else? Oh, I saw a bunch of movies. We saw um, we saw The Menu. That was great. I really like The Menu. There's a lot of layers. There's a lot of layers going on with The Menu. We got class systems. We got the service industry. We got food. We got, oh, yeah, there was a lot of, lot of things going on. It wasn't particularly creepy. There was some creepiness and some sort of suspense kind of things. Um, but personally, I thought it was more, more comedy than horror. But yeah, it was, a, it was a good blend. Some great characters and actors. And uh, yeah, I liked it. Uh, and then we rewatched Tusk. I'm, I probably mentioned this before. It's just a bonkers crazy movie. And because uh, our friend had never seen it. So we showed it to our friend. And yeah, good, fun, weird time with Kevin Smith and team. Okay. Okay. I think that's going to be the end of this episode. Yes, is it? Yes, it is. This has been Spencer dispensing information. Oh, wait, real quick. Uh, you may have already seen this, but if you go to social media, I made a little animation. Luckily, there's some uh, computery stuff that does a lot of work for me. But um, I posted, uh, at the time of recording, both. I think I posted both of the theme songs with a little animation. It's not crazy interesting, but there's some... The animation bounces around to the music specifically. And so now that I finally have this made, I, I may start to try and post some uh, maybe clips from shows... Um, you know, like recent shows, episodes, just, just a line, maybe like a five or 10 second thing. And, um, I don't know, uh, just so there's some sort of visual element and you can hear things. Maybe if you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to listen to this. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. That's all I wanted to say. This has been Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is the podcast where I, Spencer, am reading the words and the definitions and all the stuff that I can read in this book, The Dictionary. And then, uh, you know, I just talk about it and I give my comments and my thoughts and my opinions and stories and memories and explanations and, and singy songs and sound effects. And I'm sure that's exactly what you expected when you came to the podcast called The Dictionary. Um... If, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know who would like this show. I don't know what situations this might be good for. Uh, I had a thought to maybe, maybe, uh, would it be helpful to like elderly people? Maybe people who just want some entertainment, uh, want to be read to, uh, maybe people, maybe if there's like an Alzheimer's dementia, um, would, would it be helpful for people like that? I don't know. I'm just coming up with ideas. If you think that's a good idea. Put it in that situation. Let me know what happens. Maybe uh, maybe it's good for sleep. You just want to hear somebody read to you. I think uh, Liz, Liz, Liz said that was... I uh, Yeah, I think so. All right. The first word in this episode is dicentric. Dicentric. D-I-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. Adjective from 1937. Having... Two centromeres, having two centromeres as in a dicentric chromosome. Um, I know that chromosomes, I think, have telomeres, and I'm sure that we read centromeres a long, long time ago, but I don't remember what it said, but if a chromosome has two of them, it is dicentric. Dicentric is also a noun. Hmm. What would the noun be? What is... Is the chromosome, maybe the chromosome would be called a dicentric chromosome, a dicentric, that's the noun, and then the adjective would be, that chromosome is dicentric. Look at that dicentric chromosome, he's so silly. Okay, the sound effect is just going to be like a, like this. The next word is dicey, adjective 
from 1950. Oh, the cats are going crazy out there. Dicier and diciest are the other forms. I don't usually read those when it comes to the adjectives, um, but um, maybe I should. Maybe I should. I don't know. For some reason, dicier and diciest was just a little funny to me. Ooh, that situation. That is the diciest of situations. This one just has some synonyms which are risky and unpredictable, as in a dicey proposition. Ooh, don't don't go propose that proposition. It's you might get in trouble somehow. It's risky. Also, is in dicey weather. Dice the whole oh boy. Lots of places are getting some super dicey weather. The minute the the dicey side of things are just like oh it's warmer than it normally is it's rainier than it normally is it's drier than it normally is or we get to the dicier and diciest situations with weather and oh there's a category five hurricane coming through I hope I don't die the next word. <laughs> This is the prefix, and I think you pronounce it dyke. I think it's dyke or dyko, D-I-C-H or D-I-C-H-O. And this one means in two, in two, two, number two, T-W-O, or it also means apart. So if something is split in two, see, in two, then it has been split apart. As in the example, dichogamous. And I have to look ahead to make sure that I am pronouncing that correctly. Let's see. D-I-C-H-O. Um, is that going to be in here? That's, oh, here. Dichogamy is a word. Dichogamous, I think that is how you pronounce it. So we'll learn about that uh, about halfway through this episode. And, and then we'll learn how how is this prefix being used, into or apart. We know that the di prefix pretty much means two, so uh, that's that's how the connection, just for the prefix part. The next word, <laughs> dicasium, dicasium, or just dicasium, d i c h a s i u m, noun from eighteen seventy five. This one is a cymos inflorescence that produces two main axes. And a cymos inflorescence, I feel like this is plant-related maybe, or maybe cell-related, something with cells that are inflorescence. Does that mean they glow? Not sure. Uh, they're two main axes, so maybe it splits in two, ooh, maybe. Uh, the etymology says, this is from the Greek, dikasis, which means having, and this is having spelled H-A-L-V-I-N-G, which is all about cutting a thing in two, into two halves. Some people would say halving with the L sound. Um, that the, the dikasis word is also from dikazin, which means to have, to, to split in two, to have. Um, so yeah, something, this, this uh, cymos inflorescence has been split into two main axes. So it is dicasium. The next word. <laughs> this is another prefix, dichlor or dichloro, and it means containing two atoms of chlorine. You got two chlorines, your dichlor, as in the example, dichloroethane. Dichloroethane, and yeah, we're going to see some fun dichloro words coming up here. Uh, two chlorines, that's dichloro. The next word. <laughs> Di Here's the first of these fun dichloro words. Dichlorobenzene. Dichlorobenzene, noun from 1873, any of three isomeric compounds, C6H4Cl2, and there's the uh, the two chlorines at the end there, the Cl2, but especially we have the synonym paradichlorobenzene, 
paradichlorobenzene. And uh, so it's any of three isomeric compounds that are that chemical system of symbols and numbers. Um, that's just dichlorobenzene. And I don't know how the para prefix changes it for para dichlorobenzene. Is, is that mean that there's two of them? Is there a pair of them? I don't think it's that simple, but it's, it's something. The next word. <whistles> Dichloro... This is the fun word. Dichlorodifluoromethane. Dichloro... Yeah, there's a dichlorodifluoromethane. Dichlorodifluoromethane. Oy, oy, oy. Hard words to say. Noun from 1936. A chlorofluoromethane. Oh, I don't think this is as hard to say as I think it is. Dichlorodifluoromethane. So th- it is a chlorofluoromethane, C, Cl2, F2. And that's all that it is. That's just that. But I guess that that means that there's two of those things, maybe, because that's where the dye part comes from. Hmm. Something like that. Dichlorodifluoromethane. F F must be fluorine. Fluorine, fluor, something like that. And there's two of those, because that's the difluoro in the middle. And then the dichloro at the beginning means two chlorines. And it's a methane. Okay, the next word. Dichloroethane. This is a little simpler. Dichloroethane. This is the one that was the example in the dichloro prefix definition. So a dichloroethane is a noun from also 1936. This is a colorless toxic liquid compound, C2H4Cl2, that is used chiefly as a solvent. I don't know what sort of solvent, how is this solvent used? What's a solvent? Let's just start with that. The next word. (whistles) Dichlorvas or dichlorvis. D-I-C-H-L-O-R-V-O-S. So it's still using the dichlor prefix, but... I, for some reason, we're not using the O at the end of it. Dichlorvas. Noun from 1957. An organophosphorus insecticide and anthelmintic C4H7Cl2 minus? Is that a minus sign? O4P. And it is used especially in veterinary medicine. And it is called also DDVP. So it's an insecticide. So it's going to help get rid of the insects. Maybe if, um, if an animal has gotten some sort of insect infestation or something, then they use this DDVP, dichlorvas. And then what is this other word? Anthelmintic. I have no idea what that is. Anthelmintic. Um... The etymology says this is from dichlor, of course, plus the V from vinyl, like like what your records are made of, vinyl, and then the OS from phosphate. Phosphate. That's, uh, that's what they decided to go with for dichlorvas. The next word. <whistles> Dichogamy. Hmm, D-I-C-H-O-G-A-M-Y. Noun from 1862. The production of male and female reproductive elements at different times by a hermaphroditic organism in order to ensure cross-fertilization. And dichogamous, with an O-U-S, is an adjective, and I believe that was, yes, that was the example that we had for the dyke or dyko uh, prefix. Dichogamous is how you would pronounce that. So, there was a lot going on in that definition. Um, Hermaphroditic. Now, 
this this is a word that has gotten used a lot for not only plants and animals, but humans, which are also animals. Um, I don't think this is really a word that we use for humans anymore. And um, But I think maybe for plants, it's still scientifically correct, I guess. Um, but yeah, basically... Uh, has both male and female reproductive elements or organ organs, whatever word you want to use there. Um, and uh, because then I guess, I guess what it's saying is that if this is a plant, that it can cross fertilize maybe by itself, that that it's like, oh, well, I, I gotta I gotta have both of the parts. So if uh, if my species goes away, that I can recreate my species. I don't think that's quite a thought that they have, but yeah. So um, that's dichogamy, and of course we will learn more about the word hermaphrodite, hermaphroditic when we get into the H's, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot more information, especially for plants. I think it's mostly for plants, maybe. Uh, that's of course not to say that uh, humans, there are many humans that are born with both male and female parts, uh, quote unquote parts, and uh, you know that's a whole thing from a from a biological and gender perspective. It's a, it's a whole big conversation. Okay, I think that is good for that one. Let's move on to dichondra, d i c h o n d r a. I think that would be kind of a cool name. For somebody, dichondra, but I don't know what the definition is, so you know, you gotta listen to it to see if if you want to name somebody this. It is a noun from 1947, any of a genus of chiefly tropical perennial herbs of the morning glory family that includes some used as a ground cover and a substitute for lawn grasses in warmer parts of the US. Oh, yeah, that was a long sentence. Um, let's see, the genus name is also Dichondra, and it says that some of these, these are the ones that are used as a ground cover in the U.S., um, examples of these would be Dichondra repens, that's one of the species names, or its varieties, so varieties of Dichondra repens are often used as a ground cover and a substitute for lawn grasses in warmer parts of the U.S., um, this is from the prefix di, which means two, and then also the Greek word chondros, chondros, which means grain, and there's more at the word grind, so maybe it is a kind of grain or looks like a kind of grain. Um, it's chiefly tropical perennial herbs from the morning glory. I don't know how grains and morning glories are related at all, um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a dichondra. The next word, dichotic, dichotic, D-I-C-H-O-T-I-C, adjective from circa 1911, relating to or involving the presentation of a stimulus to one ear that differs in some respect from a stimulus presented to the other ear. Whoa, what's going on here? So examples of the um, the stimulus to one ear could be pitch, loudness, frequency, or energy. Presentation of a stimulus to one ear that differs in some respect. Ah, that's the, that's the way that it differs, yeah. So that means that you could be hearing one pitch in one ear and another pitch in another ear. Maybe one ear is listening to something at a certain loudness level, and then the other one is listening to something that's quieter or louder. Uh, frequency. Now, I would think that's the same as pitch. Mm, maybe maybe it's a more of a rhythmic thing. Maybe it's the rhythm. So one ear is hearing ba, 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 but then the other hear, ear is hearing ba, 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 ba. And then energy is the other one. And I'm not sure how that would be described. Is it, it's just all the things at once. I don't know. So the example was dichotic listening. So is this maybe like a scientific experiment that they, if they want to test your hearing, 
they will play different things in your ears and so you, you they wanted to, to see if you can decipher one or the other or to see if you can even tell that there's different things going on i'm sure there's lots of possibilities um or or is this something else uh i i definitely got to put a link in the show notes and i kind of feel like i want to i want to put in an audio example um not sure what it'll be exactly, but uh, something simple probably. And uh, you know, I'll put I'll put one thing on the left ear, left speaker, and I'll put another thing on the right ear or the right speaker, the right headphone, whatever it is that you're listening to this on. But here's the thing: first of all, you have to make sure that you're listening to this in stereo, and not mono, but stereo. Um, and so, if you are like me and you listen to your uh, maybe your AirPods in just mono, uh, just one at a time, so you have it set to mono, then you got to change that and set it to stereo. If you know how to change it to mono, you can figure out how to change it back to stereo. Put in both your headphones, put some speakers next to you, and let's just, it, it, it'll be better with headphones, I think. And, uh, you know, just, you can, you can try it out. Let's put the example in right here. That was fantastic dichotically dichotically that is an adverb hmm, yeah not a whole lot so go to the show notes if you want to click on a link to, to go learn more about dichotic things the next word <whistles> dichotomist dichotomist or just dichotomist d-i-c-h-o-t-o-m-i-s-t Noun from circa 1592, and this is one that dichotomizes. And what is dichotomize? <whistles> dichotomize is a verb from 1606. We are starting with transitive. To divide into two parts, classes, or groups. Not three parts, classes, or groups, or four parts, classes, or groups. It has to be two, because that is what the prefix die means uh dichotomize is yeah it's just splitting things up so somebody who is a dichotomist is the one who will be dividing things into parts classes or groups intransitive for dichotomize says to exhibit dichotomy dichotomization is a noun to exhibit dichotomy, we are going to learn about, actually, I think we're going to learn about dichotomy at the end of this episode for a couple of reasons. The first one is just that, um, well, it's related to the these couple of words that we're reading here, so I think it's good to keep it all together. Um, also, there's a bunch of information there for it. There's a lot. And I was going to have it into the next episode, but I am hoping we are planning we are currently scheduling to have a guest on that episode. And to be perfectly honest, um, I just think it's a little bit too much to, to chat about. We, we can get a bit chatty, so I'm trying to minimize that. Um, it's going to be a long episode anyway. So if we put dichotomy into this episode, I think that'll just make a whole lot more sense all over the place. Okay, so we'll learn about that soon. The next word dichotomous dichotomous uh this one is um oh it ends in m-o-u-s that's what i wanted to say it is an adjective from 1752 one dividing into two parts you can see a pattern here dichotomize dichotomous it's all the same idea number two relating to, involving, or proceeding from dichotomy. It's just related to dichotomy. What's a dichotomy? Hey, you know what I said. We'll find out soon. Dichotomously is an adverb. Dichotomousness is a noun. And this is from the Greek 
prefix dyke, D-I-C-H, and the word temnine, which means to cut. And I feel like we saw that recently within, was it, uh, I'm looking back at the D-I-A-T section, I think, yeah, temnine here, diatom, temnine to cut, yeah. So yeah, cutting, cutting into pieces. Uh, and there's more at the word tome, T-O-M-E, which again, I think we saw that with di- diatom, and that same, same kind of thing over there. Uh, okay, next word. <whistles> Dichotomous key. Two words, and it's like the key that you stick in the door to unlock the lock, the key with the bumpy things. You know that key. Hello, key. Noun from circa 1889, a key for the identification of organisms based on a series of choices between alternative characters. Hmm. Okay. Let's let's break this down a second. So it's a, it's a thing. So it's not the literal key that you put in the door. This is more of a the the. Hmm. I don't know if I'm going to be able to describe this well. A key for the identification of organisms based on a series of choices between alternative characters. I don't know exactly what we're talking about here. It could be something about uh, animals, plants, things like that, that get divided into the genus, the family, the kingdom, all those things. Or is this literally something about characters in a story? I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we got to put a link in the show notes for this one too. Hmm. <laughs> I, I have an idea in my head, but I just don't know if I have the verbiage to to describe this exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm going to... I sound like an idiot anyway. I don't need to sound like an extra idiot. All right, we have one more word for this episode. <laughs> Dichotomy. D-I-C-H-O-T-O-M-Y. Noun from 1610. One, a division into two especially mutually exclusive or contradictory groups or entities, as in the dichotomy between theory and practice. There's a, there's a connection between them, but they are also separate, right? A division into two, that's the number two, uh, mutually exclusive groups, um, they, they, hmm, how do we describe that? Mutually exclusive. Does that mean that they're separate, but there's a, there, they, there's a connection there? Hmm. Or contradictory groups, things that seem like they, they wouldn't, uh, that, that they're opposites, right? So, so up and down, um, those would be two contradictory groups or entities, um, but there's the, there's the dichotomy between up and down, or theory and practice, and maybe we need to read more. Oh, oh, hey, oh, hello, there's an also section. The process or practice of making such a division. That is also the dichotomy, as in dichotomy of the population into two opposed classes. Yeah, it's all about just how things, they're they're different and separate, um, and they have the 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 I guess the connection between them would be the dichotomy or just the idea of them being separate and being different is the dichotomy and you can talk about how they're different you can compare and contrast them whatever these things are that's the dichotomy but we have more definitions so let's not jump ahead to 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 other things number two the phase of the moon or an inferior planet in which half of its disk appears illuminated. So I guess this is just the part of the moon. Let's specifically talk about the moon here. The time of the moon where the sun is, it's kind of like the sun and the moon and the earth are kind of making like a right angle. And so if you look up at the moon and you look far maybe to the left or the right, that's where the sun is. And so it's only lighting up one half to from our viewpoint, only one half of the moon. And uh, it's, we call it a half moon. That's what we call it, I think. And, um, and that it is, that's the dichotomy of the moon because it has the, the two parts of it are kind of opposite. One's lit up and one is not. 3A, 
The synonym is bifurcation, but especially repeated bifurcation as of a plant's stem. If a plant stem gets split in two, it's being bifurcated. And maybe if you do that over and over again, that's the dichotomy. Um, yeah, bifurcation is just splitting a thing in two. Some people, I maybe have mentioned this, maybe when we had the word bifurcation, uh, some people have surgically split their tongue in two because your tongue, I think, is technically made up of two muscles, the left side and the right side. And so when you bifurcate it, you can sort of have two two tongues that uh, they're still connected in the back, but it can it's very weird and creepy, and I kind of like it. 3B for dichotomy. A system of branching in which the main axis forks repeatedly into two branches. So if you look at, um, say, a tree, the maybe the, the main trunk of the tree, maybe it creates two branches, right? One to the left and one to the right, or whatever direction they're going in, respective to where you are. And then each of those splits again into two, and then those split into two. And so that's, that's the dichotomy. It's all about splitting into two. 3C is branching of an ancestral line into two equal diverging branches. Hmm. I mean, isn't that what your ancestral lines do? Or if you go back, how, how are we thinking about this one? Branching of an ancestral line into two equal diverging branches. I mean, everybody comes from two parents, pretty much, mostly. At least humans, by and large, do. Um, and so when you look back at your ancestral line, it should be splitting evenly between two, at least on a biological standpoint. Number four. This is the last one. Something with seemingly contradictory qualities, as in, it's a dichotomy, this opulent Ritz-style luxury in a place that fronts on a boat harbor. That's a quote from Gene T. Barrett or Jean T. Barrett. It's a dichotomy, this opulent Ritz-style luxury in a place that fronts on a boat harbor. So we don't typically think of a boat harbor and Ritz-style luxury in the same idea. So there's a dichotomy there. There, That's kind of like the number one definition, two opposites kind of coming together, and it's uh, that's what that is. All right. That, that was all the things, all the words in this episode. It was a long one, but you, you powered through. We had dicentric, dicey, dyke or dico, dicasium, dichlor or dichloro, dichlorobenzene, dichlorodifluoromethane. Just love that word. Dichloroethane, dichlorvos or dichlorvas, dichogamy. Dichondra, dichotic, dichotomist, dichotomize, dichotomous, dichotomous key, and dichotomy. Who? That was fun, fun way to say those words at the end. They sort of rhymed. Dichotomous, dichotomous key, dichotomy. Oh, I'm having a hard time. I gotta pick either dichotomy or dichotic because I like the the audio side of things on that. Um, also, or just dichloro, dichloromethane, because it's a fun word to say. I think dichotomy probably makes the most sense. Um, and to an extent, it kind of encompasses a lot of these other words, uh, because they're about two, when things splitting into two, and, th- you know, that whole idea. So let's pick dichotomy as the word of the episode. I think we all live in a dichotomy. We show one side of our personality. Ah, I don't really like this song, but you see where I'm going. Let's see if we can try something else. We are a dichotomy. We got two parts to us. I don't know where I'm trying to go with this. It's just, I was just thinking about the idea of, you know, we we have, we are often... We are often um, being maybe pulled in two directions or two have two sides to our personality. Yeah, I don't know. And I couldn't put it into song form. I couldn't come up with the r- words quick enough. It's hard enough to come up with the words anyway. 
don't I, I can't be the only one who feels like you've got two sides. Happy, sad, positive, negative, good, evil, all those things. We are a dichotomy. We can stick with just these words. We are a dichotomy. Yeah. That is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information, information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary uh you know every once in a while we have a very special episode all of the special episodes are uh they have guests on them and today is no exception we have yet again for the second time and there may even be a third time coming up soon we have the amazing karen o'leary karen what's going on with you these days thank you it's been so well look what's not going on with me i'm um just loving life in New Zealand, and I have been doing a variety of very, very random jobs, um, and I'm hopefully moving into my 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 childhood dream job um, was always to be a sports presenter slash commentator, and I've managed to kind of weasel my way into maybe getting the chance to do that some of the time. So I just I continue just to say yes to everything, and then find out if I'm actually any good at it or not. And it seems to be but, working so far. <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, what sport might this be? Well, cricket is my number one sport, which I know if you've got lots of American um, listeners, they'll be like, yeah, we love cricket. It's also one of our national games. Or they'll be like, what is that game? And it's so boring. Um, so cricket's my number one. Football as well. And obviously I was very excited when the um, the Black Ferns, the women's rugby team, uh, we recently won the, the World Cup. So, yeah, and we've got the FIFA Women's um, World Cup, Football World Cup coming to New Zealand next July. Ooh. So I'm very excited about all of these sporting events. That's going to be a lot of fun. Are you planning on going to as many events as possible? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. The way I see it is if I can get, keep weaseling my way into getting a job, then I don't have to pay for tickets, do I? Exactly. You, know? you just go be a sports commentator for all the games, yeah. and it's yeah. perfect. I, well, you know, just like a ro- one of those people that robes around the crowd with the microphones, and you just get to talk shit, have a laugh, and but still get a free ticket. So that's that's my. I'm going to putting that into the cosmos so that it happens. I'm going to put it out there, too. That is the perfect job for you. I, I really hope that you get to do that. Let's do some tweeting. Yeah, I'll keep you posted, but I reckon it's going to happen. Awesome. Um, any other fun projects that you're working on? Uh, yes, I'm uh, very much looking forward to a show that's going to be on New Zealand Terrestrial Real t- Television tonight, um, which was a tribute to two of our national treasures, our real icons, who are called the Top Twins. So they're these two lesbian twin sisters who are really amazing country singers but also very political very they've been activists you know i remember growing up you know in the 80s they were really prolific and it was amazing just in the 80s to have these two lesbian women completely accepted and loved by a lot of small town new zealand we normally think they won't understand it and they probably won't like it so we did an amazing tribute for them because they're both actually unfortunately sick with cancer at the moment so we did a, a really fantastic show at the Civic in Auckland. We had all of these fantastic musicians performing and it was just a really special, it was a magical experience. So I'm looking forward to watching that on the telly tonight. That's fantastic. I don't think I will be able to watch it because I am in the US of A. You you do that thing where you steal the TV off the country. Everyone knows how to do that, don't they? Spencer, I'd imagine you You'd think I was smart enough to do that, but I definitely am not. It's called VPNs, isn't it? VPNs. That's the... Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, I don't know how to use it. Oh, well, that's, my, that's what my partner does, and she's in the state. She watches it, all the things of New Zealand. Yeah, but um, yeah, so I'm just doing random stuff, a bit of acting, which is hilarious, and just anything, really. Yeah. And um, on um, podcasts, like this one. It, uh, how many podcasts have you? do you do a week? Oh, not enough. Um, I've been, I've been on a, a movie one, and then I've actually this is another thing. I've actually got my own podcast coming out because I got asked, approached by MediaWorks to make my own podcast, and it's got to be called Full Disclosure, and it's about well-known New Zealanders and their stories of coming out and being gay or bisexual in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I've, I've talked to lots of very interesting people, and hopefully, uh, at least three people listen to it. It's good. <laughs> so it's already out or is it coming out soon oh, yeah. january 16th january 16th we're going to put it on the calendar we're going to post about that um and yeah. i have to imagine that you have no shortage of guests for that show no, well no there's heaps of gays in new zealand no no yeah. it was just yeah but i guess it's one of those things still in 2022 
not everyone feels comfortable talking about that. And I don't think there's yeah. enough opportunity for people just to hear other people's stories so you can know, like if you're finding things tricky or if you found things really positive, all of those ways of um, experiencing coming out as gay or bisexual can, you know, it, it, they're all appropriate. They can they, they can happen to anyone. So, yeah, I've spoken, we spoke to our, my um, our Deputy Prime Minister, Grant Robertson, who's Jacinda's right-hand man. We spoke to him at the Beehive. That was really cool. And, yeah, a variety of other funny people. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, and yeah, you're you're an amazing person to host something like that between obviously your knowledge of New Zealand and the gay community, but also just you you're just funny and entertaining. And, you know, th- that's that's a huge, huge part of shows and podcasts and things. So, you know, that's going to be a success for sure. Cross. I tried to be very serious for the whole time. No, I wasn't. I can't. Do this. <laughs> I was going to say that's not possible for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, right. Well, speak. Speaking of being serious, should we talk about some very serious words today? I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. All right. Um, You know, a handful of these um, are a little bit over my head. We'll we'll see what we have to say. If we don't have a lot to say, that's totally fine, and we're just going to move on. There is one particular word um, that uh, I have a feeling Karen may have a few things to say about. Um, And so, you know, when we get there, we'll talk about that. Yes, yeah, and hopefully everyone will know what word that is. I think it'll be pretty obvious, though. It, it, yeah, I think so. Okay, um, if you have not heard uh, Karen's previous episode on this show, um, I will I will put a link to it. Um, it's uh, it's at the end of the C section, the C mm-hmm. season, the third season of this show, uh, and it was a, an amazing time. Okay, the first word in this episode is dichotomy, D I C H O T O M Y. This is a noun from 1610. We have a number of definitions. Number one, a division into two especially mutually exclusive or contradictory groups or entities, as in the the dichotomy between theory and practice. And then also, there's more to the definition, the process or practice of making such a division, as in dichotomy of the population into two opposed classes. Mm. That I think there's a lot that we can say. We do have other definitions. Do you have anything to say in the meantime about dichotomy? Well, yes, I was thinking about the word dichotomy. Um, obviously, prior to this, I do a lot of research. Um, actually, I just looked up the words about 20 minutes before now to make sure I kind of knew what they meant. Um, but I think dichotomy is, is almost as, the, as its definition suggests, it can be quite, um, it can really make people feel quite oppositional and separate and, and or excluded. So dichotomies are very interesting things, especially if I think about, you know, things like gender, gender dichotomy um, and what that represents. And also it's such a black and white kind of concept. And I think in this current day and age, we need a lot more space for grey. What do you think? Yeah, no, I 100%, 100% agree. Uh, you know, throughout my life, I've seen these things that we've got, we've got two sides, like you mentioned, gender and, you know, autism, for instance. I mean, that's very specifically called the autism spectrum. Uh, so many different things that, that nothing, nothing is black and white. Nothing is one side or the other, black and white, good and evil, any of the positive, negative. There's always a gray zone. So yeah, the word dichotomy in general is a little bit hard in those contexts, I think. Um, but you know, if there are very literally two things, then I guess that's, you know, two things that are opposite from each other. Well, so we just need to think of a good example of when dichotomy is an appropriate word to use. That's our job now, Spencer. What's that going to be? That's our job. Well, I don't know. Maybe we should read the other definitions and then maybe something will pop in our I heads for a good right. example. I feel that's going to happen for sure. For sure. Number two, the phase of the moon or an inferior planet in which half of its disk appears illuminated. So I guess the dichotomy of the moon is one half is lit and the other half is not lit. But even technically there, you know, there's there's still there's still little sort of gray zones and the craters yes, and other no, things. It's not like a clear line, is it? So again, no, we're not no. using the moon one. That's out. Let's try, keep trying. <laughs> Number three A, this synonym is bifurcation, especially repeated bifurcation as of a plant's stem. So it's splitting a plant stem into two. That seems like that, yeah. I'll accept it. Yeah. 3B, a system of branching 
so this is still related to plants, I think, a system of branching which the main axis forks repeatedly into two branches. So the plant stem goes up, it splits into two, and each one of those splits into two. Okay. And then again, does it keep, just keep going? I think it goes for a while, yeah. It probably depends on the plant. I don't know. Is this purposeful bifurcation? What was that word you said? <laughs> uh, bifurcation. I was, I was close with bifurcation. Um, Super close. This, this happens naturally in plants or that or people make it happen on purpose? I think this is a naturally occurring thing. A system of branching. Yeah, I think it's a naturally okay. occurring thing. Okay, I'm getting on any, top. Any plants, any of those plants next to you? Uh, I'm just having are a think split of in two. Plants. No, they're all just kind of just growing beautifully and healthily in my house. They are very green. I love it. Thank you. Uh, if if you uh, other if you listeners want to see what's going on with the, the plants that we're talking about, you can join the Patreon where you can uh, you can see what's you can see the video of this show. And not only can you see the green plants, you can also see my face. And that's I mean, I yeah. I, I guess that's I'm important too. Sold my plants instead of me, though, Spencer. This is outrageous. Hey, you, you know the, the the plant lovers. That's what they want to stare at all the time. Three well, C. Yep. <laughs> uh, branching of an ancestral line into two equal diverging branches. Um, and so I guess, you know, it could be about plants, it could be about humans, it could be about anything, but you know, if you look back at your ancestors, you always come mm -hmm. from two, and then each of them come from two, and each of them come from two, by and large. Yeah, true, but it, it, even that, even now that's becoming, you know, obviously, if I think of my son, he's got yeah. me, who is, his, and, well, but I'm not biologically connected to him, but he's still, I'm still his parent. And then he's got his other mum, Jen, who's now married to a man, so she's got, he's there as well. And then I've got my partner. So he's got, he's got multiple branch offs, you know? And, you know, b better for him, right? More, more interesting people to create who he is as an amazing person. Yeah, except most of them are assholes. No, just <laughs> <laughs> you being the number one asshole, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, number four, the last one for dichotomy. This is something with seemingly contradictory qualities, as in the example, which is a quote, it's a dichotomy, this opulent Ritz-style luxury in a place that fronts on a boat harbor. And I'm feeling like I recorded this already, but um, I don't think I did. I don't know. Maybe I've, maybe I've seen this example a couple of times. That is a quote from Gene T. Barrett. The dichotomy of living the luxurious life opposed to, you know, on a boat harbor. That doesn't really feel luxurious. Uh, so that's that's an example of a dichotomy, I guess. I guess it would depend on what kind of harbor you're living in. Very true. You know, Very like, true. I, feel like, I feel like harbor people with yachts and then I think they're all rich as. But are we yeah. talking about like your sort of run-of-the-mill boat people who aren't um, lucky at all? Sure, I think I think that's the idea. Yeah. 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 Well, I still think again there could be a better example, and we will come up with one one day. Yeah, I was just gonna say, did you think of anything? I haven't. I mean, I think you know there was the example of class, the dichotomy of class earlier, um, which I guess you know rich and poor. That's a big dichotomy, but very clearly there's a lot of steps in between yeah. rich and poor. Yeah, I guess um, I was thinking, what about is there? Even because even if you think about politically, people that are complete in America, Republicans compared to Democrats, like they fundamentally, if you're especially if you're at the very ends of those, you would be fundamentally opposed. Surely, where you'd want to be. Yeah. But then again, there's still always there's that bit of that movement in the middle, so it's a tricky one. Right, and also even if you took two people who thought that they were completely opposed to each other, you might be able to find something that maybe they agree on. So even that is a little a little hard. Yeah, so we're just basically canceling the word dichotomy. Unless you're talking about my plants or um yeah, or maybe the moon yeah. push at a push. The moon I think might be the closest thing. Um yeah. the the dichotomy, it's a very wishy washy word. The etymology isn't helpful, but it's all about, you know, splitting a thing in two, basically. Or just two things. Um, I don't know if you remember, we do a sound effect here on the show when we're done with a word. What what sound effect would you like to do today? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna strum a quick chord on my guitar. How about that? I, I would love that. it. Please. I'll just quickly go my guitar then in that case. 
She's getting the guitar. Now, what kind of um, chord are we thinking will be appropriate? Like, I've got it could be a minor chord, it could be a happy positive major chord. I mean, what do we think? How many of? chords do you know? Ah, oh, all of them. The ones that are easy. <laughs> I feel like it can just be a chord change. It can just be like something like this, like that. That That's was power. perfect. And what I would request is maybe after each word, you do a different chord. But what you did was, I loved it. I'll do a different combination each time. Excellent. The sound effect has already been done. This is um, one of the best sound effects I think we've had because it's from an actual instrument. Mm -hmm. The next word is dichroic. It is an adjective from circa 1859, number one, having the property of dichroism which we will talk about shortly, as in the example, a dichroic crystal or a dichroic mirror. And then number two, the synonym is dichromatic, which we will also get to soon. But basically, this is from the Greek dichrous, which means two colored, uh, from di plus kros, which means color or literally skin. So skin or color and having two of those. So that's what dichroic is. Um, your arm is kind of dichroic because you have not only your own skin pigment, but you have a changed skin pigment, and so do I. Well, look, there we go. It's black, and then whatever skin color is doesn't really have a color, does it? It's kind of just skin color. It's just skin, you know. Yeah. I'm assuming you call it white, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, and all skin tones are in like an orange, orange uh, region, so... Yeah. But so but with this, we're talking crystals, right? Um, well, that's one of the examples, yeah. Well, I, so that's why I'm talking about them, because I've remembered that from the example. Um, so it's like a crystal that is actually two colors or just looks like it's two colors because of with how the light refracts off it. This is what I need to know. You know, I wish I could give you a, a fully a full answer. Mm -hmm. um, I am not entirely sure. We may have to read these other words coming up to get a little bit more information um, but I think, at the very least, it looks like there's two colors. Maybe it literally has two colors. Okay, great. So, again, a very vague answer. And yeah. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Th that's what we're going for here, just vague. I think as well, um, as when you ask these questions, then you know there'll be some people listening that are screaming, knowing exactly what the answer is. And I want those people to feel empowered about their knowledge. Yeah. All the time I think about there's somebody who knows the answer and they're very pissed at me or or even better, I am I describe something wrong and I know that they're yelling at me and then later I realize, oh, I had that wrong. I had that recently. I was like, oh, no, what I said was completely wrong. So yeah. uh, I put in the show notes, oh, I screwed up. Please forgive me. I'm only human. Well, look, every day is a school day. We're always learning, you know? Every day, every day until the day I die, I'm going to learn. That yeah. guitar... We need that guitar again because we need a strummy strum. Okay. Yeah. And don't feel like you have to keep it on your, your leg the whole time. Well, no, you just call guitar and I'll get the guitar back up. It's, it's very Perfect. easy. It's very maneuverable. The next word is dichroism. Dichroism. So what we had in the previous word, dichroic, was having the property of dichroism this word, dichroism, is a noun from 1819, and it is, oh, here we go, the property of some crystals mm. and solutions of absorbing one of two plain polarized components of transmitted light more strongly than the other. Also, the property of exhibiting different colors by reflected or transmitted light, and it says compared to circular dichroism. So was so that uh, clear? I, think, I, well, I just think I feel like either I read that because that's why I asked that question, but I don't. I don't think I did read all of these words. Um, but it makes it seem like I asked a very intelligent question. You did. That's, so because because you're a smart, smart lady. Well, yeah, I'm just uh, going through the guessing stuff. Yeah, but I mean, I, obviously, I, when I heard um, you say, "What is it? Dichroism." This yeah, this word is dichroism. Right. The previous word, the adjective, was dichroic. Yeah, because I just, I really wanted it to be more about dykes and lesbians. Like, I think that, you know, then I would have had probably even more to say. Um, dichroism, like, it's like a really heroic lesbian. That would be good. 
Oh yeah, I think that should be the new uh, a new graphic novel. Um, okay, sit so with me. I'll, I'll go do it. I can't draw, but let, I can write. <laughs> yeah, let let's do some pre planning. Would you like to be on the episode for? Um, I believe it is in here. Is it is it D Y K E? Yeah, it should be. Yes, 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 yes. Let's if you want, let's pencil you in for the episode that airs on June second, twenty twenty three. We I can talk about the word dyke. An expert, and I. I would consider myself to be one. That's why you're here, because you're an expert yeah. on things. I'm, I'm an expert on dichotomism di- 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 as well. <laughs> In dichotomy. I still don't completely understand the, the crystal thing, but it definitely did say that it, there was about uh, exhibiting different colors by reflected or transmitted light. So it's not maybe literally the two colors, but it's showing two colors yeah. or multiple like, colors. Yeah. Or even if you think of those, you know, those dingly dangly clear crystals that you get and you hang in the window and then you get yeah. all the rainbow colors because of yeah the sun. yeah yeah where the so light have... comes in and it diffracts all over the place too, so that can't be dichroism because it's more than it's multiple colors so that's got a whole another definition and again someone hopefully at home is screaming out it's called this when you've got one of those crystals and we yeah. want to say thank you to that person thank you you know who you are you're listening you're a smarty <laughs> pants yeah uh guitar Oh, I thought that's not a D word. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a um, more sad one. Yeah, that I, I shed a tear on that guy. Uh, yeah. The next word is dichromat or dichromat. Uh, this is a noun from circa 1909. It is one affected with dichromatism or dichromatism uh which we haven't gotten to yet but it's anything that has dichromatism is a dichromat and that's it for that well i think obviously we need to know about dichromism yep that's totally the word dichromatism uh we do have a couple until we get to that word but we do need another guitar sound we do and here it comes now here it comes. And um, all of your lovely guitar playing is reminding me that I need to tell the people that you have a uh, a family-friendly kids band called Fun and Funner. I do indeed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, Fun and Funner. We're um, a, a band uh, with me and my best friend, Tom Watson, who both used to be early childhood teachers for a very long time. He still is. And basically, we listened to a lot of music for children, and it was so boring that it made you kind of want to poke your eye out with a compass. So we thought, no, enough. We don't want to listen to this anymore. And we don't think children should have to either. So we made an album of songs that, you know, go across a range of genres and um, hopefully just mean that adults can actually listen to it without wanting to, um, you know, to die. So, yeah, that, that's our plan. And we've actually recently played with the, um, the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra and the Orchestra Wellington, full orchestra, did our whole album and we had to play it in the Michael Fowler Centre with a full orchestra. It's like ridiculous. You know, like proper musicians get asked to do that. Not Karen O'Leary, but Karen O'Leary. <laughs> she was there singing along with the orchestra. Happy days. Uh, though, though I think that um, I saw the, a couple of clips of that, right? You were yes. on stage with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was amazing. Um, if you right. have any other uh, links or something, you probably tweeted about it, right? I'll have to share that. Yeah, I'll, I can send just the stuff here. But we would actually just, I'm going over to see Tom today and we're thinking quickly in the last minute putting out a Christmas album called We Wish You a Smelly Christmas. And it'll just be Christmas Do it, songs please. all about smelliness and poo, basically. And that's, that's our go-to jam. Uh, shout out to my favorite song of your album, um, which is called yeah. Better Than Normal, Poo in the Fadapaku. Is that the Fadipaku. correct pronunciation? Yeah, Fadapaku is the Maori word for toilet, yep. Yeah. That's right. Poo this is, this is in the fire Paku. You got a poo in the fire Paku. Yeah, don't do a poo on your mum. It's like it's very, it's a learning song, but it's also a little bit hopefully funny. It, it's it's wonderful, and you know the tune is simple, simple enough, but like so so catchy at the same time. I don't know how you did it, but it's you nailed it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well there you go. People can listen to that after where they've listened to us talk about the D words that we're talking about. And uh, people can go to funandfunner.bandcamp.com. Yes, they can. Uh, okay, so you did the sound effect for that. So our next word is dichromate, 
So we've added an E at the end. This is a noun from circa 1864. This is a chemically thing. It is a usually orange to red chromium salt containing the anion Cr2O7. And then there is a superscript tiny little two with a minus symbol. And I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, there is an example, dichromate of potassium, and it is called also bichromate with a B instead of a D. And, I, you know, it's orange to red chromium salt. I mean, look, I mean, obviously it makes complete sense to me, all of what you just said. Um, and yeah. I think the definition kind of says enough. I don't think I, could, I need to add. Obviously, I could add lots about what that means, but I don't think I'm going to. Yeah, I, you you clearly could, but I think yeah, what like you like you said, what what's here is plenty for us, uh, for our brains. Guitar time. Every single one of these could be the beginning of a new song. Yes. <laughs> the next word is dichromatic. Dichromatic. I get really confused about these words because they're all so similar. Dichromatic. Mm. This was the synonym of our uh, second word, dichroic. The number two definition, the synonym was dichromatic. So we have finally reached it. It is an adjective from circa 1847. Number one, having or exhibiting two colors. And then number two, of relating to or exhibiting dichro dichromatism, which which we will get to. Sort, but so it's all about two colors. Basically, that's what it is. And and who's ha who who or what's having those two colors, Spencer? Oh, you, see, that is. We're back to plants again. Maybe is it a plant that's got two colors, or is it an animal? Is a zebra dichromatic? I'm gonna say yes. You know, sometimes um, their eyeballs, their iris, and their color have two two colors. Sometimes yes. dogs or cats. So I think that could be uh, dichromatic. What about uh, can David you think Bowie? of any other? David Bowie's eyeballs. I don't know if he had two colors, but what I heard is that he got hit in the face. One of them was permanently dilated. Well, uh, oh, no, yeah, wait, that's he, why his eyes look different. No, but he did also have one eye was blue and one eye was green. And that, but I know that's got its own name, and I don't know if whether dichromatic would mm. come into that definition. I think you, I think you might be right, but personally. I think this dichromatic word fits perfectly for that. His eyeball, David Bowie's eyes were dichromatic. They were, and yeah, well, great. I think that was a great. That's a much better definition. They should put that in the dictionary. Why not? Can you make your own version of this book, please? Uh, With, uh, next time I've got like a spare five thousand years. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, you you know you could do a share uh, Karen's Karen's favorite words, and then you can just only do like maybe ten words. Oh, I could do. I've probably got at least a hundred favorite words. I've got quite a few. Even better. That's yeah. ten times better. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cooper. Uh, let's see. I think it's time for a guitar sound. Okay, here it is. And every single one of these sounds different than the last one. It's excellent. Let's put them all different. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, oh, I'm really, is that why? I'm really utilizing my whole repertoire of chords and combinations by the time this episode is done you will have no more chords that you know it doesn't matter i'll just make something up um yeah and i'll probably have a whole new song by, by listening to them it'll be great oh yeah uh okay here we go with dichromatism uh, so the, the dichromat is affected with dichromatism and this word is a noun from circa 1901 it is partial color blindness in which only two colors are perceptible. So there's a whole lot of varieties of people, uh, of types of color blindness. Some people, you know, can't distinguish between green and red. Some mm. people see only in gray tones. There's a whole bunch of them. But this one specifically, only two colors are perceptible. Can you imagine only seeing the world in two colors? So is it like if you can only see the world like in um, black and white photos or before TV had color? Yeah, yeah. But in this case, there's at least color, but there's only two colors, which I don't know if that's better or worse than black and white. Two colors do you get to choose? You don't get to choose. It's just two random colors. Oh, could, wouldn't that be great if you could choose your colors? I mean, what would you choose? I think I would choose green and purple. What about you? I'd definitely choose green, and I think I'd probably choose green and brown. 
Brown. What? What's the choice with brown? I just well, I, I don't, I, I don't know now, but I think green and brown <laughs> make sense to me together as two colors. So if I had to see everything in two colors, I like what yeah. green and brown look like together. You know, I used to dress a lot of in green and brown, and my sisters used to always hassle me for looking like a tree. <laughs> it's funny you mention that because yeah green is definitely my favorite color but a lot of like my pants tend to be like on the browner tint or like some of my shirts are brown and i'm like yeah i feel like i'm i'm just wearing like earth tones that's like other than black shirts most of what i wear are that like, green a lot of green and brown for sure yeah but you can still, still make we're still cool though eh? like it's not like we're just boring and earthy i feel like we're still it's still actually fashion forward I, I think it makes us extra cool actually good i'm just checking on that one <laughs> yeah uh, green and brown. Of course, my my brain with our previous conversation, my brain goes goes to poo. So if you if you if you see green and brown, then your your poo is still gonna look correct. But in my brain, if I if I see everything in green and purple, my poo is either gonna look green or purple or both, and that yeah. might be a little weird. Alar it's alarming. I see that. So I think that again, I chose brown for a good reason because the thing. I think you made the right choice. Not that I spend a lot of time looking at my own feces, but maybe you do, and so maybe that is a concern for you, Spencer. Who doesn't look when when you after you're done? You got to take a little peek, right? What for? What? <laughs> Make sure everything came out okay. I don't know. <laughs> oh, this is I'm this is, I'm learning something new, but no, I, I no I don't. I just say see you later. Better out than in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm done with you. You you've yeah. had your time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anything else to say about color blindness, or would you like to play a guitar strum? I would like to strum the guitar. That was like a whole song in one right there. Yeah, I'm just getting more and more excited about the guitar. Sorry, I know it's supposed to be a sound effect, so just tell me, Karen, it can't be that long. No, I love it when things change and evolve, so what you're doing is exactly what I was looking for. Right. The next word is dichroscope. D-I-C-H-R-O-S-C-O-P-E, noun from 1857. It is an instrument for examining crystals for dichroism. How did they come up again? Because this is obviously, this is, it's got a lot to do with this dichro, dichro, dichrotismism, all of those that, ones. And obviously yeah. crystals are very important to some people, you know? Especially the people who write the dictionary. Yeah, and people that have got dichromatism. Uh, I think maybe you need to get some crystals now, and you need to you need to study the the dichroism of the crystals and and yeah. see what sort of colors you could see. I think I will. So I'm going to have to find myself a dichromoscope. And what's it called? Again? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no. That. Yeah. The dichroscope. Dichroscope. Sorry. Yeah. Dichroscope. And um, obviously, I'm sure I'll get one of those just down the road in Wellington. I mean, surely they're a dime a dozen. You know. Yeah. You could um, probably also use it to um, to find the uh, the hero lesbians. Absolutely, and we multi-purpose. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'll put that on my Christmas list. I think. Of what I want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, dichroscope crystals, dichroism. That's what that is. It is time for a really really great guitar sound because this is the next word is why you're here. Is it? Oh, I'm yeah. excited, aren't I? I mean, they're really all why you're here, but. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. That was a, a perfect guitar strum for this next word, which is dick. D-I-C-H. Uh, and yes, we are adults here. We, we like to talk about uh, normal words in a very mature fashion. This word is a noun from 1553. There's only three short definitions. Number one is chiefly mm. British, and the synonyms are fellow and chap. Do you over in New Zealand? Do you, is this uh, the the context that you're you're used to? No, not really. I think it'd be more your old fashioned English. Obviously, it might, my parents are from England, um, but I think it's probably going to be more of the the second two definitions that we get. Also, can I just quickly add though, Spencer? I'm pretty sure when you spelt the word dick, you spelt D I C H. Did I'm I really? Pretty, I think so, and I'm pretty sure it's got a K on the end of it. So I'm just I'm just helping you out there. I mean, I would have thought you of all people would know to spell the word dick. But apparently you're too much of a dick, so yeah. 
I, I think I was so uh, caught up in the previous words that are all D-I-C-H that my brain did a funny little thing. And I, a very, I'm, I'm very grateful that you called me out on that. Otherwise, I would have heard this later and realized my mistake. And I think yeah. I make those constantly. So D-I-C-K is how this word is spelled. Number two, this is usually vulgar. And the synonym is penis. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think we all know that. It's. I think most people probably prefer to use that word than penis. There's a lot of words uh, for for this thing. Um, do you do you have any thoughts about this word in this context? This reminded me of when we did the c word that um, yeah. I enjoy talking about very much, um, and I think just the way that the word sounds and comes out of your mouth with those those hard hard beginning hard end. I think it just makes it enjoyable to say. Dick is just, it's a powerful, good word. It's short and sweet, you know. But yes, it doesn't have like a, you know, like penis. It just sounds kind of yuck. Same as vagina. Sounds floppy. Vagina just sounds like gross, you know. But if you say cunt or dick, it's like, I like it. I mean, I like cunt more than I like dick, but hey. <laughs> but if you're going to say a word, it, it, you're right. It is a very good word to say. It, it, it's yeah. very satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I think it's interesting that the word can be utilized in so many different contexts. Yeah, I was going to say we have one more definition, so maybe we'll I'll read that real quick, and then we'll talk about some of these other yeah. contexts. Um, number three, the synonym is detective. Uh, so somehow it just got shortened to dick, like a private dick, is is what people <laughs> say a lot. Um, Do you want to make one? Yes. <laughs> It's very private and it's satisfying to say, and it's hard at the beginning and hard at the end. Yeah, yeah. I thought that one of the definitions was going to be or is that it's a shortened version of the name Richard. You'd think, you'd think that that would be in here. Um, but I feel like when it comes to names, the, the dictionary doesn't really deal with those. The only time I see names come up are if they're like Greek gods or goddesses or somebody yeah, yeah. related to something more ancient like that yeah. um so yeah it, it's not in here but yes richard um it definitely gets shortened to dick actually when i was in junior high uh there was a substitute teacher in my city whose name i got i don't know if i i'll say it anyway his name was richard seaman wow that's amazing yeah. I'm pretty sure the last name was spelled differently, but um, but yes, it, it was kind of silly to all of us junior high kids who said Dick Seaman. Yeah, but what were his parents thinking? They obviously were not thinking at all. I I think that they were of such an old generation that yeah. it just wasn't even a part of their thought process. Yeah. It was Richard. Yeah. Yeah. And admittedly, I mean, what, how on earth Richard gets shortened to Dick? It's like when, what is the other ones? There were other weird ones, like William becomes Bob. Bill. No, Robert Bob. becomes. Yeah. What, what becomes Bob? Yeah, Robert becomes Bob. Bob. Yeah. William becomes Bill. Yeah, Bill. Uh, but then, yeah. like, Margaret becomes Peggy? Does it? So, look, these don't yeah. make any sense. No. I mean, this, I, I'd say there's just a big dick move on whoever came up with that idea. <laughs> they were they were they were trolling us all from all those years ago did, yeah. did, does Karen get shortened to or changed to anything do, do people call you a nickname I get called um Kaza a bit which is kind of your kind of typical lesbian sounding nickname um I sometimes feel Kaza or Laza was my surname um uh -huh. I think obviously at the moment it's just my name is so hilarious because of all that Karen stuff about being a Karen so it's almost like it's become a noun now as well as, you know, like, yeah, so, and the, it's, a, it's a way of being. So I think yeah, my name has been dragged through the mud and um, I think that's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Although I recently was on a, um, just quickly, I was on a crazy reality TV show that they asked me to be on called Celebrity Treasure Island, which is funny in the first instance because it's New Zealand. We don't even really have any celebrities. But you had to go on this, this stupid treasure, this desert island and do like these challenges and stuff. And at one point when people were being mean, I got, I actually got a bit upset and I did cry on the TV. And so after that, I got interviewed by this reporter and she was like, oh God, we have, we have to change the name to Karen O'Terry. So that's also oh. now one of the names is Karen O'Terry. But I think, you know, showing vulnerability is a sign of strength, maybe. It absolutely is. 
Uh, I yeah. think everybody should cry more, me included. Okay, well. Yeah, How but... did that TV show go, by the way? Oh, it was hilarious. And um, what a interesting experience. Like, you know, reality TV is not really my cup of tea. Um, I just think, generally speaking, it's it's a, a sad reminder of the problems we have in society. Um, but I just thought, well, you know what, Karen? You can't knock something until you've tried it. And if I could go on there and be on, you know, again, it's like so many people watch it, like people that would never watch Wellington Paranormal but would watch crazy, stupid reality TV. Um, so if I can go on there and be a visible member of the rainbow community, if I can stand up for what I believe in terms of my feminist ideals and calling men out on their bullshit, um, and I can hopefully have a laugh, then I feel like I've got an obligation. And that was kind of my strategy. <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, get to succeed in all of those goals? I definitely, I did, yes, I got one of the um, one of the male competitors on the show who is a very well known New Zealander. Um, got so mad at me calling out his bullshit that he called me a bitch on TV. So I, I felt I took that as a win, you know. Oh and, yeah. Um, yeah, and I made it way further in the competition than him. So in your face, Mike. <laughs> uh, has has have all the episodes aired by now? Yeah. So yeah, I didn't I didn't win, but I left. When the, I actually I actually eliminated myself from the show and oh. gave my spot to another woman because I really wanted a woman to win and I knew for a fact I didn't I couldn't be bothered running on sand I can't even run and I hate sand so I was like this doesn't make sense if she's going home I don't know you can stay I'll see you later I'm going for a beer that that's great of you um do you know how oh, yeah you you know the end so uh did did she yeah. win did how did it go she came second and she came uh, second. Yeah, so which is great, and, you know, and also really good that you know a white man, a white privileged man won because that's you know it's, we want to, we don't upset the status quo. So yeah, right, it's our yeah. time, right? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, you guys have been having a rough time lately. You know, people calling you out yeah. for stuff. It's like, just leave us alone. We just want to be able to do all the stuff we've done our whole lives and control the whole world. Yeah, is that so much to ask? <laughs> well, this is I remember last time talking to you and knowing that you were, you know, obviously not typical of that type of white man and i find that very refreshing and important well thank you uh you know this perfectly ties into our this word that we're talking about uh dicks yeah dicks running running the show running everything um any other contexts that you can think of where this word yeah. might be used because well, you know, obviously you know most of it most of the time you'd say oh you're such a dick and it's it's it is obviously an insult um but then i was thinking about men also and correct me if i'm wrong um use it as quite a sort of powerful kind of sex word as well like you know suck my dick and all that kind of stuff um so i'm not quite sure where i'm and, going with this but yeah where, where uh, well, do you think i should go with it <laughs> well yeah i think uh i can add on perfectly what you said there was uh, um i think yes it can be used in those and always is used in that sexual context but i think it's also used there because again like to your point earlier um, saying a different word just sounds weird, right? Yeah. Are they going to say, suck on my penis? No, that just sounds <laughs> weird. Suck on my dick sounds way more interesting, I guess. I don't know. Especially if you add a please at the end of it. You know, I think <laughs> you know, so use the P for the please, not for the yeah. penis. You know, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. Suck my please dick, and please. thank you yeah, would be yeah. great too. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, aren't you? Yeah, anyway, no, we digress now. And now we're thinking about sucking penises. No, we don't want to do that. N not oh, at least you, you and I. If it tickles your fancy, you can. But we're not going to, you know, any, if you want to think about that, then do. Um, but just remember to say please and thank you. The, very important throughout the mm -hmm. whole life. Um, yeah, and I am actually a little surprised that that um, sort of slang usage, like when you like you said, you're calling somebody a dick, like an asshole. Uh, you know, that's not in here. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why. Yeah, because well, I think as well, like, dick is more, it's more of a friendly insult. You know, like, sometimes it's like, oh, you're such a dick. Like, you can actually say it with kind of, it's almost a term of endearment. You know, like, yeah. your asshole is always, I don't like what you're doing. And I think sometimes you can be a lovable dick. Do you know what I mean? Totally, yeah. Uh, it, it is very versatile in that way. Just like, yeah. you know, well, the word that you were on previously, uh, yes. that can be used in a variety of ways. Yeah, it, can, it can be very negative, but it also can be really positive. You're a good cunt. You're a good cunt. Yeah. yeah. You are a good cunt. I'm a good dick. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it time for a guitar sound? It is. Yeah. The next word is 
You can pronounce this either dick sizzle or dick sizzle. You can emphasize either the first or the second syllables. It is spelled D I C K C I S S E L, noun from 1886. This is a common migratory black throated finch um, of the central U.S. And the species name is Spiza americana, and it is of the family Card- Cardinalidae. Cardinalidae. That's like a cardinal. Mm. Um, I have never heard of this Dixisle bird, but I am not a birder myself, so I think on uh, social media I will have to post a picture of a Dixisle. Oh, and I just think, what a great name, Dixisle. It kind of sounds like, I don't know if you have, I don't think, you, what do you call ice blocks in America? Ice blocks? Like, yeah. you talk- those. Like a thing on a stick that's frozen in its juice and you lick it and eat it. What are they called? Uh, well, there's there's popsicles or you lollipops. Do pops- oh, you're great. You have popsicles. We have popsicles in New Zealand. And dixicles makes me think of like a dick lollipop. I mean, ice block. Ice block. Yeah. Yeah. It is uh, it is very close to that for sure. Popsicle, dick, dixicle. Yeah. Dix- this, this, I can't even say the word anymore. Uh, yeah. I've never heard of this bird, but there's a lot. There's a lot of birds, bird names that are kind of weird like this. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think, because how many f- species of bird are there? Well, there's Eight. like five, I think. Five different birds in the world? Maybe. Maybe more. Maybe Yeah. 20? A thousand. A thousand? Okay, that, that's probably a good guess. <laughs> Could be even 10,000. I don't know. Well, someone will know again. Someone's screaming and saying there are so many bird types, but yes. We're not talking about There's... birds, we're talking about dixisles. Dixisles. Oh, <laughs> ah, it's just one kind of bird. Uh, I'm curious what this black-throated finch looks like. Uh, I, I think it is might be time for another guitar sound. Okay. The next word is Dickens. This is a noun from 1598. It is a euphemism, and the synonyms are devil and deuce. And it doesn't give me any more than that. Like, uh, it doesn't give me an example. So, it's, uh, you just, you just, you like explain. You're, you're proclaiming. You're exclaiming. Yeah. I, I use, the, I use Dickens all the time in my text messaging and in my general everyday conversation. I actually do. I say, what the Dickens is going on? And that's very common for me. Yeah. Do you think that it's more of um, a, a sort of uh, British Commonwealth language thing than, than American? I would presume so, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah. obviously, like, you know, everyone here, if I say, what the dickens are you doing? They'd know. And it's just like, a, it's a funny way to say, what the hell, basically. Right. Or what the devil? Yeah what, yeah, what the devil's going on here? You know, and what yeah. the dickens? It just sounds quite, again, I like, the, I like the way the word sounds and feels when you say it. Mm, yeah. It feels so good to say Dickens. We definitely do have this in America, in American English. Uh, maybe not as much, but yeah. I mean, if you were to say to somebody in America, "What the Dickens?" they would understand what you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, it's not. I don't think it's quite as common. Yeah, they might think you maybe you're a bit old-fashioned and weird. Is that maybe? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Which is true, I'm, to be fair. Yeah, well, when I come over to the states in uh, March, I'm going to say it all the time, and I can't. Remember. All the time. Yeah. You're going to you're going to affect American English. It's going to just yeah. spread yeah. like wildfire. Like, what the dickens do you call this meal? And I'm not paying for that. And what do you what the dickens do you mean? I've got to give you a tip. We don't do that in New Zealand. Are you a dichromat? <laughs> yeah. Uh it, it's guitar sound, I think. Okay. Yeah, that was uh that that went somewhere emotionally for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the next word is the first form of dicker, noun from the 14th century. This is the number or quantity of 10, especially of hides or skins. So, I guess if you have 10 hides or skins, that is a dicker. This is from the Latin decuria, which means quantity of 10. From decem, which means 10, and there's more of the word 10. So uh, I, it's, it's a little bit of a stretch, I guess. But yeah, 10, 10 things is a dicker. Well, uh, but it's only 10 hides? 
teen hides or skins? It is very specifically talking about hides or skins, but I'm I'm proclaiming that uh, you can just use it for any 10 things. Okay, you're proclaiming that. I feel like you're just yeah. completely making it up, but I will now, I'm going to use that, and if people look at me like, Karen, you're not even talking about skins or hides. I'll be like, doesn't matter, because Spencer told me I can still say dicker. You dick. Exactly. What the dickens are you talking about? <laughs> Make up, proclaim, it's the same thing. Yeah, you're great. Love it. What the dickens is is this dicker <laughs> of hides? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually need another guitar sound. Oh yeah, they're getting they're getting longer and and more yeah. uh, more expressive, more yeah. It's just, it's just as I'm you know really warming into this conversation. You got to lean into it. The yeah. second form of dicker. This is an intransitive verb from 1797. The synonym is the word bargain, as in the example, dickered over the price. It's like haggling. Yeah, yeah, great. I like dickered better than haggled. I think dickered sounds funny, right? Um, yeah, I've never, I've never heard of this dicker dicker over the price this is uh this is new to me have you heard this in this context oh, before I, no i've never heard it and that's why i'm so excited because now i can use it yeah if you if you, next time you go to the store you see if you can uh, dicker over the price of um something i was trying to think oh, of an example oh, gee, although you know i also love the fact that you call shops stores that always makes me laugh chuckle. i was gonna say shop and then in my brain i was like well that sounds very british uh new zealand you know whatever and i i was like well I, I, that that makes more sense to her brain but it doesn't make sense to my brain so i just said store but it's okay because now we've got to talk about stores and shops and it's great and next time i go to the shop i'm gonna do a good job of dickering uh yeah shop dickering uh, and you definitely got to get dickens in there somehow too oh, what oh, the dickens yeah. is the price of this of this yeah. uh dick sizzle i need to dicker the price yeah, yeah, yeah. oh well, it is gonna be great and the person in the shop will probably kick me out but that'll be funny <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll video it and i'll send it to you to add to this perfect thank you okay, great uh it's time for another guitar sound they're coming quick you quick rapid fire The next word is the third form of dicker. Who knew there were so many forms? It is a noun from 1797 again. Oh, this is very similar. Okay, so the last one was the verb. This is the noun. Number one, the synonym is barter. So you can, you're dickering over a dicker. Number two, an act or session of bargaining. So the whole action is a dicker and you are dickering in a dicker. Absolutely. And who doesn't want to dicker or do, do, do some dickering with a dicker? That's what I thought. And like you said, you know, then you, you're going to end up getting a really good price um, to purchase your 10 hides and skins. Oh, yes. The more dickering you do, uh, mm -hmm. you can get a good price for your dicker. You, yeah, end up with, you could end up with dicker dickers, which is 100 skins and hides for the price oh. of only 93. <laughs> That's like as many birds as there are in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all making sense now. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody, if this makes more sense to somebody by the time we're done, I might be worried for them because I think we're really confusing things. But that's fine. That's what this show is yeah. all about, to confuse well, people. Yes, great. I'm confused. <laughs> uh, it's guitar time. Yeah. I'm really running out of chord combinations, but I'm just going to keep keep going, you know. You would never know that you were running out of combinations. I didn't know. Thanks. The next word is dicky, spelled D-I-C-K-E-Y, or you can take out the E, or you can spell it with an I-E at the end. So many ways. It mm -hmm. is, um, where's, it's a noun from 1807, number one, any of various articles of clothing, that's the main topic, as A, a man's separate or detachable shirt front. So if there's just a little shirt front that all by itself and you can detach it, that's a dicky. Yep. Uh, one B, still in the um, men's article of clothing. I think, did it say men's? No, 
just articles of clothing. 1B, a small fabric inset insert worn to fill in the neckline. So if down here, if the shirt comes too low, but you want some extra fabric there, uh, just, just throw a little fabric down there in, in this thing, and that's a dicky. But it's, we still haven't got up to dicky bow yet. Is that right? Dicky bow? A dicky bow, yeah. Because that's right. No, we haven't. Like, is that even in there? Because that's what I, I would know. Thought. Okay, well, let's carry on. Let's find out. I'm let's excited. Let's find out. Um, I think I first heard this word in um, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where Cousin Eddie is wearing a dicky, and I somebody had said it, and I was like, I don't even know what that thing is. It's like... Um, uh, uh, a, what, a turtleneck, a turtleneck, yeah. but it just goes down a little bit. All right, well, now I'm curious about this dicky bow. Let's see what we got. Number two, here is chiefly British, so maybe this will be it. 2A, the driver's seat in a carriage is a dicky. Okay, no, that's still not a dicky bow, is it? <laughs> nope, no, it's not. 2B, this is the last one, a seat at the back of a carriage or automobile so wait, the driver's seat or the seat in the back is a dicky. So anybody sitting in a carriage or automobile is in the dicky seat. Yeah. And it's still not a dicky bow. No. Well, now I'm questioning my own knowledge of dicky bow. Look, that's just like <laughs> a, a dicky bow. It's like a, it's like a bow tie thing. A and it must be because it goes around your neck. So it'll just be a, a, a piece of fabric that's like a, a dicky, but then they've turned it into a dicky bow. Well, what what you said makes perfect sense to me, um, because yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna put it in there, oh this so this says it's slang. Uh, let's see, we have a few things. Dicky bow in British English, um, it's just just a bow tie. Yeah, it's huh. a bow tie. Dicky bow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I wonder why that's not in here. It right. is technically British English slang. Um, yeah. It says that it evolved from Cockney rhyming slang. The word dicky is rhyming slang for shirt from dicky dirt which which is shirt and then it, oh. and then the bow tie looks like a bow on a shirt and this is how the expression of dicky bow came about hmm. oh that's like the cockney writing slam slang for cunt or whatever or the word burke which we used to use it affectionately as like a, an insult you know you're such a burke actually means cunt and i only found that out recently my was like dad used to call us that all the time it's a it's appalling dad yeah. Oh my God. But the other thing, back to Dicky. Um, do you ever use Dicky in the context of, oh, I've got a bit of a Dicky knee? Uh, no. That very that sounds very British to my ears. A dick, so what? Like it's um like a bum knee? Oh, yeah. Like it it's not working so well? Yeah. Yes, bum. Yeah, yeah. I've got a Dicky knee, or I've got a Dicky. You know. Yeah. I think I need to use this every day now. Yeah. Yeah. I do kind of have a dicky knee. Like if I run like a little too far, like like yes. two miles, my knee was like, no, I, I think we're done. Yeah, but it's because it's dicky. Yeah. yeah. This knee is we, very dicky. Yeah. Do you have a dicky knee? No, I don't have a dicky knee. I've got a dicky... Um, I've got dicky feet, actually. My feet are kind of weird and a bit munted. Um, but that's just... But, you know, I've learned to live with it. So, yeah. You're not, they're more just like... That's Weird. just your feet. Yeah, yeah. And who's got... I mean, no, I've never met someone with beautiful feet before ever, so... Uh, yeah, I, I, it's hard to find beautiful feet. No, I, I haven't. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be like finding a beautiful paint, uh, dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the etymology for dicky is from dicky with no E, D-I-C-K-Y, which is the nickname for Richard. So that's where it comes from, but it really doesn't give any more information other than that. Uh, so that's really not helpful. Hmm. Maybe a man named Richard was wearing the fabric under his shirt. Must be, and that's where it came from. But I remember what I was just going to say when I went to primary school. Um, one of my, I think my second teacher, his name was Mr. Dickey. And that, like when, when you're at junior high, whatever it was, made a lot of us laugh a lot of the time. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Dickey, yeah. How could that not make you laugh when you're 13 years yeah. old? Yeah. Um, there's nothing else. and We got no dicky bows here, so we are going to move on to uh, guitar sound. Okay. And you may want to keep it on your knee. Okay, I will. Oh, yeah, that one left me hanging. I want to know where that no. ends. Yeah. Uh, the next word is dicky bird, two words, 
noun from 1781, and it just means a small bird. It's a bird that's very little. It's a dicky bird. But do you know the rhyme? No. What's the rhyme? I'm gonna. I'm quickly gonna show you this. You obviously can edit it out, but it is. It's worth its weight in gold. I'm gonna show it to you. So for people that are listening, you won't be able to see this, and you should be watching it because this is gonna change your lives. And it's something that my mum used to do for me. Okay, here we go. Ready? So I'm these ready. are two dicky. They're two dicky birds, right? And this is their wall. Two little dicky birds sitting on a wall. One named Peter. One named Paul. Fly away, Peter. Fly away, Paul. Come back, Peter. Come back, Paul. Magic. You see that? How did you do that? Because it's magic. This is the whole thing. (laughs) I have never heard this before. That's awesome. Do you know where this came from? Again, I think it's English. Yeah, but I remember my mum used to sing it to us when we were little. So two little dicky birds sitting on a wall. One named Peter, one named Paul. Which is it's just a family rhyme. Yeah. Um, and, and they're just little. That's all it is. They're just small little birds. Yep. She, she was using her fingers and then, um, well, you know, to, to, if you want to see what happens with these fingers, you have to, uh, join the Patreon so you can see what's going on. It's worth looking and, at because it's, it's magical. Um, that was that was wonderful. the The video here is a little uh, chunky while we're recording, so when it um, when it's done, I'm gonna take a closer look when okay, when we're right. all done here, and I get to see the high definition video. Perfect. Guitar sound. The next word is oh, I think you're gonna love this. It is dickhead. <laughs> It's just one word. It is a noun from 1964. It is usually vulgar, and it is a stupid or contemptible person. And uh, the etymology says it is from dick, which means penis plus head. So so somebody's acting like a dick. Yeah, they're, they're a total dickhead. Yeah. Um, but I want to know, this is what I was wondering about the word dickhead. Is, has the head been added to the dick because that is a part of a dick? Do we think? It's it, 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 well, okay. So it's kind of similar to calling somebody like a blockhead, maybe. A blockhead is kind of like a stupid person. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's just I, it's funny that the word head, which can also be used as part of a penis, has been attached to dick, but dickhead. I think like blockhead makes you think your head is made of a block and it's just filled with nothing because you're stupid. But dickhead is just kind of secretly still a bit sexual, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if if, you, if the word dick is going to be there, it can't not be sexual in some way. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's a good point. You know, or it just mean like you're acting like the head of a dick or the, your brains are in the head of a dick or, you know, there's so many yeah. possibilities. Yeah, I was like, why didn't they just choose to call it dick foot? Wait, sorry, say that again, dick foot? Yeah, but why, why not just say, you know, you're such a dick foot? Because of course they chose head. Yeah, there's a reason for head in there, yeah. Dickfoot yeah. now. Now that that would be an interesting uh uh word to call somebody. I and maybe we need to come up with what is that? Something different. Yeah, okay. Well, well, yeah. yeah, you're you, no, you're such a dickfoot. It's like you're I think if you're a dickfoot, you're kind of completely behind the eight ball. I think it's the opposite of bigfoot. Bigfoot has really big feet. I think if you're being a dickfoot, you have small feet, which a lot of people take to mean that they have a small penis, which a lot of people then are like, you know, that's that's a mean remark to them. Yeah, yeah, and which is ridiculous. But yes, I, I think it, right, exactly. Put the nail on the head. Put the nail on the dickhead there. <laughs> on the dickhead, and I also, I, I I love the way that you say this word, uh, with your New Zealand accent. Obviously, yeah. you, it's normal for you, but to me, it's it's just it's just so it's it's lustrous. I love it. Thank you. Well, I also notice when I say dickhead, I, n- I never say the H, and that's my English, like that's the English side of me, just, you know, dickhead, which is basically right. would be D I C K E D. But yeah, yeah, pretty much. Dickhead. Which, of course, we would say dicked, but yeah, dickhead. Dickhead. Yeah, dick- yeah that was good. <laughs> I try. I try. Yeah. Um, it, is, uh, it is time for another guitar strum.
none of those chords made any sense together. It was hilarious. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how the best songs are made. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the next word is dick test. Two words. And dick has a capital D. I don't think the word dick has been said so many times in like an hour. Uh, this is a noun from 1925. I may have just said that. It is a test to determine susceptibility or immunity to scarlet fever by an injection of scarlet fever toxin. And this is from uh, George F. Dick and Gladys H. Dick. I don't know if they were siblings or married, but uh, they must have uh, maybe designed this test, this medical test, almost 100 years ago, and it became the Dick test. But um, good thing scarlet fever isn't really a thing these days, because I think if, if you, somebody said, you have to go get a Dick test, yeah. I think a lot of people would be freaked out by that. Absolutely, because when you first was talking about it, I was like, what, did they have to get something, in, like, what did you say? They got injected with scarlet fever into their dick. That would be, that seems horrible. Right, but right. Uh, and it could be so many things. Are you going to inject something into the dick or are you going to uh, put a bunch of dicks by me and see how I react? Exactly, uh, yeah. Am I going to have an allergic reaction or, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the dick test, yeah. Maybe um, we'll put a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about scarlet fever and uh, to see if you had it or if you were immune to it. Okay. Guitar strum time. Every single one of these, these is a beginning to a song. Yeah. Maybe your Christmas songs. Absolutely. <laughs> the next word is diclinus. D-I-C-L-I-N-O-U-S. Diclinus. Adjective from 1828. It is having the stamens and pistils in separate flowers. So it's it's a flower thing. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I just remembered the, the reason that um, the, when we were reading the word dichotomy, the very first word, yes. um, and I said, the oh, this example sounds familiar. That is because I actually did record all of the word dichotomy in the previous episode. And it's been weeks since I recorded that. So I totally <laughs> forgot. Um, so I guess that people are just going to get that whole section twice. And that's fine. Yeah, well, they'll have, they'll probably they'll have two slightly different versions of it. They'll have a dichotomy of d definitions of a di dichotomy. Yeah, they'll get my version, which is yeah. bl blame and boring and short, and then they'll get your version, which our, is much more interesting. Our, oh, our version, yeah. No. <laughs> our version, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have one more word. One more guitar strum, please. Okay. The last word is dicot, D-I-C-O-T, noun from 1877, and the synonym is dicotyledon, which is actually the first word in the next episode. So if you want to learn about a dicot, you got to go listen mm -hmm. to the next episode. I'll be there. Uh, what's that? I said I'll be there. You'll, you'll be there, yes. I wish. I wish you could be there on every episode. Uh, so, um, it is time now that we finished all the words. I'm going to reread them quickly and then you get to pick a word of the episode. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, dichotomy, dichroic, dichroism, dichromat, dichromate, dichromatic, dichromatism, dichroscope, dick, dixissel, Dickens, Dicker, 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 Dicky, Dicky Bird, Dicky, uh, Dickhead, I almost said Dicky Head, Dickhead, Dick Test, Diclinus, and Dicot. <laughs> I don't, I know how I'm supposed to choose one word because that was the funniest list I've ever listened to in my life. It was genius. Um, I've, obviously, I've, I've got a soft spot for um, dichroism. But then I think, you know, you can't go past Dick. And I just, and I also really love the fact that you like how I said Dickhead. So I'm going to go with Dickhead. Ah, that's yeah, excellent. Perfect. The the, the yeah. word of the episode is Dickhead. Yep, that's right. Uh, <laughs> would you like to sing a song about uh, Dickhead? Yep. Here it goes. It goes like this. I'm going to sing it to the tune of one of my other songs. Um, no, I can't now. No, I can't. <laughs> Don't be a dickhead, don't be a dickhead, don't be a dickhead. 
ticket today. Oops, see, hang on, I've got the chords wrong. That was going to be good though. Don't, don't be a dickhead, don't be a dickhead. I think that'll make me want to tell you to go fucking away. Keep your dick in your pants. It, oh no, I got this getting oh, too weird. No, no, I loved it, but that's fine. If you if you want to end it there, that's fine. This has potential, is what I'm saying. I think it does, because yeah, there is a lot about dick, you know, like, yes, the thought of dick, sometimes it makes me sick, but if you like it, then that's okay. But I guess the problem with me and the reason I don't like dick, well, it's pretty much because I am gay. But if you like dicks, that's good too. And if you like dicks, well, good for you. But just the last thing you want to be is a dickhead to me. Here you go. My face hurts from smiling so hard on that. That that was just glorious. Oh, my God. (laughs) My guests are, have been bringing it. They've been bringing it the last few months so good. And you are no exception to the rule. You have not been a dickhead today. Thank you. It's um, been so- and I, I really, really hope that that song gets added to the next album. I, uh, well, it could be my adults album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, so those were all the words. That was the, the, the dickhead is the, the word of the episode. That was the song. Um, what would you like to tell the people about what's going on in your life? I would if like anything. To tell, oh, just Christmas is coming up soon. So that's going to be happening in my life. Um, and I'm just going to keep, like I said at the start, I'm just going to keep trying to do any random thing and go to lot, watch lots of sport, become a sports commentator do a bit more acting and uh, maybe I feel like I should come over to America and become famous in America. That's my plan for next year. Leave it with me. Uh, well, I think that process has already started because Wellington Paranormal just exploded here in the States. Uh, I have been telling so many people to watch it and uh, it's fantastic and it's wonderful. And um, we're, we're sad that we're not going to get more of that, but we are very you happy know. that me. What's that? So you never know. You never know. Oh, okay. I'll keep that under wraps. Well, no, um, you, you, you never know. All I'm saying you is, never you know. know, you never know. And I, you know, there's always, there's always rumors flying around. Uh, but we are also very, very happy that you are doing a whole range of other things. It just gives us more ways to, to follow you, watch you, mm-hmm. uh, be your amazing self. I'm sad that I wasn't able to watch that celebrity, uh, reality sure, show. I, be- I would have cracked you up, honestly, Spencer. Oh. It was hilarious. Oh man! If uh, I'll see if I can find some clips because watching you in action in that situation just sounds like just Chef's kiss. I'll see if I can find some for you. How about that? Excellent. Right, well, thank one. you to Karen. Thank you to Karen O'Leary uh, for being on this show. I will put all of her links and things in the show notes if you want to go find her on Twitter and say some nice things and Instagram and all those things. Um, well, you can, thank or you. Or you can just call me a dickhead if you want. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're going to call her a dickhead, just do it in the nicest way possible, not the mean a, way. Yeah, that's right. Maybe, maybe yeah. we should turn dickhead into a, a nice word. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's used to about me, it's, it can only be nice, surely. It's the only option. Yeah. Uh, or a dick foot. Yeah, no, dick foot, yeah. <laughs> Um, that is going to be the end of the episode. Um, you should also, um, you know, come back later in the D's and, uh, Karen may come back once or twice for some other fun words. I would love to. Can't wait. Excellent. We look forward to seeing you in 2023. If you want to see the video of this, uh, this recording, go to Patreon. I think you got to do the $5 a month, uh, because it's worth it to look at the plants and look at her bright orange sweatshirt and her beautiful face and also her guitar and the pickle beer. Yeah, it's only five dollars. Come on, you'd be crazy. You don't need a dicker about that. No, you don't. Don't be a dickhead. Yeah, yeah. That's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer and Karen dispensing information. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Hello. Thank you for being here. I uh, I believe we should have had a guest on the previous episode, and uh, if there was, I can, um, I think, safely assume it was a grand old time. It had to have been. We'll see what the future holds. Um, I'm Spencer. I'm your host. I'm reading this dictionary, and I'm telling you about it, so here we go. The first word in this episode is 
Dicotyledon. Dicotyledon. D I C O T Y L E D O N. S- uh, noun from circa 1727. Any of a class or subclass of angiospermous plants that produce an embryo with two cotyledons and usually have floral organs, florgans, arranged in cycles of four or five and leaves, four or five, and leaves with reticulate venation. Boy, when you don't know the words about plants, you don't know how to say a sentence. Uh, okay, so they're and these plants are angiospermous. They make an embryo with two cotyledons. Don't remember what a cotyledon is. Uh, they got florgans. They got the florgans. Uh, and they're arranged in cycles of four or five. Those florgans are. And then there are leaves. And these leaves have reticulate venation. Whatever that means. Um, the, I guess the class name is Magnoliopsida, and the subclass is Dictotiledon, nope, 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 Dictotiledonae, close. Dicotyledonous, Dicotyledonous, that is an adjective. Dicotyledonous. All right, let's say the next word. And the sound effect shall just be check. The next word is dicumarin. Dicumarin. D-I-C-O-U-M-A-R-I-N. I think it is dicumarin. And let's just do a quick little check on that pronunciation. And yes, I think that's good. Noun from 1886. The synonym is dicumarol which, um, let's see, I think I can find dicumarol. Just want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Dicumarol. Yeah, that's the synonym. That'll be in tomorrow's episode. The next word, check, check. Dicrotic. Dicrotic. Adjective from circa 1811. Number one is talking about the pulse. The pulse from your heart. The thing that they feel on your wrist or under your ear, or in your leg, and or in other, your neck, of the pulse. It is having a double beat, is dichrotic. And of course, di, uh, the di prefix means two. Double beat of the pulse. So, wait, if your heart is supposed to go, ba-boom, 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 is a dichrotic heartbeat go, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. I don't know. Let me know if you know. Maybe I'll go somewhere else to see if I can find out, but that's interesting. A double beat of the pulse. Number two, being or relating to the second part of the arterial pulse occurring during diastole. Is that how you pronounce that? Diastole. Diastole of the heart or of an arterial pressure recording made during the same period. Okay, so it does say being or relating to the second part of the arterial pulse. So I guess the second part, the boom, ba-boom, that second boom, maybe I should go ba-boom, the boom is the diacrotic because is is it's the second part. So I don't know if is is all is a normal pulse and is a normal pulse dichrotic because it has the double beat, the ba-boom. Um, I, I'm not so sure. I don't know. We got to put a link in the show notes, I think. A link, I think. Um, yes. Oh, and then, uh, diastole, I think I pondered. Uh, that's when it's the, the, the heart is being filled. I think so. Uh, the diastole, I guess, is the second part of the bump. And, uh, which must mean that the first part is when the heart is pumping the blood out. And then the second part is it's pulling it in from the other side. It pumps it out on your left side, and then it pulls it in on your right side. And it's doing this all the time, constantly. While I'm talking to you, my heart is going, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. I could check my pulse now, but I'm not going to. Ba-boom, ba-boom. It's just doing that in the background constantly. So is yours. 
Maybe yours is like, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. You can make a nice beat with it. Oh, okay. Did we talk about dichrotic enough? I think basically yes. Di- dichrotism, that is a noun. Maybe your heart has dichrotism. I hope I'm not talking about this stuff too much. I hope maybe you're interested in this. You're learning something. I don't know if you think about the heart. Uh, this is from die plus Krotos, which means rattling noise or a beat. So yeah, your heartbeat is a beat. and may, Hopefully it's not rattling. You don't want your, your heart to be rattling. That's Krotos, dichrotos, dichrotic. The next word. Check, check, one, two. This one is D-I-C-T, abbreviation for this thing that you're listening to, dictionary. That's what it stands for. Dictionary is going to be in the next word. And um, I tried a little bit to get a a guest, but I didn't try very hard because I'm sorry, I'm busy. I wish I could spend more time on this. Maybe someday, maybe if I, oh, I don't know, got paid for this, then I could actually spend more time and I could do more research and I can have more guests. And that's a fantastic fantasy that may never come true, but that's fine. We can talk about things ourselves. I am trying to get more guests on though. Okay, the next word. Check, check. One, two, three, four. Dictaphone. With a capital D. And then it's like your telephone is put on a dictionary. But that's spelled different. This is a trademark and it is used for a dictating machine. Which we will talk about soon. It's a machine that dictates. It talks to you and then you have to write things down. I'm I'm joking. The next word, check, check, one, two, three, four, five, dictate, or you can say, you can emphasize the other syllable, dictate, first form, verb from 1581, I think we're starting with intransitive here, number one, to give dictation is to dictate, what's dictation, I don't know, we'll find out later, number two, To speak or act domineeringly. You are, it's like you are, you are telling somebody what to do. It's not the number one. That's the thing. This, this has a couple different definitions. Two, two ideas, either telling something to write that thing down or telling something to do something because you want them to, basically. The synonym for number two is prescribe, prescribe, like like a doctor prescribing drugs, they are dictating them, but they're doing it domineeringly. Like, you really have to do this. Here's transitive. One, to speak or read for a person to transcribe or for a machine to record. You're dictating, you're talking out loud. A person's going to write it down or a machine is going to record it or maybe even type it up. We have that technology now. Two, A, to issue as an order. Must do this now. I have I have dictated. You must listen to this podcast now. To be is to impose, pronounce, or specify authoritatively with much authority. Mm, to see. To require or determine necessarily, as in injuries dictated the choice of players so this is this is all about cause and effect when something happens it dictates the next thing that's going to happen it's going to dictate the future the the uh, the effect has been dictated um yeah if a team is going to have some injuries then they can't put those players on the team in the next game it has been dictated This is from the Latin verb dictare, which means to assert or dictate, uh, which is from dicere, which means to say, and there's more at the word diction, which is about talking. Did we read that one already? Mm, No, I think that that's in the next episode as well. Um, So, let's see. Where where was that etymology? Diction, saying, speaking, um, yeah, and I think it's I think it's kind of funny that I am saying this out loud. I am dictating the dictionary, kind of. It has it wasn't dict 
there's there's clearly some etymology that's related to all these words. Next word. Check, check, check. Dictate second form, noun from 1594, 1A, an authoritative rule, prescription, or injunction. 1B, a ruling principle, as in, according to the dictates of your conscience. According to the dictates or dictates. I don't know which way we're supposed to pronounce that one. I think it's dictates. According to the dictates of your conscience. What is your conscience telling you to do? What is what are you, your conscience's your conscience's ruling principles? What what is your conscience rules you? It tells you what to do, so it has some principles. Hmm. And it, they have been dictated. Who dictated these these pr- ruling principles into my conscience? Number two, a command by one in authority. They are in an authoritative position. They have authority. They tell other people what to do. They have dictated it. Next word. Check A, check B. One, two, three. Dictating machine. Two words. Noun from 1907. A machine used especially for the recording of human speech for transcription. 1907, they had the ability to do this. Um, so yeah, a machine is going to record you. It's literally, it could just be anything. Anything that can record audio can be a dictating machine. They did obviously invent machines specifically to do this. Uh, I don't know what they are exactly or why or do they have different abilities? Is it like easier to maybe fast forward rewind because you've maybe got to go check back on the words that you're dictating that you're typing writing up? Hmm. I don't know if it has any other special features like that, but uh, some of them are called dictaphone. I think my dad had a dictaphone. He wasn't typing things up necessarily, but he would record himself um, because he did voiceover work, and so he would record it, and then he could play it back to himself and hear it and redo it and hear, hear how it sounds, or sometimes he would even use it to put the sound into his ear while he was actually recording so he would just follow along hearing himself say it. I think he used a dictaphone for that. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, dictaphones now, dic- dictating machines, I should say. Um, we have those on our phone, and then you just talk into it, and it types what you say, and we use this all the time. We are living in the future. The next word. Check, 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 check. Dictation. Noun from 1651, 1A, the synonym is prescription. Hmm. I wonder if that's because doctors would literally dictate to somebody helping them out, write this thing down, this prescription that this person needs. They dictated it, uh, so it's a prescription. Interesting. Maybe that's what they used to call them. 1B is arbitrary command. Any arbitrary command is a dictation. Anything? Just any. It's just arbitrary. To a one, the act or manner of uttering words to be transcribed. If you are giving a dictation, you are dictating. The act or manner of uttering words, just you saying the words out loud, is a dictation. To a two, material that is dictated or transcribed. So the stuff written down is also the dictation. The, 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 the dictation. So, how do you put all this together? You are dictating your dictation to a dictation. Dic- your... Di- yeah. We could have gotten more in there, but that's fine. Okay, 2B1 is where we're at. The performing of music to be reproduced by a student. I guess if you're... If you just want them to follow you right right afterwards, you the teacher plays the thing, that's a dictation because then the uh, the student is going to reproduce it and play it right after you. Maybe this is to use to uh, to test their ear to see if they can translate what they hear to the pitches on the uh, the instrument. Dictation number two, two B two, music so reproduced, just the music that's made. It's the same thing as the writing. You speak the words, it gets written down. Both of those are dictation. You play the music, 
and it's just reproduced by another thing that makes music. Both of those are the dictation. The next word. Check. Do they say sibilance? I've heard people say that, but I don't say it. Check, 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 check. Dictator. Noun from the 14th century. Your mind can wander in whatever way you hear this word. That's that's all I'll say. 1A for dictator. A person granted absolute emergency power, especially one appointed by the Senate of ancient Rome. So now I think we think of dictator a little bit differently. But yeah, back in the day, in uh, in ancient Rome, if there was an emergency, they needed somebody to be in power. Maybe the person in power died or was just busy. Maybe they were making dinner. And uh, so somebody else has to come in and take their place. So that person is the dictator. 1B, one holding complete autocratic control. That's... I think mostly what we think of these days of the dictator. They just have all the control. That's it. It's usually over a country. I don't I don't have the greatest feelings about that idea. 1C. One ruling absolutely and often oppressively. So yeah, there's a subtle difference between 1B and 1C. Maybe it's not so subtle. I don't know the details of the specifics of autocratic control, but... Yeah, 1C, they're usually oppressive to the people. They love all the greed and the power and everything, and uh, and then they're friends too, And then the, but they, they're not maybe treating the, the little people so good. You got to treat the little people good. Ah, Number two. Also, don't call them little. Step number one, geez, everybody's the same. Number two, one that dictates is the dictator. If you are writing down my words, I am a dictator and I don't even know it, and then you are taking dictation, and it's not in here, but would you be the dictate, the one who is doing the dictating? Are you the dictate? I don't know what word that would be. All right, we have one more word for this episode. Finally, we made it. Check, 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 check. Dictatorial. D-I-C-T-A-T-O-R-I-A-L, adjective from 1701, 1A, of relating to or befitting a dictator, as in dictatorial power. That is the kind of power that befits a dictator, obviously, but maybe maybe there's some fancy pants that befit that dictator. So that, those fancy pants would be dictatorial, dictatorial fancy pants. 1B, ruled by a dictator. The people who are ruled by a dictator would be dictatorial. 2, oppressive to or arrogantly overbearing towards others. Please don't be dictatorial. Don't be a dictator, a tater of dicks. I guess we did talk about the word dick in the last episode, whether it was me or with a guest. Oh, we talked about dicks, definitely. And dickheads. Okay, let's see. Oh, oppressive or dictatorially is an adverb, and dictatorialness is a noun. There is synonym information for dictatorial, which is just a fun word to say, and you have to say it completely every time. Um, so the synonym information, we haven't seen this in a little bit. Dictatorial, magisterial, dogmatic, doctrinaire, and oracular are all fucking amazing words. Every single one of them. But they also mean imposing one's will or opinions on others. Your will or things you believe onto other people. This is like the least good thing that you could be, I think. Dictatorial stresses autocratic, high-handed methods and a domineering manner, as in exercised dictatorial control over the office. Magisterial or magisterial 
stresses assumption or use of prerogatives appropriate to a magistrate or schoolmaster enforcing acceptance of one's opinions, as in the magisterial tone of his pronouncements. So it's like they are a schoolmaster or somebody in charge, I guess, or or they actually are. Dogmatic implies being unduly and offensively positive in laying down principles and expressing opinions, as in dogmatic about what is art and what is not. So you're unduly and offensively positive in laying down principles and expressing opinions. Um, so I guess what this one, it's a little bit of a weird definition, just the way it's worded, but I think it's basically um, you... you talk about your opinions and what you think um but you're you're pretty you're pretty forceful about it and uh and specific i guess hmm offensively positive i don't i don't know that's it's just weird it's a weird definition to my brain doctrinaire implies a disposition to follow abstract theories in framing laws or policies affecting people as in a doctrinaire approach to improving the economy. Hmm. Disposition to follow abstract theories in framing laws or policies affecting people. So yeah, it's something something about things that are specifically how they're going to affect people. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, a, how you improve or how you affect the economy is definitely going to affect people. The last of these words, oracular. I think that's how you pronounce it. It implies the manner of one who delivers opinions in cryptic phrases or with pompous dogmatism. I don't feel smart enough for this section. As in a designer who is the oracular voice of fashion. Um, Cryptic phrases. So, with pompous dogmatism. Boy, I, I, I know pompous dogmatism when I see it but I couldn't explain it. All right, that was enough of that. It is time to reread the word so we know what to pick of the word of the episode. So we know what to pick for the word of the episode. We had dicotyledon, dicotyledon, dicumarin, dichrotic, that's the double beat thing, dict, dictaphone, dictate, dictate, Dictating machine, dictation, dictator, and dictatorial. Hmm. What do I want to pick? I mean, I don't like the dictator, the dictatorial. Uh, dictation. Hmm. 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 Maybe, maybe, uh, dichrotic. Let's pick dichrotic as the word of the episode, uh, because it's all about the heart and specifically the second part of the heart. Dichrotic is about the second part of the heart. Dichrotic is the second beat of your pulse. Dichrotic! Dichrotic! That's a good place to end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye! Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary, your favorite podcast. I know, you told me it is. It's you can, Don't lie now. Don't take it back. All right, the first word in this episode is dictatorship. Um, You could also emphasize the first syllable, dictatorship. D-I-C-T-A-T-O-R-S-H-I-P. Noun from 1542. One, the office of dictator. The person who's working in the office, the dictator who's working in the office of the dictatorship. I don't think that was English. Number two, autocratic rule, control, or leadership. Yep, this is all obviously tagged on to what we talked about in the previous episode with dictator and dictatorial. The dictatorship is the thing that is under autocratic rule, control, leadership. The the act of, I don't know how to describe it. Number three A, a form of government in which absolute power is concentrated in a dictator or a small clique. 
So it doesn't have to be one person. It could be a group of people. But either way, uh, they they just have absolute power. One person, this small group of people, uh, and they rule with a dictatorship. Because whatever they say goes. 3B, a government organization or group in which absolute power is so concentrated. The organization or the group that uh, is in control is the dictatorship. And then finally, 3C, a despotic state. So a group, an area, a a state, a country, a region uh, that is, uh, I guess, ruled by a, a despot. Um, that that would be a, a dictatorship as well. Yeah, despot, dictator, authoritarian. I think there's a couple other words. They're they're all very similar. Um, okay, let's do a sound effect. This one is it's just going to be a word, kind of weird like yesterday. We're just going to go book. The next word is diction. D i c t i o n. Noun from 1581. Number one is obsolete, and it is verbal description. I'm not sure if that means... What could that be? Uh, Describing something in a verbal way, like I describe things to you using my voice. Um, Or is it describing something that is verbal or oral... Uh, it doesn't doesn't really say. Some sort of verbal description is diction, but it's obsolete. Two, choice of words, especially with regard to correctness, clearness, or effectiveness. Huh, so your choice of words is your diction. What words do you choose to describe a thing? Uh, But more specifically, we're talking about uh, to make things correct or clear or effective. I try to be good in this regards of, uh, in this uh, definition of diction to describe things to you. I try to be correct. I know I'm not always correct. I'm as correct as I can be with the limited knowledge in my brain. I try to be clear. I try to be effective, clear and vivid. Um, Again, sometimes it doesn't always come out great, but... Overall, it's, I don't think it's too bad. 3A, vocal expression, and the synonym is enunciation. Enunciation. You don't want to say enunciation. I wasn't, I wasn't enunciating enunciation. Yes, how do you use your mouth and stuff? Vocal, your, the expression of your vocality. I don't even know if that's a word. Your vocal expression, your enunciation. Um, yeah, it's to being being clear in your words, not necessarily with the words that you use, the words that you say, but it's more about how is your mouth literally saying the words. Hopefully, I have some decent enough diction. I try to be good because you gotta you gotta understand what I'm saying if I'm gonna read the this dictionary, this dictionary. Three B pronunciation and enunciation of words in singing. So how do you pronounce the words when you're singing? How are you enunciating them? Which syllables are being emphasized? Uh, Which ones get more emphasis? Which words are more emphasized than the others? Uh, Yeah, just how are you saying the words? And then also just the pronunciation of the words. Dictional is an adjective... And dictionally is an adverb. This, I think it's very good to have good diction. I can't tell you how many people, they just mumble. They don't enunciate their words. And for somebody like me who, there's some weird disconnect between my ears and my brain. It's partly that my hearing is going, but I think I've always had a bit of a problem when people are talking to me and I'm like, wait, what? What did you just say? It just sounded like gibberish. Um, ever since probably at least middle school or earlier, there's there's something. Uh, and so, you know, I need to look at their face and their mouth. That helps. And, you know, it helps if we're not in a, a crowded area, a loud area. Um, but, boy, I'm like, you got to look at me in the face if you're going to say something. Otherwise, I don't know what you're saying. Gavs have some good diction. It's just a nice thing to do. 
This is from the Latin diction, that's a prefix, or the word dictio, and that means speaking or style, from dicere, which means to say. It is akin to the Old English tion, which means to accuse. Hmm, what are we accusing people of? Also from the Latin decare, which means to proclaim or dedicate. From the Greek deik, what do you say this word? Deikninai, deikninai, that means to show. And then also from dyk or dyke, which means judgment or right, R-I-G-H-T. And that was a lot of stuff. Speaking, style, to say, to accuse, to proclaim, to dedicate, to show, judgment, right, what is what is correct and right. Uh, fascinating range of words there. Um, yes, it's making me think, okay, okay, we'll, we'll come back to a bit more etymology for a different word in a minute. Uh, but yeah, I think that's good for diction. The next word, book, book, book. The next word is, uh, you know, possibly just one of the greatest ones here in this whole podcast show. It's the word dictionary. Oh, yes, we got there. It's, it's It's this thing. It's very meta. Let's talk about dictionary. There are four definitions... Uh, they, the first one's very long, and then they get uh, shorter a bit as they go. So, dictionary. You, yeah, noun. It's a noun. It's a book. It's a physical thing that I am basically holding in my hand right now. It's from 1526. One, a reference source in print or electronic form containing words usually alphabetically arranged along with information about their forms, pronunciations, functions, etymologies, meanings, and syntactical and idiomatic uses. That's what it is. It's got all of that stuff, and I read all of that to you. Every single little piece of that, almost. Um, there are lots of dictionaries. Uh, there, there are dictionaries for, say, to go from one language to another language. It's not going to give you definitions necessarily, but it's going to tell you what the other language's word is for that word that you're looking up. Uh, there are medical dictionaries. There are, I don't even know how many kinds of dictionaries. There's a lot. Um, we actually have my wife's grandmother's old like nursing medical dictionary. I think it was from the 40s. Yeah, I think it might be from the 40s. Uh, I took a quick little look through it. It is dated. Let me tell you what. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's cool. There, there are just tons and tons of types of dictionaries all over the world. Number two, for dictionary, a reference book listing alphabetically terms or names important to a particular subject or activity along with discussion of their meanings and applications. Um, I, it's reference book of what? I don't know. Terms and names about a topic. So yeah, it could just could be so many different things could have a dictionary like that. And then there's a discussion about their meanings and applications. Three, a reference book. Let's see. So far, number one, two, and three have all been a reference book. A reference book giving four words and one... No, I think I read that all wrong. A reference book giving four words of one language equivalence in another. Yeah, that's that one I mentioned. There could be like an English to German dictionary. You look up a word in English, it's going to tell you the word in German. And maybe, maybe if it's fancy, on the opposite side, if you look up a word in German, it'll tell you what the word is in English. Maybe it goes both ways. You know, these days we have translation things on our phones, so maybe we don't need the books as much, but uh, it's still it's still good if you can find a, a little one. You could take it on a trip with you. You can, uh, you can if you don't have, you know, international service or if you don't have a smartphone, these, these little books are very handy. Number four, a computerized list, um, a, a computerized list as of items for data or words used for reference as for information retrieval or word processing. 
Uh, it's, so it's computerized list, list of data or words for reference. Um, I guess this would be maybe the dictionary in the computer system that is going to tell you maybe if something is spelled wrong or, yeah, information retrieval, word processing. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you type in a thing and it, your computer, your phone, whatever it is, is going to tell you if you've spelled it wrong or maybe it's going to help you with grammar. Maybe it's going to tell you to put in a comma or take out a comma. And um, you can also use it literally as a dictionary to look up words. I think that must be what that one is. So where does this word come from? Well, it is from Middle Latin, dictionarium, dictionarium, which is from the Lower Latin dictio, which we also had in the previous word. Uh, So the Latin dictio means speaking or style. The Lower Latin dictio means word. Word up. Um, And that's also from... The, here we go, the Latin dictio, which means speaking. So what I think is interesting, it, I don't know which is first, Latin or Lower Latin. I think I think Latin might be first and then Lower Latin. But, um, you know, for my purposes, what I think is interesting is that it's it's a bunch of words. It's just the thing that is, is all words in here. Um, but then the Latin for speaking also, I am speaking these words to you. And so I feel that uh, this was just all meant to be. This book is literally meant to be spoken out loud. And you can't, you can't argue with me on this. You, you cannot change my mind. Um, I mean, it doesn't say anything about the second part of the word, the A-R-Y, where that comes from, what it means. I don't remember if we had the suffix A-R-Y. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just the place for words. That's what this book is, the dictionary, place for words. And then you speak them. No, then I speak them. It's my job. All right, the next word, book, book, book. It's the book. The next word is dictum, D-I-C-T-U-M, noun from mm, 1599. The plurals are dicta with an A, or dictums, just with an S at the end. Number one, a noteworthy statement as 1A, a formal pronouncement of a principle, proposition, or opinion. It's a formal pronouncement. Um, and yeah, that's I'm, I don't know of an example of where you might use this dictum, um, but it is very formal, so I feel like maybe it's an invitation or an, yeah, an announcement of some kind. 1B, an observation intended or regarded as authoritative. So it's uh, they have authority, and whatever this dictum says is what goes. Number two, a judge's expression of opinion on a point other than the precise issue involved in determining a case. Hmm. That's interesting. Why would the judge be talking about something that's not about the precise issue of determining the case? Um, but, the, you know, judges have authority, so I see the, the connection here. They're authoritative. It's a pronouncement of, of something. Um, the etymology, it's from dictus, which is from decere, which if we go back, uh, decere means to say in Latin. So it's uh, somebody is saying a thing, and it's uh, formal, authoritative, and correct. They said it. They're in a, a position of, of authority, so that's why a dictum is a dictum. <laughs> wow, I, this may be getting worse. I don't know. The next word, book. This is a prefix. Dicti, I think you would pronounce it dicti. D-I-C-T-Y, or you can add an O, dictio. This means, hmm, it just means net, N-E-T. Now, I don't know what kind of net we're talking about, but we will uh, learn more, I think, in the next couple words, because we have a couple examples. Dictia steel, and the other, other example is dictia som. Dictiosome, dictiosteel, and those are actually our next two words. 
But before we get there, the etymology says this is from the Greek dikin, dikin, which means to throw. You know, if you look at sports, you throw things into a net or towards a net. I don't know if that's exactly the connection here, but you throw a thing, and this means net. So let's move on to the other words to see if we can learn more about this dicti prefix. Book. Dictiosome. Noun from 1893. Any of the membranous or vesicular structures making up the Golgi apparatus. Any of those structures that are that are made from membranes or they are vesicular they got vesicles and uh you know if something's membranous maybe it's kind of like a net maybe it's a net in a net is kind of like the membrane of of humans they you know you like a like a soccer net a football net um certain things can go through the net because it has small holes but larger items can't go through and that's kind of like what a membrane is um, so I, I've heard of the Golgi apparatus. I, it's in the body somewhere. I can't think of what it is off the top of my head. So I'm not even going to take a guess and sound like an idiot because I have a thought in my mind, but I may be wrong. The next word, book, 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 dictia steel or dictia steely, dictia, no, dictia steely. That's how you say it. Dictia steely. I'm not sure why that's that's okay, why people say that, but um, I think dictia steel is probably more appropriate. This is a noun from circa 1902. A steel, or steely, I guess. A steel in which the vascular cylinder is broken up into a longitudinal series or network of vascular strands around a central pith. P-I-T-H. And uh, I guess that situation is in many ferns. A fern, like a plant. The fern, fern thing. So, let's see. It's a, I don't know what a steely is, so it's not helpful. But it's a certain kind of steel or steely called a dictio steel or dictio steely. It's a vascular cylinder. It's broken up long ways to a network of vascular strands. Around the central pith. That didn't really help probably any... I don't know. Hearing something multiple times helps me. Uh, that's what that is. I don't know. We'll have to uh, learn more maybe when we get to ferns. Probably not, though. The next word. Book, 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 book. Dicumarol is next. Dicumarol. D-I-C-U-M-A-R-O-L. Or you can spell it D-I-C-O-U-C-O-U-M-A-R-O-L. D-I-C-O-U-M-A-R-O-L. Noun from 1942. This is a crystalline compound, C19H12O6, originally obtained from spoiled sweet clover hay and used to delay clotting of blood, especially in preventing and treating thromboembolic disease thromboembolic disease i don't know anything about this i have no idea what spoiled sweet clover hay is uh but it helps to uh slow down uh wait delay clotting of blood why would you want to delay the clotting of blood hmm maybe maybe if it clots too fast that's a problem so you can use this dicu dicumerol the next word, bookie, 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 dicynodont or dicynodont, D-I-C-Y-N-O-D-O-N-T, noun from 1854, any of a suborder of small herbivorous therapsid reptiles with reduced dentition, and the suborder name is... I guess you would pronounce it Dicinodontia or Dicinodontia. And Dicinodont is also an adjective. So, something about, well, they're small. They eat plants. 
I don't know what therapsid means, but they're reptiles, and they have reduced dentition. And that's about teeth, uh, because if we look at the etymology, this is from the di prefix, which means two, plus kion, which means dog, plus odont, or odus, which means tooth. And there's more at hound and tooth. So, hmm, dog. I wonder how dog got in there. So we got two dog tooth. And I don't know what it means by reduced dentition. D does that mean that the teeth are smaller in these reptiles than other ones? Um, we'll put a link in the show notes for dicinodont. And um, maybe we'll put, a, put, a, put something in the social media Instagram and Twitter at DictionaryPod so you can see what these look like. But um, yeah, I'm more curious about this dentition thing. And it's right in the name. The D-O-N-T or the O, the Odont at the end. It's all about the teeth. That was the last of the D-I-C words. We have a couple D-I-D words in this episode. Starting with book. Did. That's the next word. Did. It is the past form of the word do. That's it. That's the, how how do you do? How do you did? I am do I did good. I'm going to do better. And the last word book 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 didact is the last word. D I D A C T noun from 1954. And it is a didact a didactic person is a didact. And we will learn about didactic. I can't even say the word didactic. We'll learn about didactic in the next episode. Yes, we will. Don't you worry. Um, so I think now is a good time to reread the words, and then we'll pick one for the word of the episode. I hope I hope I pick what you pick. Because if I don't, I'll feel very bad. But I think it might be kind of obvious in this one. Today we had dictatorship, diction, dictionary, dictum, dicti or dictio, dictiosome, dictiosteel, dicumerol, disanodont, disanodont, did, and didact. And of course, I'm going to pick dictionary as the word of the episode on this podcast about the dictionary, reading the dictionary, called the dictionary. Why would I not pick it? And um, there, my my songs don't usually have a lot of words. Sometimes they do, but um, how? What are we gonna do for this song? We're gonna go. The dictionary is the. Oh, my brain just sort of shut down there for a second. Um, the dictionary is the subject of this podcast called The Dictionary. I hope you have a dictionary in your house. You can use it and follow along with me. The Dictionary is a podcast made by Spencer. He is your host, and he's reading a dictionary of lots and lots of words. Yeah, again, the tune wasn't so great, and the, but the words were so much better. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I would have loved to have a guest on, as I've mentioned before. It's just kind of hard to find the, the time to get a guest on all the time, but eventually we'll get there. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you're enjoying this show. This was a very special episode because it had the word dictionary in it, but other than that, uh, there wasn't much special about it. And I'm looking forward to at least one word in the next episode. Ooh, a couple more words. Yeah, some good stuff there. A few words. All right, that's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary in the podcast, The Dictionary, Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I am Spencer. I am your host. I read the words and all the things... And I hope that you are, you're telling people about this show so you can all enjoy it together. Have a watch party. I guess it would be a listen party. A hear party. Here, here's the first word. Didactic. D-I-D-A-C-T-I-C. -I -I Adjective from 1658, 1A. Designed or intended to teach. 
I like these things. Anything that's going to teach you a thing is good in my book. Unless it's teaching you about things that I don't really care for, like, like how to destroy people and be mean to people. Those I'm not a big fan of. 1B, intended to convey instruction and information as well as pleasure and entertainment. Well, that's just a perfect way to describe this podcast. It's There's instruction and information and learning, and we all get so much pleasure from this and entertainment. That's why I like to say it's edutainment in just the most accurate way possible. There's an example, didactic poetry. So this podcast is a didactic dictionary podcast. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Number two, making moral observations. Making moral observations. So, okay, if you're observing things and you're you're deciding whether they're moral or not or something, uh, that would be didactic. Hmm. Didactical is an adjective. Didactically is an adverb. And didacticism, didacticism, that is a noun. Oh, I love doing the didacticism. Uh, this is from the Greek didaskin. I don't know how to pronounce this word. Um, there's didacticos and didaskin, and that means to teach. So we are here to teach. I love the love the teaching to the people, teaching the old people, teaching the young people. I know that if you listen to all of these episodes, even though even you may be the smartest person in the world and you have a huge vocabulary, you are going to learn something. There is no way that somebody knows every single little piece of definitions or etymologies. I mean, I don't know. Maybe the people who make the dictionary do. But uh, but yes, the, the, the average listener, you're totally going to learn something. So I'm very glad I get to teach you something. Uh, okay, it is sound effect time, and I'm going to do something, I hope it works, we're going to go, <laughs> the next word is didact- didactics, this is a hard word to say, I, I, I challenge you to try and say it off the top of your head, didactics, noun from 1800, a systematic instruction, that's it, it's an instruction that's uh, it's it's a system a systematic instruction it's instruction about a system in a systematic way uh, the synonym is pedagogy or pedagogy or pedagogy that's probably pedagogy i've heard of this word i've probably used it somewhere but i don't know what it means exactly but it's similar i guess to systematic instruction is didactics <laughs> The next word is didanosine, D-I-D-A-N-O-S-I-N-E, didanosine, noun from 1990. The synonym is, um, I guess it's D-D-I. I don't remember what that is, but uh, I can tell you that it's an alternative of di- didioxyenosine, which is an alternate name for this, uh, which is di plus deoxy plus inosine, which is a nucleoside. And uh, let's see, if we go back to DDI, I'm just curious if we can find it quickly. It's probably a real short section, the DD section. Oh boy, we gotta go a ways back. A ways back. Um, oh, that was too far. <laughs> I was like one page off. Uh, DDI is a synthetic nucleoside having properties and uses similar to those of DDC. Um, yeah, this is all chemically things. DDC is... Eh, forget it. Um, so yes, it's just a chemical thing, didanosine, and, the, and it's DDI. The next word. <laughs> Diddle. D-I-D-D-L-E. Verb from 1786. Number one. Oh, we're starting with transitive. Number one is chiefly a dialect, and it means to move with short, rapid motions. Hua, hia, bua, 
Chupa. He. Yeah. Short rapid motions. You're diddling. <laughs> Never heard this one. That's why it's a chiefly dialect. Don't know where they say this. Number two. To waste in trifling. And the example of the thing that you might be wasting is time. Am I wasting my time doing this podcast? Am I diddling my time away, trifling it away? Hmm, I don't think so, because I'm learning, and so are you. Three synonyms are hoax and swindle. Hoax and swindle. So if you are, uh, if you're swindling somebody's money away or something, I guess you'd be diddling them. There are other definitions for this word, which, uh, well, we have one of them here. I think the rest of them, you got to go to Urban Dictionary. Uh, but, you know, if, if that's a word that you know in that more vulgar way, then some of these might sound kind of funny to you. So here's number four, often vulgar, it says. And this is to copulate with. Uh, you know, that's to, uh, to have the sexual relations with somebody. Specifically, copulating is, uh, is diddling. If that's what you want to use it that way, you can. The intransitive definitions are, number one, dawdle and fool. So you're fooling somebody, dawdle. I don't think of dawdle and fool at all the same. I think of fool more similar to hoax and swindle. Dawdle is like, oh, I'm just dawdling down the street, taking my time. Number two, synonyms are fiddle and toy. And this is usually used with the word with, as in, diddled with the machine until it broke. They're just messing around with it, poking at it, fiddling it, fiddling with it, toying with it. Um, yeah, don't don't mess, don't diddle with the machine until it breaks. You, you might need to use the machine for something. Diddler is a noun. The one who's doing the diddling is the diddler. Let's see. Is there any autom... No, there's no etymology. It says origin unknown. Hmm. And you can use it in so many ways. So I wonder if it just got sort of made up in these different contexts independently, possibly. Hmm. That's interesting. We got moving with short... Short, rapid motions, wasting time, swindling somebody, copulating, uh, and then just messing around with a thing. The next word. The next word. <laughs> diddly. Diddly or diddly. Noun from 1964. It is slang, and the synonym is diddly squat, which is... <laughs> Our next word, diddly hyphen squat, noun from 1963. I love this word. It is slang, and it is the least amount or anything at all. <laughs> that that Those seem like opposites. The least amount is like virtually nothing, and then anything at all is like virtually everything. As in, didn't know diddly squat about sports. And that is a quote from Sam Topperoff. Sam Topperoff. I don't know if Sam was talking about themselves or somebody else, but whoever it was, they didn't know diddly squat about sports. I know a little bit more than diddly squat about sports. This is probably an alternative of doodly squat, which is uh, a pretty great word that I don't think I've ever heard of. Uh, it's got to be... If they're mentioning it there in the etymology, I would like to think that it is in this book somewhere. And I'm going to do a quick little check to see if you can look forward to doodly squat, because I just really hope that that, that can be in all of our futures. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Ooh, do, do. Um, do. Uh-oh. Yes, we do have doodly squat. It's right next to doo doo. Get ready for that, ladies and people. Okay, so that was doodly squat. The next word. It is didgeridoo, the sound that I am trying to make with my mouth. 
Um, this is spelled a couple of ways, and I think that there might be at least one or two other appropriate ways to spell it, but the ones that we have here are D-I-D-G-E-R-I-D-O-O, or you can replace the G with a J, didgeridoo, um, and it is spill, still still pronounced didgeridoo instead of diggeridoo. Um, you could also change, what are we, didgeridoo. You can emphasize the last syllable. Didgeridoo. Um, I think also you can replace the two O's with a U if you want, possibly. This is a noun from 1919. The didgeridoo existed way before that. But I guess we finally got it into English a little over 100 years ago. It is a large bamboo or wooden trumpet of the Australian Aborigines. I've never heard it described as a trumpet, but I guess that sort of makes sense. Um, bamboo, I don't know if, I'm trying to think. I think it's often, um, if I remember correctly, eucalyptus trunks, trunks of a eucalyptus tree. I'm, I may be wrong about that, um, but I feel like bamboo is not as often maybe yeah sometimes yeah i think i've seen bamboo didgeridoos ooh bamboo didgeridoos uh i i love didgeridoos i have played a number of didgeridoos somebody actually taught me how to make my own didgeridoo with pvc pipe and then you melt beeswax and then you create this mouthpiece of beeswax on the end one end of it and uh, and then and then you you put your lips on the thing in a certain way, and it's uh, it's a little hard to to make the right sound. But uh, once you get going, you can do it. And I think I still have it somewhere. Um, but you know, I don't I don't really play it very often, so I don't uh, I don't my lips are like they're out of practice. Um, but I would definitely like to put in a clip of somebody playing the didgeridoo. Maybe if I. I'm able to, I'll, I'll get a clip of myself playing the didgeridoo, but maybe it would be better to put in a professional didgeridoo player here so you can hear what they can do. You can do crazy things, like you can sort of sing as you're playing, and get other sounds you can really like just mess with your your mouth your cheeks your tongue your vocal cords all these things to get different sounds uh you can also do a thing called circular breathing where as you're playing you push some air into your cheeks so your cheeks are you know they're they're filled on filled in and then you push the air out with your cheeks and at the same time breathe in through your nose you can do this with other instruments um, but you know, I'm more familiar with it with the didgeridoo myself. Um, and so what that allows you to do is just to keep on playing without taking a breath officially. I mean, you are, but you don't stop playing. So, uh, yeah, the, you, you can do a lot more with the didgeridoo than you think. Uh, the one that I have of PVC, because it's made out of PVC, you can actually add attachments to it to make it longer, or you can make a short one. I think the one I have is four feet long i also have a two foot long one and then you can add attachments and uh you know make it whatever length you want and of course that will lower the pitch and uh ooh, they're great i would love to have like just a real fancy nice expensive one that i can play all the time but i can't do that right now didgeridoo people don't like these i think some people have they're like that's a dumb instrument no it's great the next word, didn't, D-I-D-N, -I -D apostrophe T. I guess there's a dialect form which is didn't. Instead of didn't, it's didn't, with a T sound in the middle instead of a D. Hmm. Or just also didn't, just didn't, 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 or didn't. It's, um, what is it? What is it? It's not a thing. It doesn't say what it is, but it is from 1675. It just means did not. You put did not together, you get didn't. 
you get didn't, 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 or didn't. The next word. <laughs> Dido. Noun from 1807. It is spelled D-I-D-O. Number one, a mischievous or capricious act. Synonyms are prank or antic. And this is often used in the phrase cut didos. Cut didos. I have never heard of this. I don't know if I've ever heard of dido in general for this uh, for this definition. Anything you do that's mischievous, it's it's a prank. It's an antic. It's a whatever. A prank call maybe. It's a dido. Number two, something that is frivolous or showy is a dido. Now, the etymology says that the origin is unknown, which is very sad to me, because I want to know where this came from. Number one and number two are different in my brain. A mischievous act or something that is frivolous or showy? Yeah, I don't, I don't think those quite make sense. So, who, who, who made up Dido? Maybe we'll look in Etim online and see if there's additional information of where this came from. Because I want to know. Maybe. Nah, probably not. I was going to say maybe it came from the next word, but I don't think so. <laughs> Dido again with a capital D. Noun from the 14th century. A legendary queen of Carthage in Virgil's Aeneid who kills herself when Aeneas leaves her. Oh, well, that's sad. Aeneas, why'd you have to go leave her? Mm, no clue if this is related to the previous word at all. Maybe, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think Aeneas was doing a mischievous act or anything was frivolous or showy. It's probably just a coincidence. And we will put a link in the show notes for Dido, this uh, queen of Carthage. The next word. <laughs> Didst or didst, D-I-D-S-T. This is the archaic past seculent, second singular form of do. So, you know, we don't, we don't say this anymore. So we had at the beginning, no, at the end of the last episode, we had did, which is the past form of do. And here, this is the archaic past second singular form of do. Thou didst. Something, thou didst a dido. The next word. <laughs> didymium. Didymium. D-I-D-Y-M-I-U-M. -I -I Noun from 1842. It is a mixture of rare earth elements made up chiefly of neodymium. Neodymium? And praseodymium and used especially for coloring glass for optical filters and this is from the greek didymos which means twin also from dio d y o which means two the number two and there's more at two so it's a mixture of rare earth elements blah, 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 blah. i guess maybe the number two here uh, or the, the reason that the two is in here is because it, it is made up of these two things, neodymium and praseodymium. I also don't know how to pronounce those words. So uh, you put those two things together and maybe a few other things, and then you come up with didymium. And uh, may, how it's used for coloring glass and optical filters, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about that. Oh, I should also mention, uh, there's a picture of somebody playing the didgeridoo. I totally forgot to say that. Um, it looks like a fairly stereotypical um, Australian Aborigine person, uh, a, a man, I would assume. It looks like they got a beard. They're sitting there cross-legged on the floor, and they have a didgeridoo coming out from their mouth. They're holding it with their left hand. It has some patterns in the middle, and then it, uh, the end of it, the bell of it, is resting on the floor. And it's probably somewhere between four and six feet long. I think that's a fairly average length for a didgeridoo. 
All right, we have one more word for this episode, and there's a bunch of definitions and phrases. So we have sound effect time, which is... It's the word die. D-I-E. First form. Mm, It is a verb from the 12th century. Uh, Let's see. It might just be intransitive. I think it must be because I'm thinking about how you use the word die. And I don't know if there's a transitive way to use that. So we're just going to say it's intransitive for now. Number one. To pass from physical life... And the synonym is expire. The physical life of the body has has ceased to work anymore, and so it has died. But what happens next? What is the thing that is aware of the thing in the physical body, and where does it go? What happens to it? Has that died too? 2A. To pass out of existence... The synonym is cease, C-E-A-S-E, as in, their anger died at these words. Once they read those words, once they heard those words, they weren't, maybe they weren't angry anymore. Their anger just went away, it went bye-bye, and it die-died. To be, to disappear or subside gradually, and this is often used with away, or down, or out, as in, the storm died down. Gradually, ever so slowly, the storm died down. Uh, What, let's see, die out, something can die out, like maybe a species dies out gradually over time, Uh, and die away. Die away, yeah, I think of that also like um, maybe a species is dying away, or uh, I don't know, something else. Number 3A, the synonyms are sink and languish, as in, dying from fatigue. You're so tired, your body is dying, it's languishing, it's sinking into oblivion. 3B, to long, keenly, or desperately, as in, dying to go. Oh, I just wish I could go, because if I can't go, I'm just going to die. I think that's probably where that one came from. I am literally dying here if I don't get to go. Where do I want to go? I want to go, I want to go, I want to go lots of places. 3C, to be overwhelmed by emotion, as in, die of embarrassment. Hmm, overwhelmed by emotion. I guess... I guess that makes sense. I would not have thought to use that definition here. It, it's it's more of a metaphorical thing. Die of embarrassment. Um, are there other examples? Die. Do we ever use this this specific definition in other contexts other than die of embarrassment? If you die of embarrassment, you're like so embarrassed that you... You want to die. You, uh, yeah, it's more of a metaphorical use. I don't know. I guess, I guess you're overwhelmed by emotion. I don't know. There's something that's just not really tracking with that in my brain. Number four, A, to cease functioning. And the synonym is stop. As in, the motor died. It, uh, it didn't want to function anymore. It's like, all right, hey, uh, you know, the, the, I can't do this no more, so I'm going to stop, and the car is going to stop, and you got to fix me, please. I have died. I am a talking motor. For B, the end, no, to end in failure. To end in failure, as in, the bill died in committee. They couldn't, the, the Senate, the legislature, the House, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't make this bill become a law. They all talked about it, and they couldn't do it, and no more bill. It died. It failed. Number five, to become indifferent, as in, die to worldly things. Die to worldly things? That example doesn't make sense to me, and to become indifferent trying to think 
to become indifferent. If I'm indifferent about a thing, I don't really care. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, this one's not familiar to me, especially when put in that example. Usually those help, but not all the time. All right, we have a few phrases. The first one is die hard, which is also the name of a classic, classic movie. Number one for die hard, to be long in dying, as in such rumors die hard. To be long in dying, it's taking forever for that person, that thing to die. Those rumors just keep on going. Number two. To continue resistance against hopeless odds. Ah, this is definitely the one from the movie. As in, that kind of determination dies hard. Or, John McClane died hard trying to resist a bunch of people and he had very hopeless odds. Because he was kind of one dude against a bunch of dudes. But uh, yeah, that's a good name. It's a good name for the movie. I like it. I approve. And then, of course, there's all the sequels. The next phrase, die on the vine. And this is to fail, especially at an early age through lack of support or enthusiasm. As in, let the proposal die on the vine. Uh, This, I I guess the meaning here is that um, as it's on the vine, it's still growing, it's still young. Uh, and if it dies on the vine, it, uh, it it died too early or just in its early stage because it was still on the vine. If it died off the vine, that means it was mature enough to be taken off the vine, and that's a, f- a much better place to die. You don't want things to die on the vine. The last phrase, to die for, and this is extremely desirable or appealing, as in, the dessert was to die for. That means the dessert was so, so good, you were willing to just die after you eat it. Oh, it's to die for, honey. Oh, that dessert, I can't even believe how good it was. So tasty, I wish I had three of them. Okay, let's look at the etymology for die. It is from the Middle English, dien which is from or akin to the Old Norse, deja, D-E-Y-J-A, which means to die, akin to the Old High German, tauen, which also means to die. So die is from the words that mean to die. And then uh, we have a whole other second form of the word die in the next episode with also a bunch of, uh, bunch of definitions. Okay die lots of things can die that's what we learned today many things and my skills of playing the didgeridoo for real have almost died i I really i wish i could play more shall i read the words to you again we had didactic didactics didanacine diddle diddly diddly squat didgeridoo didn't dido dido didst didymium and die hmm hmm, hmm, hmm. what what shall we pick well i think i think i may just need to pick didgeridoo as the word of the episode anybody who knows me or has known me for a while i should say uh known has known that i can have played the didgeridoo that's you know when people think of me they just think of didgeridoo that's just that's just automatic right so Hmm. I wish I could sing a song about didgeridoo, but making the didgeridoo sound, but I can't do that with my mouth. Maybe we can just go, didgeridoo, didgeridoo makes this sound. Not really. Didgeridoo, didgeridoo, go learn how to play the didgeridoo. Doo-doo. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer playing the didgeridoo, dispensing the information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is the podcast that's the best podcast, the only one that really should exist in the whole entire world. 
Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, go search for the handle Dictionary Pod, all one word. No silly characters, just all the lowercase characters. If you want to my bip, 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 bip. if you want to find my personal stuff, it is at Speejampar, S P E J A M P A R. You can also use that same username handle typey thing on TikTok and YouTube. Uh, you can watch this show on YouTube with no video component, just the logo. It's on my same personal YouTube channel thing. If you want to email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. If you want to join the Patreon, you can give me $1 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, and you can get some stuff like early episodes. Uh, I would love to do more on Patreon, but, you know, I would love to do so much more with this whole podcast in general. What else? Merchandise. You can buy merchandise at T Public. The link is in the show notes. You can call the Google Voice number 917-727-5757. I think it's also in the show notes. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Jonah and Tom have made the theme songs. Go check out their stuff. If you want to make your own theme song, send it to me in whatever way that you deem necessary. Um... You can tag me on posts. You can write a message. I got a message from a new fan. He was like, hey, I used to eat real fast because I grew up with a bunch of kids, and I still eat real fast. And uh, also, uh, he uh, also loved the 700 section in the, at the library, just like I love the 700 section. Let me know what section you like. Oh, that was a lot of stuff. This is the last section of page 347, and we are starting with the second form of the word die, D-I-E. Hmm. Now, we talked about the act of dying in the previous episode, and here we are talking about the noun form of die. So I don't know if there's going to be anything that's death-related here, but, uh, but, you know, there probably will be. There's a lot of them. So, the noun, the, the plural is either dice or dies, D-I-E-S, dies. So, maybe depending on the context, that one is also related to death. But uh, we'll find out. Um, it's also from the 14th century. I gotta say that. Number one, the plural here is dice, and it is... A small cube marked on each face <laughs> a small cube marked on each face width from one to six spots and used usually in pairs in various games and in gambling by being shaken and thrown to come to rest at random on a flat surface. And this is often used figuratively in expressions concerning chance or the irrevocability, the irrevocability, that's a hard word to say, the irrevocability of a course of action, as in, the die was cast. Hmm. So that phrase is about the figurative, the figure, it's figuratively, it's like, it's not literally, it's figuratively, um, about, in, in expressions about the chance or the irrevocability like it's irrevocable it's it's there's chance there's it's random of the course of action so hmm i don't think i ever realized the die was cast was about the was sort of about these little cubes that we throw hmm that is very interesting uh let's see i thought it was funny it said it's been shaken and thrown and all i could think about was a martini shaken not stirred shaken you shake the martini maybe you can shake the dice in a martini and then throw it i don't know there's some something in there in my brain maybe you can come up with something funny about a martini and dice being shaken and thrown but not stirred uh yeah dice uh there obviously there are other kinds of dice and die i think a lot of people know this dungeons and dragons use a 20 sided dice uh and i think that there's lots of other sides you can make probably virtually any sided dice you want it doesn't have to be a cube with six sides 
make your own dice and make up a game for it. Okay, number two for die. The plural here is dies, D-I-E-S, and the synonym is just the number one A definition for the word dado, and, you know, because we have a terrible memory, we just have to go back to that page real quick and see uh, what it, what is a dado. The number one A dado, um, okay, here we have two forms, it must be this one. It is the part of a pedestal of a column above the base. That's the dado. So the singular of that is die, and the plural is dies. Number three, the plural here is again dies. Any of various tools or devices for imparting a desired shape, form, or finish to a material or for impressing an object or material, as... 3A1, the larger of a pair of cutting or shaping tools that would that when moved toward each other produce a desired form in or impress a desired device on an object by pressure or by a blow. Who? Also, 3A2, a device composed of a pair of such tools. We also have 3B and C and D, but uh, yeah, 3A1 and 3A2 mostly go together. So uh, let's just backtrack real quick. Uh, They're tools or devices, and it's all about using them to create a desired shape, form, or finish to something. Like wood, I think, is probably maybe the most common thing, maybe other things, maybe metal, maybe wax, maybe I don't know, or or impressing things together into the shape. Yeah, I think maybe like a wax or something that's more malleable, you can maybe use a die for that. Um, I've heard of these. I don't think I've ever used something like this before, so I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about these, but I'll put a link in the show notes uh, so you can learn more about this thing and uh, maybe we'll put a picture of it in social media. Also, I think I gotta put uh, some pictures on social media for just the little, the little cubes that we throw for games of chance. Okay, 3B, this is still about the tools and devices. 3B is a hollow, internally threaded screw cutting tool used for forming screw threads. Uh, so yeah, it's the same idea of a, of a thing that um, is used to turn something into a shape or a form. And so in this case, it's specifically about creating screws, I guess. You, you put maybe the metal into this die, uh, this thing called a die, and it either, I don't know, is it liquid metal? Uh, that you put in this thing and then the screws are formed or is it going to press the metal into it? I don't know exactly and it doesn't say. 3C, a mold. Okay, mold. This is where you might use like a something that's more malleable. Um, a mold into which molten metal or other material is forced. So you have a very strong mold. You squirt some molten metal in it and then as it cools and hardens, uh, it, it, it will create this shape. And the thing, the mold itself, is called the die. And then 3D, a perforated block through which metal or plastic is drawn or extru- extruded for shaping. Yep, all, all about that same idea. The etymology doesn't have a whole lot. It is from the Middle English D, spelled D-E-E. Maybe they pronounced it die or D, I don't know. And then also from the Anglo-French de, D-E, with the accent on the E that goes boop. So that was everything for the noun form of die. The sound effect that I'm going to do is, um, it's more appropriate for the previous episode um, because it's I'm going to do sort of like a, I hope this is not disrespectful, but it's like a little, like a death rattle kind of thing. You know, just some air expelling from from the face area. Um, and it would have been more appropriate in the yesterday's, the, the previous episode, because that's where we had the word die. Um, but 
Instead, I did a didgeridoo sound, and if you didn't hear it, you gotta go back and listen. So the sound effect today will be... <sighs> the next word is dieback. One word, dieback. Noun from circa 1886, a condition in woody plants in which peripheral parts are killed, as by parasites. Peripheral parts, would those be the branches, the leaves, anything that maybe is coming off the, the trunk, the stem of this woody plant? And so the condition is called dieback, and, uh, well, it's killing things, so that the die part makes sense. But I don't know about the back part. And there is no etymology, so you just have to make up your own etymology if you like. The next word. Defenbachia. Defenbachia, or defenbachia, or defenbachia. It is spelled D I E F F E N B A C H I A. Defenbachia. Noun from circa 1900. Any of a genus of erect poisonous tropical American plants of the Arum family, having usually variegated leaves and often grown as house plants. The genus name is also. Diefenbachia, and this is from Ernst Diefenbach. Yeah, I think that's probably how you say his name. Ernst Diefenbach, who was a German naturalist who died in 1855. So they are poisonous. Why are we keeping poisonous plants as house plants? Uh, maybe we need to put a put a post post a picture. On the social media of a Diefenbachia, D I E F F E N B A C H I A. I'm so jealous of these people who got things named after them. They live on forever. Uh, okay, that's I don't know my plants. I don't know anything about them, so I don't have much to say. But the leaves are variegated, which is very great. The next word. Ugh. Die hard. Two words with a hyphen. We had the phrase die hard in the last episode. There was no hyphen. So what's this one? Is it different? Die hard. Adjective from 1922. Strongly or fanatically determined or devoted. Hmm. As in die hard fans. Especially strongly resisting change. As in a die-hard conservative. Die-hard, one word, is a noun, and die-hardism, that is a, also a noun. Never, they never even thought that that would be a word, die-hardism. Yeah, die-hard fans, die-hard conservative, die-hard whatever. I'm a die-hard person who wants people to learn uh, diehard reader of the dictionary, diehard podcaster, diehard human being, diehard person who loves rights for all living things. Um, yes, yeah, strongly or phonetically. So I'm trying to think if there's a connection to the phrase die hard. You know, they're different. One's a verb, the other one's an adjective. So they're, they are different. But I guess Bruce Willis in the movie Die Hard, he was, um, very determined and devoted to to uh, to save his his self, his wife, the people who his ex wife or wife whatever that she worked for. He didn't want more people to die, so uh, yeah, he was a, a die hard. Um, what he cop? He was a cop. He was other things. I don't know. He also resisted. He resisted. He strongly resisted the change of the people coming in and killing everybody. The next word. Dial. D-I-E-L. Dial or diel. Adjective from circa 1935. Involving a 24-hour period that usually includes a day and the adjoining night. As in, diel fluctuations in temperature. 
There's, it's warmer during the day usually and cooler at night. So the fluctuations in temperature are dial because it's, uh, it's all about the 24-hour period. This is an irregular form of the Latin ds, which means day. And then the suffix al is added to the end of it. So it's just anything that's kind of about the day, one whole day, a 24-hour period. Um, this, the, 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 lots of things. That, that's one of the big cycles of our lives is just the day, the, the dial cycle. The next word. Dildrin. Dildrin. D-I-E-L-D-R-I-N. Noun from circa 1949. A white crystalline persistent toxic chlorinated compound. A crystalline persistent toxic chlorinated compound. C12H8Cl6O. Used especially formerly as an insecticide. I feel like we've seen a lot of these chemical compounds that are insecticides related to insectis- insecticization somehow. Let's see. The etymology says this is from Diels Alder reaction. The Diels Alder reaction, which is an addition reaction forming a six membered ring. And Diels Alder is named after Otto Diels and Kurt Alder, A L D E R. And so they took the first four letters of Diels and they just took Deal. And then the, hmm, they took the D, I guess the D E R from Alder, but they didn't really take the E. They just took the, the R, the D and the R, and then they added I N to the end. Deals, Alder, Otto Deals, and Kurt Alder became Deals Alder, which became Dildren. So they either created or found this uh, crystalline persistent toxic chlorinated compound. Good for them. The next word. <coughs> dielectric. Dielectric. It must be something about two, I think, I hope. Let's see. Noun. From 1837, it is a non-conductor of direct electric current. A non-conductor of direct electric current. So it's just not going to conduct electricity using direct electric current. Dielectric is also an adjective. I don't see anything about two here. I was thinking that because of the prefix. But... The etymology does say that it is from dia plus electric. So I guess in this case, dia, it means through or across. And I guess in that context, it's it's talking about a thing that's going through the electricity, through the conductor, but this is a non-conductor. So it is a little confusing. And I don't know enough about electricity... AC, DC, I don't know enough about that stuff to to give you any more context than that. The next word. <sighs> Dielectric constant. Dielectric, second word, constant. Noun from 1875. The synonym is permittivity. Permittivity. And that is spelled P E R M. I-T-T-I-V-I-T-Y. Permittivity is also dielectric constant. Next. (laughs) Dielectric heating. Two words. Noun from 1944. The rapid and uniform heating throughout a non-conducting material by means of a high-frequency electromagnetic field. So, what? I don't know. Again, it's something about a non-conductor of direct electric current, um, but this one is specifically about rapid and uniform heating throughout that material that does not conduct. And, uh, and it's, it's, done, it's doing this by high-frequency electromagnetic field. I think it would be good to learn more about electricity. If I had so much more free time... Not only would I do a lot more with this this podcast, 
but I would I would make an effort to to learn a lot more about things. I if I had the time and the motivation, which I have a bit of the motivation, I just need more of it and more time to learn about electricity, to learn learn practical things. Plumbing, that's another practical thing, maybe not as fun as electricity, but good and practical. Um, you know, medicine, the brain, the, I don't know, philosophy, so many things, so many things, so little time. The next word. (laughs) Diencephalon. Diencephalon, you could also say dien, diencephalon, yeah, it's all the same. D I E N. C E P H A L O N diencephalon noun from circa 1883 the posterior subdivision of the forebrain all right so the forebrain that's the part of the brain that's closer to your forehead forehead forebrain but it says it is the posterior subdivision so i would think that that is the the part in the back of the forebrain So the brain is divided up into these different named sections. And so if you take the whole forebrain, I don't know, would the frontal lobe be another name for that? But then the back section of it, so closer to the center of the brain, is the posterior. Because post is kind of back or after or behind. So that small section of the forebrain is the diencephalon. And diencephalic, diencephalic is an adjective. Um, the etymology isn't particularly helpful or interesting. The next word. <laughs> dying. I, do I sound like I'm dying? This one is spelled D-I-E-N-E. Noun from 1917. A compound containing two double bonds between carbon atoms. And here the di prefix definitely means two, obviously. Uh, double, ba- two double bonds between carbon atoms. Ah, yes, I've seen this in pictures. Uh, carbon atoms, I think that they can, I think six things can attach to them. They're like a hexagon shape. And you can connect using two of those six, you can connect two carbon atoms together. Um, and so they're connected doubly. Two double bonds now wait two double bonds so that does that mean that it's uh there's there are three carbon atoms and then two of them say carbon a and carbon b are connected doubly and then carbon b and carbon c are connected doubly so is that two double bonds or is just one of those two double bonds not entirely sure either way it's a diene the next word <sighs> die off i have died off uh, two words with a hyphen d i e o f f noun ooh are we going to see die on mm, nope that would be in the next episode but we will not see it die off noun from 1936 a sudden sharp decline of a population of animals or plants that is not caused directly by human activity. So it's just a natural decline, but it is sudden and sharp. It's a natural decline of animals or plants, uh, and they're just dying off. And if the humans were involved, um, there would be a different name. I mean, they would be be extinct or going extinct, or um, there's other words for that that I can't think of at the moment. Um... They're in danger or you know something like that but uh yeah i mean if a thing is just naturally like ah we're done here they, they just die off they just died off one more word for this episode uh, die off again two words no hyphen this is an intransitive verb from 1697 to die sequentially either singly like a single thing, one at a time, singly or in numbers, so that the total number is greatly diminished. So the first die off was a noun. That's just the whole thing of them dying off. 
And then this one is a verb. So the act of them dying off one at a time or in great numbers, uh, that's die off. I don't like it when things die off, but is if humans, as long as humans are not involved, humans, when humans get involved in things, they tend to mess things up. And uh, they have killed off many plants and animals that are never coming back and clearly are screwing up the climate. You know, the, the, the nature and the earth, we're, they're still going to be here. They're still going to take over. Um, but we're really making it difficult for all of the innocent animals and plants and people who aren't making things worse, consciously at least. Okay, we have talked a lot in this episode. Many, many words were said. So we now need to pick a word of the episode. We had today, die, die back, defenbaxia, die hard, diel, dildrin, dielectric, dielectric constant, dielectric heating, diencephalon, dying, die off, and die off. Let's see. I like dies. I don't like something killing woody, woody plants. Um, let's see. Those are other plants. Die hard. Mm, that's that's kind of fun. Die L is about the day. Dieldrin. Oh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> There's a few contenders. It's hard to pick one. Um, maybe we'll just pick die as the word of the episode, like the dice that you throw when you play your game. So many games use dice, die. There's Monopoly, and that's it. That's the only one. Uh, Yahtzee uses five, Craps uses two, Trivial Pursuit uses one or two, maybe just one. Uh, what else? Sorry, I don't know. There's so many more games than I can even think of. And I don't even play the ones that have uh, multi, multi sides, more than six. I don't really play a lot of games anymore anyway, but... Die are useful when you're playing a game. Go get some die. Play with your dice. How many sides does your dice have? Most of mine just have six. Uh, yeah, I think it would be fun to post pictures of old die. Very old ones. You know, before the modern, like, nice, clean, white, and black dots. Ooh, and I love, I have to say this, I love the die that are used in The Nightmare Before Christmas when Oogie Boogie throws the die, and there's this close-up shot of the really kind of fancy, creepy die, but they're holes, and a snake, a, it, he got snake eyes and a snake... Well, actually, I think he made snake eyes happen. But anyway, that's besides the point. And then a snake goes through them. And I've just always loved that close-up shot. And I would love to have a set of dye that are made to look like that. And I think my suspicion is that they made large dye because they're so much more detailed than the small ones. I think they made a large set so they could do the animation. Mm, yeah, maybe I'll post a picture of that too. Okay. This this was the end, the end of this episode, the end of this page, and we had such a wonderful time. I hope you did. Go ahead, share this show. I didn't say any of these things. Share this show. Subscribe to it on your podcast platform. Rate it and review it. Write a thing about how much you love this show and with all the stars that are available. That's good. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.